Homer. The Iliad. A new translation by Peter Green. Book 13. Zeus, when he brought the Trojans and Hector to the ships, abandoned them there, to endure toil and suffering without respite, but himself turned his bright eyes away, gazing far off at the lands of the Thracian horsemen, of the Mysian close-quarter fighters, of the noble milk-drinking Hippo Molgoi, and of the Abioi, the most righteous of mankind. But to Troy he longer turned his bright eyes at all, never expecting that any of the immortals would go to the help of either the Danans or the Trojans. But it was no blind watch that the lordly Earthshaker kept, no indeed, for he sat marvelling at the war and its conflicts, high on the topmost peak of wooded Samothrake. From there he had a clear view of the whole of Ida, clear too were Priam's city and the Achaeans' ships. Fresh up from the sea he sat there, full of pity for the Achaeans' rout by the Trojans, and in a furious temper with Zeus. Down he now started at once from the rocky mountain. Striding on with brisk footsteps, the high range and the woodlands shook under the tread of Poseidon's immortal feet. Three strides he took, with the fourth he reached his goal, Aigai, where lies his famed palace, built in the depths of the water, golden and gleaming, forever imperishable. Arrived there, he yoked to the chariot his bronze-hoofed horses, his swift-flying pair, with their flowing manes of gold and clad himself in gold, and flourished his whip, of gold too, finely made, and, mounting his chariot, drove out over the waves. Beneath him sea beasts gambled all around, up from the deep, well they knew their lord, and enjoy the sea parted before him. His steeds flew on so lightly, the axle of bronze beneath was never wetted, and nimbly bore him across to the ships of the Achaeans. There's a certain wide cavern out there, down in deep water, midway between Tenedos and rugged Imbros. Here Poseidon, the earth shaker, reined in his horses, unyoked them from the chariot, tossed them ambrosial fodder to eat. And around their hooves fastened golden hobbles they could neither break nor slip off. To make sure they waited till their lord returned, then he went to the Achaeans' camp. The Trojans, all in one mass, like a flame or a gale blast, were pressing hotly on behind Hector, the son of Priam, shouting and yelling together, confident that they'd capture the Achaeans' ships and massacre all the best men there. But Poseidon, the earth shaker, the earth encircler, came up from the salty deep to encourage the Argives, in Calchas's bodily form, with his untiring voice. First he addressed the two Iases, both eager for action, you two now between you can save the Achaean forces, if your minds are set on your prowess, not on chilling rout. Nowhere else do I fear the invincible hands of those Trojans who, in a body, have swarmed up our great wall, the well-grieved Achaeans will hold them all at bay. No, it's here I'm really afraid we may meet disaster, here, where that madman, flame-like, is leading them on, yes, Hector, who boasts he's a son of almighty Zeus. May some god put the strong will in the hearts of you both to make a firm stand yourselves. Bid others do the same, that way, for all his onslaught, you still might force him back from the swift ships, even though the Olympians backing him. With that the earthshaker and earth encircler tapped both men with his staff, filled them with strength and courage, and made their limbs light, both their legs and their arms above. Then, just as a swift flying hawk will take to the air, lifting off from some sheer and inaccessible rock face, to hunt down another bird, in pursuit across the plain, such was the flight of Poseidon the earthshaker from them. It was Oileus's son, swift Aias, who recognized him first, and straightway declared to Aias, Telamon's son, Aias, that was one of the gods who dwell on Olympos, in the seer's likeness, urging us to fight by the ships. That was not really Calchas the prophet, the diviner, the form of his feet and legs from behind as he went I easily knew, though gods, they're still recognizable, and my heart in the breast of me is made that much more eager to plunge with zest into warfare and battle, my own feet under and hands above are impatient to go. Aias, Telamon's son, then made him this answer, so too with me, my invincible hands are urgent to grasp the spear, my powers aroused, I'm borne forward by both feet beneath me, I'm ready, even alone, to do battle with Priam's son Hector, hot to fight though he always is. Such were their words to each other, while rejoicing over the lust for battle the god had put in their hearts. Meanwhile the earth encircler aroused those Achaeans behind them, now refreshing their spirits beside the swift ships, their limbs undone by grievous fatigue, while anguish swelled and possessed their spirits as they observed the Trojans in countless numbers swarm up the great wall, looking at them they shed tears, never once supposing that they could escape calamity. But the earth shaker, easily passing among them, strengthened their ranks by his exhortations. He first approached Teucros and Latos, then Thoas, Dapiros, the heroic Penelios, Meriones, and Antilochos, 
lords of the battle cry, these he urged on now, address them with winged words, shame on you, Argives, young warriors. It was in your prowess as fighters I trusted to keep our ships in safety, but if you are about to shrink from warfare's grievous business, the days indeed come for us to be beaten by the Trojans. Alas, this is a great wonder that my eyes now behold, a terrible sight, something I never thought could happen. The Trojans attacking our ships, the same men who before resembled timorous hinds, that in the woodlands become the prey of jackals, of wolves and leopards, wandering cravenly, no fighting spirit in them, just so, until now the Trojans refused to stand and face the Achaeans' hands. Their power. Not even briefly. But now, far from the city, they're engaged by the hollow ships because of our leader's weakness and our troops' lack of discipline. Being at loggerheads with him, they have no will to fight for the swift-faring ships, but are getting killed among them. Yet even if it's the truth that the person at fault is Atreus's heroic son, wide-ruling Agamemnon, because he dishonored the swift-foot son of Peleus, that's no reason for us to stay aloof from the fighting. Let's mend this rift quickly, good men's hearts can be healed, but it's no good thing that you're still shy of warlike valor, you, the elite troops, the army's finest. I'd have no quarrel with any man that hung back from the fighting who was a worthless fellow, but with you lot I'm furious. Gentlemen, this abstention of yours will soon make matters a good deal worse, and each one of you should take shame, and men censure, to heart, for the struggle now unfolding is crucial. Strong Hector. Of the Great War Cry. Is fighting beside our ships, has smashed our gates and their bar. Thus the earth encircler's commands urged on the Achaeans, and about the two Iases the ranks assembled, in strength such as ours himself would not fault if he came among them, or Athene, the host rallier, for these were the pick of the best that now awaited the Trojans and noble Hector, spears in serried rows, bucklers pressed against bucklers, shields overlapping, helmets by helmets, men packed so tight the horsehair crests on the gleaming boss of their helmets nudged as they bent. Their heads, so close were the ranks, and the spears, brandished in bold hands, intermingled, a woven lattice. Their minds were unswervingly set on battle. The mass of the Trojans now charged, with Hector at their head, driving straight on, like a boulder that rolls down a rock face, when some winter torrent has shifted it off the hilltop, its huge flood undermining the ruthless stone's embedment. And up it bounces. In flight, and the woods echo beneath it as it plunges straight on down, until it reaches the level plain, and there it stops rolling, for all its hurry, so, for a while, Hector threatened to break right through to the sea easily, by way of the Achaean ships and huts, on his killing spree but when he came to those close-packed ranks he stopped, brought up short. The Achaean sons stood against him, jabbing at him with their swords and double-edged spears, and drove him back, he gave ground. Badly shaken, and in a carrying voice called out to the Trojans, Trojans! Lycians! You Dardanian frontline fighters! Stand by me! Not for long shall the Achaeans hold me back, though they've closed their ranks like a wall. No, I rather think they'll give ground before my spear, if indeed I was urged on by the highest of gods, his own loud thundering lord. So saying Hector stirred up each warrior's force and spirit. Daphobos, Priam's son, strode out amongst them, set on greatness, holding his balanced shield before him, advancing light-footedly, under cover of his shield, and Meriones took aim at him with his gleaming spear, and threw, and did not miss but struck the balanced shield of oxide, yet could not pierce it, far short of that, the long spear snapped at its head socket, and Daphobos held his oxide shield away from him, inwardly scared by the spear of Meriones, the skilled warrior. But that hero backed off to the mass of his comrades, deeply angered both by missing a victory and at breaking his spear, and set out back to the huts and ships of the Achaeans to fetch another long spear that he'd left in his hut. But the rest fought on, and an unquenchable clamour went up, and Teucros, Telamon's son, was the first to slay his man, Imbrios, Spearman, the son of horse-rich Mentor, who lived in Padaean before the Achaean sons appeared, and married Medesicast, a bastard daughter of Priam. But when the Danans came, in their well-rounded ships, to Ilion he returned, won renown among the Trojans, and lived with Priam, who honoured him like one of his own sons. Him it was Telamon's son now struck beneath one ear with his long spear, then withdrew it, like an ash tree he fell that on the peak of a mountain in clear view all around is cut down by the bronze, and scatters its tender leaves abroad on the ground, so he fell, his bronze inlaid armour rattling upon him, and two crows, eager to strip his gear, rushed up. As he ran, Hector flung a gleaming spear at him, but he, watching carefully, avoided the bronze missile, a near miss, and it hit Amphimachos in the chest, Teatos's son, Actor's grandson, returning to the battle. 
he fell with a thud, and his armor rattled upon him. Now Hector moved quickly to rip from Amphimachos's head, that great-hearted man, the helmet enclosing his temples, and Aias lunged out with his gleaming spear at Hector as he came on, never reaching his flesh, his whole body was clad in fearsome bronze, just striking his shield's boss, and thrusting him back with huge force. So Hector gave ground, backwards, from the two corpses. The Achaeans dragged them off. Amphimachos was taken by Stichios and noble Menestheus, Athenian leaders, back to the mass of the Achaeans, and Imbrios by the two Iases, full of fighting valor. Like two lions that have snatched a goat from sharp-toothed hounds, and carry it off through thickly growing brushwood, high up off the ground, held tight in their jaws. So these two commanders called Ias hefted Imbrios aloft. And stripped off his battle gear. Out of rage for Amphimachos Oileus's son cut Imbrios's head from his tender neck, swung his arm, and threw the head off into the crowd, like a ball, and it fell in the dust right at Hector's feet. Poseidon was now very deeply angered at heart since his own grandson had fallen in the ruthless struggle, and he made his way past the huts and ships of the Achaeans urging the Danans on, but planning harm for the Trojans. There he encountered Idomeneus, famed spearman, come from tending a comrade just in from the fighting. Cut in the ham of his knee by the keen-edged bronze, his comrades had carried him back. Idomeneus, having left orders for the healers, was going to his hut, still eager to join in the battle. To him now spoke the lordly earthshaker, likening his voice to that of Thoas, Andraemon's son, who in the whole of Pluron and rugged Caledon ruled the Aetolians, being honoured by his people like a god, Idomeneus. Cretan counsellor. Where now are the threats that the sons of the Achaeans once made against the Trojans? To him then Idomeneus, leader of Cretans, replied, Ah. Thoas, so far as I know, there's no one man to blame now, we're all of us skilled, these days, in warfare's business. No man here's been gripped by spiritless terror, none, yielding to hesitancy, has shirked grim war. This must, I suppose, be what pleases the almighty son of Kronos, that here, far from Argos and Nameless, the Achaeans should perish. But Thoas, you were one who always stood strong in battle, and prompt to urge on others you noticed hanging back, so don't give up now, but call upon every man. In answer to him Poseidon the earthshaker then said, Idomeneus, may that man never get back home from Troy, but stay here and become the sport of dogs, who on this day chooses to shirk the fighting. So then, fetch your battle gear, come with me, we have to work together to advance our goal. Though two only, we might still help. When the weakest men unite, their veil is augmented, but we too know how to fight even against the best. So saying, he went back. A god to the struggle of mortals, and Idomeneus, on reaching his well-built hut, put on his fine battle gear, picked out two spears, and set forth, like branched lightning that the son of Kronos grasps in his hand and flourishes from bright Olympos, displaying a sign to mortals, and its clear rays dazzle, so gleamed the bronze around his torso as he ran. Mary owns, his good henchman, met him a short distance from the hut, being on his way to collect another spear of bronze, and mighty Idomeneus now addressed him, Mary owns, Molos' son, swift-footed, dearest of comrades, what brings you here, away from the war and the conflict? Are you wounded, perhaps? Is an arrowhead giving you trouble? Or have you brought me a message? Myself, I'm not minded to sit here, back in my hut, what I want now is to fight. Then sagacious Meriones made him this answer, Idomeneus, counsellor to the bronze corslet Cretans, I'm on my way to get me a spear. If there's still one left in the hut. Since the one I had before, I shattered when I let fly at the shield of haughty Daphobos. To him then Idomeneus, leader of Cretans, replied, if it's spears you want, be it one or twenty, you'll find them lined up there in my hut, against the bright inner wall, Trojan spears, that I take from men I've killed. I don't care to stand well away when I fight my opponents, and so I've a store of spears, and shields with bosses, and helmets, and bright glinting corslets. Then to him sagacious Meriones declared in answer, in my hut too, and in my black ship, there are many spoils from the Trojans, but not handy for me to fetch. Neither have I, I can tell you, forgotten my prowess, among the foremost in battle, where glory is won, is where I take my place when war's conflicts arise. Though some other bronze armored Achaeans are perhaps unaware of my fighting record, you, I think, know it well. To him then Idomeneus, leader of Cretans, replied, I know how brave you are, what need to tell me? If the best of us were being chosen beside the hollow ships for an ambush. A task where men's bravery shows most clearly, and one in which courage and cowardice both are revealed, for the coward's complexion will always keep changing hue, his inner thoughts never are calm, won't let him sit still, he shifts from ham to ham, 
puts his weight on either foot, and his heart goes thump thump in his breast as he thinks about the death spirits, and his teeth begin to chatter. But the brave man's complexion's unchanging, nor is he overly scared when he first takes his place in a warrior's ambush, but prays for a speedy entry to the grievous conflict, not even then would your power, your strong hands come in question. For if you were shot, or struck, in the course of the struggle, not on the nape of your neck would the blow fall, or your back, but rather would make its mark on your chest or nether belly as you pressed on among the foremost to grapple the foe like a lover. But come, let's not loiter here. Chattering as though we were children, that's to invite a rebuke. Off with you to the hut now, pick up that hefty spear. So he spoke, and Marion's, swift R's equal, speedily fetched from the hut a new bronze spear, and followed Idomeneus, his mind firmly set on battle. Just as R's the killer goes about looking for war, with his dear son Panic Rout, the mighty and fearless, who sends even the sturdiest warrior fleeing in terror, and they arm themselves and go from Thrace to the Ephiroi or the great hearted Phlegis, yet never listen to both sides, but just hand out glory to one or the other, so Marion's and Idomeneus, leaders of men, went out to the war, both armoured in gleaming bronze. It was Mary Owens who first addressed his companion, son of Deucalion, where do you want to join the main body? At the far right wing of the army, or in the middle? Or out on the left? Since I figure there's nowhere else that the long-haired Achaeans will fall so short in the struggle. To him then Idomeneus, leader of Cretans, replied, at the ships in the centre there are others to mount a defence, the two Iases and Tucros, who's the best among the Achaeans in bowmanship, no slouch, either, at hand-to-hand -hand combat. These will give Priam's son Hector his fill of warfare, however avid he is for it, never mind his mighty strength. A hard climb he'll have, with all his fighting passion, to vanquish the strength of their irresistible hands and set fire to the fleet, unless the son of Cronos himself should hurl a blazing torch there, in among the swift ships. But great Aias, son of Telamon, would yield to no mere man, any person who's mortal, who eats Demeter's grain, who can be broken apart by the bronze or by great rocks, not even to Achilles, the rank-breaker, would he submit in a stand-up fight, though at running Achilles has no rivals. So, yes, on to the army's left. And we'll know soon enough whether we'll win ourselves glory or yield it to others. So he spoke, and Mary owns, the equal of swift R's, led on, until they reached the troops where he'd commanded. When the Trojans saw Idomeneus, of flame-like prowess, and with him his henchmen in his fine-wrought armour, they passed the word down the line and all went at him, and a general struggle took place around the vessel's sterns. The way that whining gales can generate wind gusts galore on a day when the dust lies thickest along the roads, and altogether stir up an enormous dust cloud, just so their battle was joined, and they were urgent at heart in the throng to cut down each other with the keen-edged bronze. The battle that's death to mortals bristled with lengthy spears that they used to rip flesh with, and eyes were blinded by the bronze radiance from those burnished helmets and newly buffed corslets and brightly shining shields, as they clashed in their masses. Hard hearted would that man be who, seeing this scene, experienced joy, not grief. Opposed in purpose. Cronos's two mighty sons were fashioning miserable troubles for these warrior heroes, Zeus sought victory for Hector and the Trojans to honour swift-footed Achilles, yet no way did he want the Achaean army wiped out before Ilion, wished only to honour the Tees and her strong-hearted son. But Poseidon had joined the Argives, was urging them on, risen secretly from the grey sea, deeply distressed at their rout by the Trojans, and in a furious temper with Zeus. Nevertheless, though they shared the same ancestry and father, Zeus was the elder brother, had more knowledge, and so Poseidon avoided providing open support, but kept stirring up Argive troops, while disguised as a man. So these two drew tight the cords of strong strife and common war over both sides, to and fro, made a knot that could be neither untied nor broken, but would unstring the knees of many. Now, despite his grey hairs, Idomeneus rallied the Danans, and charging among the Trojans, turned them to flight. For he cut down Arthrianius, from Cabasos, a guest in Troy lately arrived, brought there by report of the war, who'd asked to marry the fairest of Priam's daughters, Cassandre, offered no bride price, but made a grandiose promise, that he'd force the Achaean sons, against their will, from Troy, and the aged Priam assented. Bent his head in agreement to give him the girl, he trusted the promise, went to war. But Idomeneus aimed at him with his gleaming spear as he high-stepped forward, threw, and struck home. His bronze corslet failed to protect him, the spear lodged in his mid-belly. He fell with a thud, and Idomeneus boasted over him, saying, Arthrianius, I must compliment you above all mankind if it's true that you're going to accomplish all that you promised to Dardanos as Cyan Priam. He promised you his daughter, 
and we too would make the same promise, and fulfill it, would give you the son of Atreus's loveliest daughter, bring her here from Argos for you to wed, if you join us in sacking the populous city of Ilion. So, come along, here by the seafaring ships we'll work out our agreement over the marriage, and no, we're not fussy about the bride price. So saying, the hero Idomeneus dragged Arthrianius out through the crush of battle, but Aetios came to the rescue, on foot. Ahead of his horses. Their breath kept right on his shoulders by the charioteer, his henchman, eager to take a shot at Idomeneus, but he threw first, hit Aetios with his spear in the throat, under the chin, driving the bronze right through, and he fell as falls an oak or white poplar, or a lofty pine tree that up in the mountain shipwrights fell with their newly sharpened axes to serve as a ship timber. So there in front of his horses and chariot Aetios lay stretched out, screaming, hands clutching the bloody dust, while his charioteer, scared out of the wits that he had before, dared not wheel his team round, and so escaped the hands of the enemy. Steadfast Antilochos took aim, hit him squarely. The corslet of bronze that he wore failed to protect him, the spear lodged in his mid-belly, and gasping for breath he slumped from his well-built chariot, while his horse's Antilochos, great-hearted Nestor's son, drove off, away from the Trojans to the well-grieved Achaeans. Now Daphobos came right up close to Idomeneus. Grieving for Aetios, took a shot with his gleaming spear, but Idomeneus, on the lookout, ducked the bronze-pointed shaft, took cover behind the well-balanced shield he bore, fashioned from circles of oxide and glinting bronze, and well-equipped with two crossbars. Beneath this shield he crouched, and the bronze spear flew over and passed him, harshly scraping the shield's rim. Yet not in vain had Daphobos launched it from his brawny hand, Hippososa's son Hypsona, shepherd of men. It struck in the liver below his midriff, and at once unstrung his knees, and Daphobos shouted aloud, vaunted terribly over him, not unavenged does Aetios lie now, no, I declare, though he's going to the house of Hades, mighty gate guardian, he'll rejoice at heart, since I've furnished him with an escort. So he spoke, and grief stirred the Argives at his boasting, but roused most passion in warlike Antilochos's heart, yet despite his sorrow he wasn't unmindful of his comrade, but ran up and stood over him protecting him with his shield, while two other trusty comrades, Echios's son Machistius and noble Alaster, stooped and lifted him up, and carried him, groaning deeply, back to the hollow ships. Idomeneus never slackened his raging attack, kept up his drive either to shroud some Trojan in black night, or to fall himself, while keeping disaster from the Achaeans. Next, the dear son of Aesites, Zeus's nursling, the hero Alcathus, son-in-law to Anchises, having married his eldest daughter, Hippodamea whom her father and lady mother cherished in their house since she excelled all other girls of her age in beauty and wit and fine handiwork, this being why the man she wed was the best in all broad Troy, him, by Idomeneus's hand, Poseidon laid low, holding his bright eyes spellbound, shackled his glorious limbs, so he could neither flee backwards nor dodge aside, but stood, like a pillar or some high leafy tree, motionless, while he was run through in mid-chest by the hero Idomeneus's spear. It tore clean through the bronze corslet that hitherto had kept death from his flesh, but now rasped harshly around the rending spear. He fell with a thud. The spear lodged firm in his heart, which, beating still, sent vibration out to the spear's butt end, then at last mighty Ars stopped its force. Idomeneus shouted aloud, vaunted terribly over him, Daphobos, now perhaps we can call it fair recompense, the way you boast, three killed in exchange for one? Crazed man, now stand up against me yourself, and learn how I'm descended from Zeus, I who have voyaged here. First Zeus begot Menos to be Crete's guardian, then Menos in turn sired a son, the peerless Deucalion. And Deucalion fathered me, to be lord over many warriors in spacious Crete, and now the ships have brought me to Troy to make trouble for you, and your father, and the Trojans generally. So he spoke. Daphobos pondered, mind uncertain, should he seek out a comrade from the great-hearted Trojans, withdrawing to do so or make trial of Idomeneus on his own? And to him, on reflection, this seemed the better course, to go and look for Aeneas. He found him standing idle on the far side of the action. Still resentful of noble Priam, who would accord him no honour, good warrior though he was. Daphobos now came up and addressed him with winged words, Aeneas, the Trojan's counsellor, there is sore need for you to rescue your brother-in-law, if the loss of kin can move you. Come with me and rescue Alcathus, who, long years ago, as your sister's husband, kept you as a child in his house. He's been killed by Idomeneus, the famous spearman. So he spoke, and aroused the spirit in the breast of Aeneas, who charged straight at Idomeneus, mind set on battle. 
Idomeneus was not seized by panic, like some youngster, but waited, as when a boar in the mountains, trusting his strength, awaits the huge pack of men that's coming against him at a lonely spot, he pricks up the bristles along his back, his eyes blaze with fire, he wets his tusks, makes ready to fight off, zestfully, attacks from both dogs and hunters, so Idomeneus, famous spearman, awaiting Aeneas's charge, did not back off, but rather called out to his comrades, looking round at Ascalaphos, Dapiros, and Aphareus, Meriones and Antilochos, lords of the battle cry, to whom he addressed now winged words of exhortation, come help me, friends. I'm alone, and terribly afraid of swift-footed Aeneas, now advancing to attack me, very strong he is, very good at killing men in battle, and he's in the flower of youth, when a man's strength is greatest. Were we in our present mood, but of a like age, then straightway either he or I would win a great victory. So he spoke, and they all, with a single end in mind, came and stood round him, shields settled on their shoulders. On the other side Aeneas called out to his own comrades, looking round at Daphobos, Paris, and the noble age Nor, leaders with him of the Trojans. Arrayed in their rear there followed a mass of troops, a sheep will trail a ram to water from feeding place, and the shepherds glad at heart. So the heart in Aeneas's breast rejoiced at the sight of these massed troops that were following on behind him. So over Alcathus they went at it hand to hand with their long spears, the bronze girding their chests rang loudly with thrusts made to and fro in the turmoil one at another. Two men, fighters skilled above the rest, Idomeneus and Aeneas, both equals of ours, hungered to cut up each other's flesh with the pitiless bronze, Aeneas had the first shot, let fly at Idomeneus, who, watching carefully, avoided the bronze spear, and Aeneas's shaft ended quivering, stuck point first deep in the ground, flung in vain from his sturdy hand. But Idomeneus hit Oinomau square in the mid-belly, broke the plate of his corslet, so that his gut spilled out through the bronze. In the dust he fell, hand clawing the earth, and Idomeneus from his corpse pulled the far-shadowing spear, yet could not also strip the splendid battle gear from off his shoulders, so hard-pressed he was by missiles, for his leg joints no longer were steady when he ran wouldn't let him retrieve his own spear, or dodge another's. So in close combat he stood off his pitiless death day, but his feet could no longer hurry him out of the fighting, and as, step by step, he backed off, Daphobos, who'd long nursed an undying grudge against him, let fly his gleaming spear, but missed him once more, and instead hit Ascalaphos, Inyalios's son. Through his shoulder the mighty spear drove, in the dust he fell, hand clawing the earth. As yet mighty loud-voiced Ars knew nothing about the fall of his son in the relentless grind of battle, he sat on the heights of Olympos, beneath the golden clouds, kept there by the will of Zeus, like all the other immortal gods, well away from the war and the fighting. Now over Ascalaphos they battled hand to hand. Daphobos tore loose from the corpse his gleaming helmet, but Marion's, swift Ars equal, sprang at him, jabbed his arm with his spear. From his hand the visored headpiece fell clanged as it hit the ground. And Meriones, like a vulture, pounced once more, pulled out his mighty spear from Daphobos's arm, then backed off to rejoin his companions, while Poltes, Daphobos's brother, one arm around his waist, led him out of warfare's grim clamour, till he reached the swift horses awaiting him, out back behind the fighting, that stood there along with their driver and their inlaid chariot. These bore him away to the city, groaning deeply, in great pain, the blood still dripping down from his newly wounded arm but the rest fought on, and a clamour unquenchable went up. Aeneas now went for Aphareus, Calata's son, as he turned to face him, drove a sharp spear into his throat, and his head lolled to one side, and his shield fell on him, his helmet too, death, the life-queller, was shed about him. Then Antilochos, seizing his chance, as Thune turned away pounced and stabbed him. Completely severed the vein that runs the length of the back till it reaches the neck, this he severed completely and Thune slumped down on his back in the dust, stretching out both hands to his comrades. Antilochos crouched, started stripping the gear off his shoulders, but kept an eye out, for the Trojans were all around him, taking shots at his broad bright shield, yet they could not get through to Mar with their pitiless bronze Antilochos's soft flesh, since Poseidon, the earthshaker, protected Nestor's son too closely, even amid a shower of missiles, for Antilochos never lacked enemies. He kept turning about amongst them, nor was his spear ever still, but always poised, brandished, while he debated in his mind whether to throw from a distance or close in hand to hand. His sighting for shots down the ranks was not lost on Adamas, Aetios's son, who struck his shield with the pitiless bronze, squarely, up close. But his spear point was robbed of its force by dark maned Poseidon, who grudged it his favourite's life, half the spear, like a charred stake. 
stayed stuck fast in Antilochos's shield, the other half lay on the ground. And Adalmas backed away to his comrades, avoiding fate. But Marion's followed after him, speared him midway between navel and genitals, the place where a battle wound inflicts on wretched mortals the sharpest pain of all. Here he thrust in his spear, and Adalmas, flung forward, convulsed on the spike, like an ox that herdsmen in the mountains are bound with ropes and are dragging off against its will, so he, when hit, convulsed for a little, but not for long, till the hero Marion's came up and tore the spear out of his flesh, and darkness shrouded his eyes. Then Helenus at close quarters hit Dapiros on the temple with a great Thracian sword, and ripped off his helmet. Torn from his head it dropped groundwards, and an Achaean scooped it up as it rolled among the fighter's feet, and night's darkness fell on Dapiros, shrouding his eyes. This grieved Atreus's son Menelos, of the fine war cry, out he strode, with loud threats for heroic Prince Helenus. And waving his sharp spear. But Helenus drew his bow, and they both let fly together, the one with his sharp spear, the other with an arrow sped from the bowstring. Priam's son hit Menelos in the chest with his arrow, on the plate of his corslet, and off it the bitter arrow glanced. Just as off a broad shovel on a big threshing floor the dark hued beans or chickpeas fly through the air before the shrill storm blast, and the sweep of the winnower, in such wise from the corslet of glorious Menelos the bitter arrow glanced off, and flew wide of the mark. But Atreus's son Menelos, of the fine war cry, threw and hit Helenus in the hand that held his well polished bow. Through his hand into the bow the bronze spear was driven, he backed off to rejoin his comrades, avoiding fate, hand inert at his side, the ash spear dragging behind it, and great hearted Agenor drew the spear from his hand, and closed the wound with a length of twisted wool, a sling. That his henchman, the people's shepherd, kept for him. Next Paisandros went straight for glorious Menelos, but an ill fate was leading him to the end that's death, to be brought down by you, Menelos, in the grim conflict. When in their advance they drawn close, the one to the other, the son of Atreus missed, his spear flew wide, and Paisandros hit on the shield of glorious Menelos, yet could not manage to drive the bronze clean through, for the broad shield stopped it, his spear broke off at the socket. Even so he was cheerful at heart, looked for a victory, but Atreus's son drew his silver-studded sword, and sprang at Paisandros, who, from behind his shield, brought out a fine bronze axe on a haft of olive wood, long and well-polished. Each attacked at the same moment, Paisandros caught Menelos on his helmet's central strip, at the top, by the horsehair crest, but Menelos hit him as he came, in the forehead above the bridge of his nose. Bone crunched. Both bloody eyeballs fell in the dust at his feet. He crumpled and fell. Menelos set one foot on his breast, stripped off his armor, and boasted over him, this is how you'll all leave the ships of the swift colt Danans, you arrogant Trojans, never sated with war's dread clamor, who have no lack of other shaming or wrongful acts that you've done against me, foul dogs, no fear in your hearts of the harsh wrath of thundering Zeus, guest friendship's lord, who in time to come will lay your high city low, for my wedded wife it was, and a load of my possessions, that you wantonly sailed away with, after being entertained in her home, and now, again, among our seafaring ships you're minded to fling fatal fire, to kill Achaean heroes. But you'll be stopped short, however hot you are for fighting. Zeus, father, they claim that in wisdom you beat all others, both men and gods, yet all these things happen through you, such as now, when you're favoring the arrogant wrongdoers, these Trojans. Whose power's forever outrageous who cannot ever glut their urge for the clamor of common warfare. All things attain their satiety, sleep and love, sweet song, and the blameless dance, these are the things of which any man would, most happily, get his fill rather than war, but these Trojans are insatiate of battle. So saying, having stripped from its flesh the blooded armor, and given it to his comrades, Menelos the blameless himself went back again, mixed with the frontline fighters. Then there sprang out against him King Pylamene's son, Harpalion, he'd come with his father to Troy to join the fighting, but never returned to the land of his birth. He now came close, scored a clear hit on the son of Atreus's shield, yet could not manage to drive the bronze clean through, and backed off to rejoin his comrades, avoiding fate, glancing all round, lest someone should wound him with the bronze. But as he went, Marion's let fly a bronze-tipped arrow that hit him on the right buttock. The shaft passed through along the line of the bladder under the bone. He sank, sat where he was, and in the arms of his comrades breathed out his life, and like a worm lay stretched there on the ground, his dark blood ran. Soaked the earth. The great-hearted Paphlagonians attended to him, lifted him into a chariot, bore him to sacred Ilion, lamenting, and with them went his father, shedding tears, but no blood price was ever paid for his dead son. 
his killing left Paris incensed beyond measure, since he, out of so many Paphlagonians, had at one time been his host. Angered on his behalf, Paris flighted a bronze-tipped arrow. There was a man named Eucanor, the seer Polyidos' son, rich, a fine warrior, who made his home in Corinthos. He'd shipped out well aware of his baneful death spirit, since often told by his father, the virtuous Polyidos, that he'd either perish at home of some fatal disease, or else be slain by the Trojans among the Achaeans' ships. This way he avoided both a heavy Achaean fine and the loathsome disease, suffered no grief at heart. Him Paris hit under the ear and jaw, swiftly the breath of life fled from his limbs, and hateful darkness claimed him. So these fought on in the likeness of blazing fire, but Hector, so dear to Zeus, had not heard, was quite unaware that out to the left of the ships his men were being slaughtered by the Argives. Soon great glory would have been the Achaean's lot, such a force was the Earthshaker, Earth Enfolder now urging the Argives on, and himself also aiding them. Where Hector had first made his charge at gates and wall, breaking the serried ranks of the Dane and Shield men, around the ships of Aeus and Protosilaus, drawn up along the shore of the Grey Sea, where beyond them the wall was built lowest. It was here that those warriors fighting with chariots and horses now showed the strongest. Here troops from Boeotia, rope-trailing Ionians, men of Locris and Thea, illustrious Epeans, strove hard to repel the attack on the ships, yet could not fend off from themselves noble Hector, so like a flame, not even the picked Athenians, whose leader was Petios' son Menestheus, accompanied by men such as Stichios, Faders. Strong bias, while the Epeans were led by Phileus' son Megs. By Amphion, Drachios, and Medon and staunch Podarx headed the Thians, one of these, Medon, a bastard of godlike Oileus and brother to Aeus, nevertheless lived far away from his native land, in Philake, after killing a man, a kinsman of his stepmother Areopis, wife to Oileus. The other, Podarx, was Iphiclos's son and grandson of Philicos. These, in their armour, headed the great-hearted Thians, who, with the Boeotians, were fighting to save the ships. Now Aeus, Oileus's swift son, would no more stand apart from Aeus the son of Telamon, not for one instant, but as in a fallow field two wine-hued oxen both strain with one accord at the jointed plough, while round the base of their horns sweat breaks, and trickles, and only the polished yoke keeps the two apart as they force on down the furrow, plough to the field's edge. Just so did both Aeus's stand, together, side by side, and after Telamon's son there followed a mass of valiant soldiers. His comrades relieving him of his shield whenever sweat and exhaustion took over his limbs. But the Locrians did not follow with Oileus's great-hearted son, for their hearts were not in close-quarter fighting, seeing they'd arrived with neither bronze horsehair-crested helmets, nor trimly rounded shields, nor ashwood spears, it was trusting their bows, their slings of braided sheep's wool that they'd followed him here, to Ilion, and using these, shooting thick and fast, that they tried to break the Trojans' ranks. So the ones with their fine-wrought war gear, out in front, fought against the Trojans and bronze-armoured Hector, while the others, behind, kept shooting from cover, the Trojans lost their taste for the fight, upset by this shower of arrows. In sad disarray, then, thrust back from the ships and the huts. Would the Trojans have retreated to Windy Ilion, had not Puladamas gone to bold Hector, and, standing beside him, said, Hector, there's no way to persuade you through argument. In your God-given knowledge of warfare you have no rival, but that makes you also want to outshine others in counsel. Never will you be able to master all things yourself, on one man heaven bestows expertise in warfare, on another in dancing, or in singing and playing the lyre, while in yet another man's breast far-seeing Zeus implants a clever mind, from which many people get benefit, and many he saves, but he knows it most clearly himself. Anyway I will declare what seems to me to be best, all round you now there blazes a ring of warfare, and the great-hearted Trojans. Now they've surmounted the wall, are some of them standing by with their gear, while others fight on, few against many, scattered among the ships. I say pull back now, summon here all the leaders. Then let's debate every single suggestion. Should we make our assault on the many benched ships, if maybe some god is willing us victory, or rather retreat unscathed from those ships hereafter? For my own part, I fear the Achaeans may pay back yesterday's debt, since beside the ships there lingers a war-obsessed man who will not, I think, much longer hold off from battle. So spoke Puladamas, his shrewd advice pleased Hector, who at once sprang, fully armed, from his chariot to the ground, and then addressed him, speaking in winged words, Puladamas, while you're assembling all the leaders here I shall go up to the front, take a close look at the fighting, and come straight back, when I've given them my full orders. So he spoke, and at once set off, like some snow-clad mountain, shouting, and sped through the ranks of the Trojans and their allies, 
who all rallied to Panthusa's son, hospitable Puladamas, when they heard the voice of Hector. But he meanwhile went in search of Daphobos. And the mighty prince Hellenus. And Adamar's son of Asios, and Asios, Hertikos's son, ranging among the frontline fighters in his quest. But he found them no longer unscathed or disaster-free, some lay dead by the sterns of the Achaean ships, who'd lost their lives at the hands of the Argives, others were inside the wall, all wounded, either shot or cut up. However, there was one he soon found, to the left of the tearful battle, the godlike Alexandros, husband of fair-haired Helen, cheering his comrades on and urging them to fight, and he went and stood close and addressed him in shaming words, wretched Paris, so handsome, so mad for women, seducer, where is Daphobos, tell me. Or the mighty prince Hellenus. Or Adamar's son of Asios, or Asios, Hertikos's son. Yes, and Arthrianius. Now the whole of steep Ilion's on the brink of disaster, now sheer destruction certain. Then Alexandros the godlike made him this response, Hector, since your mindset is to blame the blameless. At other times indeed I may have thought of withdrawing from battle. But not now, I wasn't born wholly a weakling. From the moment you roused your comrades to fight beside the ships, we've been engaged here non-stop against the Danans. As for the comrades you're asking after, they're dead, all but two, Daphobos and the mighty prince Hellenus, and they both left the field, both with arm wounds inflicted by long spears, though Kronos' son saved them from death. So now lead on, wherever your heart and spirit tell you, and we'll follow you gladly, nor do I think you'll find us in any way lacking in Vela, while we still have strength, but beyond their strength none can fight, however eager. With these words the hero persuaded his brother's mind, and they went where the uproar of battle was most intense, all around Kebriones and the peerless Puladamas, Forks and Ortheos and godlike Polyphetes, Parmis, Ascanios, and Morris, Hippotian's son, who'd arrived from rich-soiled Ascania as reliefs the morning before. And now Zeus stirred their fighting spirit. They came on as strong as the blast of threatening winds that beneath the thunder of Zeus, the father, scours the plain, its wondrous clamour confused with the sea's roar, and in the mixed wave after boiling wave of the thunderous ocean. Arching high, foam-flecked, some ahead, others behind, so the Trojans, in order, some ahead, others behind, gleaming in bronze, now followed behind their leaders. Hector was their commander, a match for ours the killer, this son of Priam, before him he bore his balanced shield, with its close-packed hides, on which abundant bronze was laid, and, set round his temples, his shining helmet bobbed as this way and that he strode, making trial of the ranks, finding out if they'd shrink before him as he came on under his shield, but no way could he daunt the spirit in the Achaean's breasts, and Aias challenged him first, advancing with long-legged strides, hey! Crazy, come closer! Why are you uselessly trying to scare the Argives? We're no beginners in warfare, it was through the vile scourge of Zeus that we Achaeans were beaten. In your heart, at a guess, you're expecting to despoil our ships, but we too have strong hands to defend them. Before that day, indeed, this populous city of yours may well be taken, laid waste beneath our hands, and as for yourself, I declare that day near when you will pray, in flight, to Zeus the father and other immortals to make your fine-maned horses swifter than falcons as they carry you city wards raising dust clouds over the plain. As he spoke thus, a bird flew across on the right, a high-soaring eagle, the Achaean troops raised a cheer, made bold by the omen. But illustrious Hector replied, Aias, you bumbling speaker, you braggart, what mere stuff your words are. I wish I were the son of Zeus of the Aegis all my days, and it was the lady here who bore me. And I was honoured as our Athene and Apollo. As surely as this day is bringing disaster to the Argives, every last one, and amongst them you too will die, if you dare await my long spear, that will tear your lily-white skin, and you'll glut the Trojans' dogs, and their birds of prey with your fat and flesh, after you fall beside the Achaean's ships. So saying, he led on, and they followed on after him with a deafening clamour, and the troops behind them cheered. The Argives facing them shouted in answer, did not forget their valour, stood firm as the Trojan leaders advanced. Both sides' clamour went up the high sky to Zeus's glory. Book 14. Nestor was drinking, but still picked up the sounds of battle, and so addressed winged words to the son of Asclepios, consider, noble Machaon, how this business will turn out, the clamour of lusty young fighters around the ships is louder. Now you just sit where you are, and drink your firebright wine till fair-tressed Hecamede heats you a warm bath and washes you clean of all that dried blood. I myself am off to a vantage point to see what's going on. 
So saying, he took the well-made shield of his son, Thrasymedes the horsebreaker, that was lying there in the hut, all gleaming with bronze, his own shield his son had taken, and selected a solid spear, tipped with keen-edged bronze. Standing outside the hut, he at once saw a wretched scene, his own side in disarray, with the enemy, the high-hearted Trojans, in hot pursuit, and the Achaeans' wall torn down. As when the vast deep darkens up with a silent coma, vaguely foretelling the shrill wind's rapid courses. The waves don't roll forward towards one side or the other until some decisive gale comes down from Zeus. Just so the old man meditated, pondering in his mind this way and that, join the swift colt Danan's throng. Or seek Atreus' son Agamemnon, shepherd of the people. And as he debated, this struck him as being the better way, to go after Atreus' son. But meanwhile the rest fought on, killing each other, the tireless bronze sheathing their bodies clanged as they thrust with their swords and twin-edged spears. Now Nestor encountered those kings, Zeus's nurslings, who'd been maimed by the bronze, as they made their way back from the ships, the son of Tydeus, Odysseus, and Atreus's son Agamemnon. Far distant from the fighting the ships of these were drawn up on the shore of the grey sea, they'd been the first to be dragged up to the plain, and the wall was built well beyond their sterns. For wide though the beach was, there was no way that it could contain all the ships, and the army was short of camp space. So they hauled up the ships row by row, and filled the entire shore the two headlands enclosed. So these kings were going, together, to witness the uproar and the fighting, each leaning on his spear, and sorrow afflicted the spirit in the breasts of them all. It was thus that the old man, Nestor, met them, alarming the hearts in the breasts of these Achaeans, and the lord Agamemnon now addressed him, saying, Ah, Nestor, son of Nellius, great glory of the Achaeans, why have you left the murderous conflict to come here? I fear mighty Hector's fulfilling the promise he made me, those threats that he issued when speaking before the Trojans, that he wouldn't go back to Ilion from our ships until he'd set fire to the ships and killed their defenders too, such were his words, and now all this is being accomplished. Curse it, it must be that the other well-grieved Achaeans are storing a grudge against me, as is Achilles, and don't mean to make a fight of it by the sterns of our vessels. Then Nestor, Gerenian horseman, answered him as follows, yes, indeed. These things have happened. Are on us, not even high thundering Zeus himself could have ordered them differently. The wall indeed is down that we put our trust in to be an unbreakable bulwark for our vessels and ourselves, while those at the swift ships fight on ceaselessly, without end, you could no longer tell, even by watching closely, from which side the Achaeans are being driven in flight, so mingled their deaths, as the battle cry rises to heaven. We need to consider how this business will turn out, is there any plan can affect it? but I'm against our joining the battle, a wounded man is in no position to fight. Then once more spoke in response the king of men, Agamemnon, Nestor, since they are fighting now by the sterns of the ships, and neither the wall we built, nor the ditch, has helped us at all, though the Danans labored hard at them, hoped in their hearts that they'd be an unbreakable bulwark for the ships and themselves, this, I think, must be the pleasure of all-powerful Zeus. That we Achaeans should perish here, namelessly, far from Argos. I knew it when he was prompt in support of the Danans, and I know it now, when he honours our foes as he would the blessed gods, and has shackled our strength and hands. So, let us now all agree to the action that I propose, all the vessels drawn up in the first line, close to the sea, we should haul down into the bright brine, set them afloat, and moor them with anchor stones, until the coming of immortal night, if even then these Trojans take a break from the fighting. Later we could relaunch the whole fleet. There's no blame in fleeing disaster, even at night, escape by flight is better than getting caught. Angrily eyeing him, resourceful Odysseus responded, son of Atreus, what words have escaped the barrier of your teeth? A cursed man, you should be in command of some other miserable ragtag army, not lord over us, to whom Zeus has given the task, from youth to old age, of winding the skein of grim war, till we perish, every last man. Are you really so eager to leave the Trojan spacious city, for which we've endured so much hardship? Be silent, in case some other Achaean hears this statement that you've just made, words no man should ever utter, let alone one who knows in his mind what's proper to say, who's accepted king, to whom as many owe their allegiance as the number of Argives over whom you have lordship. I wholly despise your thinking, in what you just said, for telling us, when warfare and combat are in progress, to relaunch our well-benched vessels. So that the Trojans, with the upper hand already, may win yet more of their hopes, while we suffer sheer destruction. The Achaeans won't pursue this war any further once our vessels are seaborne, they'll be looking elsewhere, disengaging from the conflict, and it's then your advice will destroy us, commander-in-chief. 
To him then the king of men, Agamemnon, made his answer, Ah, Odysseus, you've pierced my heart with this reproof of yours, it's so harsh. I would never tell the sons of the Achaeans to haul our bench vessels seaward against their will. I wish there was someone to offer us better advice than mine, either young man or old, this is what I'd really welcome. Among them now spoke Diams, good at the war cry, such a man is close by, we'll not need to seek him long, that is, if you'll listen, if you're not, each one of you, angry because in years I'm the youngest among you. Even so, I too can boast of my lineage, have an excellent father, Tydeus. Whom now in they the heaped earth covers. For to Portheus were born three peerless sons, who had their home in Pluron and mountainous Caledon, Melas and Agrios, and, third, the horseman Oeneus, my father's father, who in Valor outshone them all. He stayed there, my father wandered, settled in Argos, such, I suppose, was the will of Zeus and the other gods. He married one of Adrestos's daughters, dwelt in a house rich in possessions, owned abundant wheat bearing plowland, with numerous orchards round about, and plentiful flocks, besides excelling every Achaean as a spearman. All this you'll have heard, and know the truth of it. So you can't say that by descent I'm a coward or weakling, and therefore scorn any good advice I give you. Come then, let's to the battle, though wounded, go we must. Ourselves we'll hold back from the conflict, out of the range of missiles, lest one of us suffer a wound upon his wound, but the others we'll urge into combat, those who till now, nursing their mood, have held back. Stayed out of the fighting. So he spoke. They willingly heard him out, and obeyed, set forth and went, Agamemnon, the king of men, leading them. No blind watch did the far-famed earthshaker keep, but accompanied them in the likeness of an old man, and grasped the right hand of Atreus's son Agamemnon and spoke to him, uttering winged words, son of Atreus. Now, I fancy, Achilles' baneful heart must be rejoicing in his breast as he watches this slaughter and pursuit of the Achaeans, since there's no sense in him, not a scrap, so may he perish, so may some god undo him. But with you the blessed gods are in no way angered, even yet the leaders and rulers of the Trojans may raise dust clouds on the wide plain, and you'll see them fleeing back to the city from the ships and huts. So saying, he bellowed aloud as he charged across the plain, as loud was the shout that nine. No, ten, thousand men utter in wartime as they engage in our strife, so great was the cry that the Lord, the earth shaker, sent forth from his chest, putting great strength in every last Achaean's heart to engage in warfare and battle without cease. Here the golden throne now observed him from where she stood on a peak of Olympos, she recognized him at once as he bustled about in the battle that wins men glory. Her own and her husband's brother, and she rejoiced at heart. Zeus too she observed, ensconced on the topmost peak of spring-rich Ida, and hateful he was to her heart. So the ox-eyed lady here now took thought as to how she could best delude the mind of Zeus of the Aegis, and this to her way of thinking seemed the best plan, to beautify herself nicely, then make her way to Ida and see if he might desire to embrace her body in love, and she might then shed a warm and peaceful sleep on his eyelids and his sharp and devious mind. So she went to the private chamber that her dear son Hephaistos had built her, fitting strong doors to the door frame, with a secret key, to be opened by no other god. In there she went, and shut the shining doors. First with ambrosia she cleaned off the whole of her lovely body, then she gave it a massage it with olive oil, specially perfumed for her ambrosial robe, and which, merely shaken in Zeus's bronze-built abode, would spread its aroma out to both earth and heaven. With this she anointed her sweet flesh, then combed out her hair, and with her hands plaited the shining tresses, fine and ambrosial, from her immortal head, put on an ambrosial robe that Athene had skillfully made for her, and adorned with many embroideries, this with golden brooches she pinned at the breast, and round her waist tied a sash with a hundred tassels, and in her pierced ears put earrings, embellished with triple mulberry clusters, that shone in an alluring fashion. Over all this here, bright among goddesses, spread a fine glistening veil, as white as the very sun, and under her gleaming feet bound her beautiful sandals. Now, having decked out her body with every adornment, she emerged from her chamber, and called to her Aphrod, away from the other gods and had this to say to her, will you listen now, dear child, to what I shall ask you, or refuse me, out of vexation at heart, because I give support to the Danaans. You to the Trojans? Then answered her Aphrod. Daughter of Zeus, here, elder goddess, daughter of mighty Kronos, tell me what you've in mind, my heart says I should do it if do it I can and it's something that can be done. To her the lady here, deception in mind, replied, give me now love and passion, those things with which you vanquish all men both mortals and the immortal, for I'm going to visit the ends of the bounteous earth, an ocean, who gave gods their being, 
and Tess is my mother, who brought me up well and cared for me in their home after taking me over from Rhea Wenzu's, the far-seeing, thrust chronos down under the earth and the unharvested sea. Them I am going to visit, to resolve their unsettled quarrel, for too long they've held aloof each from the other in love and the marriage bed, since angers filled their hearts. If I could talk those two over, bring their hearts back to bed, to be reunited in love together, then I'd forever known be as their friend, one worth their respect. To her then replied laughter-loving Aphrod, it's not possible. Nor is it seemly, that I should deny this request from you, who sleep in almighty Zeus's embrace. With that she undid from her bosom the embroidered breast band, intricately worked, with all kinds of allurement set in it, therein were love, and desire, and dalliance, beguilement that steals away the sharp wits of even sensible people. She put this in here's hands, and addressed her, saying, here, take this breast band, lay it up in your bosom, intricately worked and in it all kinds of things set, you'll not, I tell you, return with your heart's wish unaccomplished. So she spoke, and here, the oxide lady, smiled, and with that smile laid the breast band up in her bosom. The daughter of Zeus, Aphrod, now went to her house, but here darted down, leaving the heights of Olympos, traversed Pyria, and lovely Amathia, flew over the snow-clad mountains of the horse-herding Thracians, their topmost peaks. Her feet never catching the ground, from Athos she moved on over the wave-swept deep, and came to Lemnos, the city of godlike Thoas. Here she encountered sleep. The brother of death, whom she took by the hand, and addressed in the following words, Sleep, you lord over all gods and all mankind, if you ever listen to words of mine, so now once more obey me, I'll be in your debt for all my days. Make drowsy for me Zeus's bright eyes beneath his brows the moment I'm through with lying beside him in love, and gifts I'll give you. A fine throne that'll last forever, of gold, too, skillfully made for me by my own son, Hephaistos, lame of both legs, and he'll add a footstool to it, on which you can rest your sleek feet while you sit and feast. In answer to her soothing sleep had this to say, here, elder goddess, daughter of mighty Kronos, some other one of the gods that live on forever I might easily lull to sleep, yes, even the streams of the river ocean, that established genesis of them all, but to Zeus, son of Kronos, I'd never come too close, nor would I lull him to sleep. Unless he so ordered me, for once in the past another such order of yours taught me a lesson. The day when that arrogant son of Zeus sailed from Ilion, after he'd sacked the Trojan city. Then indeed I beguiled the mind of Zeus of the Aegis, swirling gently about him, while for his son you plotted trouble, stirred over the deeper gale of dangerous winds, and sent him out of his way to well-populated Kos, far from his kin. Zeus woke, was enraged, strong-armed the other gods in his palace, sought me especially, would have hurled me from heaven into the deep, to be lost forever, had night not saved me, who lays low both gods and men. To her I came in my flight, and Zeus, though enraged, held off me, to avoid displeasing swift night, whom he revered. And now you're telling me to perform this other task? Out of the question. Then the oxide lady here once more addressed him, sleep, why are you brooding over all these things in your heart? Do you think far-seeing Zeus would help the Trojans, be enraged for them as he was for his own son Heracles? Look. I'll make you a present of one of the younger graces to take in wedlock. And to be known as your wife, Pasithi, whom you've yearned for your whole life. So she spoke, and sleep, delighted, replied to her in these words, Come, then, swear to me by Styx's sacrosanct waters, with one hand laying hold of the nurturing earth, and the other the glistening mane, that between us two they may all bear witness all the gods that are below with Kronos, that you will make me a present of one of the younger graces, Pasithi, whom I've longed for my whole life. So he spoke, and the goddess, white-armed here, did not ignore him, but swore as he wanted, invoked by name all the gods that dwell under Tartaros, and are known as Titans. When she'd sworn the oath, accomplished it fully, they both went on their way, left the townships of Lemnos and Imbros, shrouded in mist, and swiftly followed their chosen path. To spring-rich Ida they came, the mother of wild creatures, and Lecton, where first they left the sea. And together went on over land. And the treetops rippled beneath their feet. Their sleep stopped, before the eyes of Zeus perceived him, and climbed a very tall fir tree, the highest then on Ida, reaching up through the mist to the clear air above. Here he sat, well hidden by the fir tree's crowding branches, like that sharp-voiced bird in the mountains, called by the gods Chalkis, but mortal men refer to it as Kimindis. But here pressed on swiftly, came to Gargaros, the topmost peak of High Ida, and Zeus the cloud gatherer saw her. The moment he did so, passion eclipsed his reason thinking, such as he'd felt the first time they went to bed and made love together, unseen by their own dear parents. Now he stood before her, 
and addressed her in these words, Here, with what in mind are you come here, down from Olympos? Your horses are not here, nor your chariot to ride in. To him, with deception in mind, the lady here replied, I'm going to visit the ends of the bounteous earth, an ocean, who gave gods their being, and Tessis my mother, who brought me up well and cared for me in their halls. Them am I going to visit, to resolve their unsettled quarrel, for too long now they've held aloof each from the other in love and the marriage bed, since anger has filled their hearts. As for my horses, they're waiting in Springrich Ida's foothills, to carry me over dry land and the watery deep. But now it's because of you I've come here, down from Olympos, since you might be annoyed with me later, if I departed, without saying a word, for the home of deep flowing ocean. In answer to her then Zeus the cloud gatherer said, here. You can go there at some later time, let us both now take our pleasure in bed. Since never before has so strong a passion for goddess or mortal woman encompassed my body and mastered the spirit in my breast, not when I was making love with the wife of Ixion, who bore me Perithous, the god's own equal in council, nor when I had Neetankled Danae, Acrisios's daughter, who gave birth to Perseus, most prestigious of warriors, nor when I loved the daughter of far-famed Phoenix, who bore me both Menos and godlike Radamanthes, nor when it was Samiel, or Alcmene in. Thabe, she it was that bore Heracles, my stout-hearted son, while Samiel bore Dionysos, the delight of mortals, nor when it was Demeter, that fair-tressed queen, nor glorious Leto, no, nor even yourself, as now I'm enamoured of you, and possessed by sweet desire. To him, with deception in mind, the lady here replied, Most dread son of Kronos, what's this that you're telling me? Is what you want to go to bed now and make love here on the peaks of Ida? Where everything's in plain view. How would it be if a god? One of those who live forever, should see us in bed, and tell tales when he got back among all the other gods? Then, I tell you, I'd not be able to go from bed here back to your house, I'd feel too ashamed. But if that's what you want, if it's your heart's desire, you have a bedchamber that your dear son Hephaestos built for you, fitting solid doors into the door frame, let's go there and lie down, since bed is now your pleasure. In answer to her then Zeus the cloud gatherer said, Here, you need not fear that either god or mortal may see us, with such a cloud I shall wrap you about, of gold, through which not even Aelios could discern us, whose vision is unsurpassed for keenness of perception. With that the son of Kronos clasped his wife in his arms, and beneath them the noble earth made fresh grass spring up, and dewy trefoil and crocus and hyacinth, soft and thick, that cushioned them from the ground. On these they lay, and were wrapped about in a cloud. Lovely and golden and from it drops of glistening dew rained down. So the father slumbered in peace, on the summit of Gargaros, by sleep and lovemaking vanquished, his wife in his embrace. But soothing sleep ran off to the ships of the Achaeans with a message for the earthshaker and earthen folder, and standing beside him addressed him in winged words, readily now, Poseidon, you can succour the Danans and grant them glory, if but for a little, as long as Zeus remains asleep, since on him I've shed soft oblivion, when here beguiled him, made him lie with her in love. So saying, he went on his way to the famous tribes of men, but Poseidon was stirred yet further to rescue the Danans. At once, dashing up to the front ranks, he called out loudly, Argives. Must we again cede the victory to Hector, Priam's son, allow him to take the ships, to win glory? This he says, thus he boasts it will be, on account of Achilles staying back by the hollow ships, enraged at heart. But we'll not miss his presence too much so long as the rest of us rouse ourselves now and lend support to one another. Come then. Let's all of us do what I suggest, let's find the biggest and best shields in the army. Cover our heads with gleaming helmets, and take in our hands the longest lances, and so arrayed go forth. I shall be the leader, nor do I anticipate that Priam's son Hector, however eager, will face us. And any tough warrior, a small shield on his shoulder, should now exchange that for a lesser man's bigger one. So he spoke, they heard him out readily, and obeyed, and the kings themselves, though wounded, joined the array, Tydeus' son, and Odysseus, Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and going throughout the ranks they made an exchange of armour, good fighters donned the good gear, gave the less good to lesser men. Then, when they'd sheathed their bodies in gleaming bronze, they set out, under the leadership of Poseidon the Earthshaker, in his strong hand a fearsome sword, long and keen-edged, like the lightning, with which it's forbidden that men should meddle in grim war, sheer terror holds warriors back from it. On the other side illustrious Hector arrayed the Trojans, now indeed war's most terrible strife was stretched out taught by dark-maned Poseidon and illustrious Hector. Bringing aid the one to the Trojans, the other to the Argives, and the sea surged up towards the huts and the ships of the Argives, and with a great shout the sides engaged. 
no wave rolling in on the shore, driven up from the deep by the north wind's fierce blast, thunders so mightily, no blazing fire in the mountains roars so loud when it leaps from a glen to burn up the forest, no wind howls so fiercely among the high crests of the oaks, even the gale that's the noisiest in its fury, as then was the roar of Achaeans and Trojans, raising a fearsome clamour in their assault, one side against the other. At Aeus illustrious Hector first let fly his spear, when Aeus was turned full towards him, he did not miss, but hit him where the two baldrics crossed on his breast, the one of his shield, the other of his silver-studded sword, and they guarded his delicate flesh. Now Hector was enraged at the swift shaft having been flighted in vain from his hand, and drew back to the ranks of his comrades. Avoiding fate. But as he backed off, great Aeus, Telamon's son, picked up a large rock, of which there were many, props of the swift ships, that rolled under the feet of the combatants as they fought, and flung it, hitting Hector high on his chest, near the neck, over his shield rim, the blow spun him round like a whip top. As when an oak struck by Zeus, the father, is laid low, uprooted, and from it there drifts the mephitic reek of brimstone, and courage drains from the man who witnesses it standing nearby, so fearsome is great Zeus's thunderbolt, thus instantly fell mighty Hector to the ground in the dust, and the spear dropped from his hand, but his shield fell with him and his helmet, while round him his inlaid bronze gear rattled. Then, shouting loudly, the Achaean sons ran up, hoping to drag him off, and letting fly their spears thick and fast, yet none of them managed to stab or shoot the people's shepherd, before that. The best men surrounded him, Aeneas. Pulidamas, and the noble Agenor, the Lycians' leader Sarpedon, the peerless Glaucos, of the rest no man failed to heed him, they all held out their round shields before him. His comrades lifted him up and carried him out of the conflict, till he reached the swift horses that were waiting for him out back, at the rear of the fighting, along with their driver and his richly wrought chariot. These bore him off to the city, heavily groaning. But when they came to the ford of the swift flowing river, eddying Xanthos, whom immortal Zeus begot, they lifted him from his chariot to the ground, poured water on him, and he revived, opened his eyes, looked up, and, kneeling, vomited up dark blood, but then sank back on the ground, and both his eyes were shrouded in black night, the missile still overwhelmed his spirit. When the Argives saw that Hector had quit the field they pressed the Trojans still harder, their minds on battle. Then, out and away the first. Swift Aeus, Oileus' son, sprang at Satnios, wounded him with his keen-edged spear, Satnios, sired on a blameless nymph, a naiad, by Enops while he was herding near the Satnios river. Him Oileus's son, famed spearman, met at close quarters, and stabbed in the flank, he fell on his back, and around him Trojans and Danans contested the grind of battle. Pulidamas, son of Panthus, spearwielder, now appeared to his rescue, and hit Prothena on the right shoulder, Aurelicosa's son, and the heavy spear drove its way through his shoulder, he fell in the dust, clawed the earth with his hand, and Pulidamas shouted loudly. In vehement exultation, ah, once again, not in vain, I think, a spear's leapt from the strong hand of Panthusa's doughty son. Some Argive has got it stuck in his flesh, and I think he'll go down to the house of Hades leaning on it as a staff. So he spoke, and his exulting brought grief to the Argives. And most of all stirred the fiery heart of Aias. Telamon's son, who was nearest the man when he fell. Quickly he let fly at Pulidamas his bright spear, as he backed off, Pulidamas escaped the black death spirit, jumping aside, but the spear struck Antinor's son, Archilochos, since the gods intended that he should perish. It caught him where head and neck meet, at the highest joint of the spine, and sheared clean through both tendons, head, mouth, and nose got to the ground much quicker than his thighs and knees as he fell. Then Aias in his turn called out in a loud voice to blameless Pulidamas, think about it, Pulidamas, and tell me truly. Isn't this man fit to die in return for Prothena? No mean fellow I find him, nor one of mean ancestry, but a brother perhaps of Antinor, breaker of horses, or a son, in appearance they're much alike. Thus he spoke, well aware of the truth, and grief struck the Trojans' hearts. Then Akamas, standing over his brother, speared Boeotian Promachos as he was dragging the body away by the feet and shouted aloud at him, in vehement exultation, you Argive Arophanciers, with your never-ending threats. There will be toil and sorrow, oh, yes, but it won't be only for us, a day will come when you two will be killed this way. Just ponder on how your Promacho sleeps, laid low by my spear, to make sure that the blood price for my brother does not go for long unpaid, which is why any man will pray that a kinsman be left in his halls, a protector against ruin. So he spoke, and his exulting brought grief to the Argives, and most of all touched Penelios's fiery heart, at Akamas he charged, 
who did not await the attack of the lordly Penelios, and instead he hit Ilioneus, the son of Flockrich Forbers, he whom Hermes loved best of all the Trojans, and endowed with much wealth, and Ilioneus was the sole son his mother bore to Forbers. Him then he struck beneath the brow, at the eye's base. Drove the eyeball out of its socket, the spear went clean through his eye and the next tendons. Arms outstretched, he sank, and then Penelios, drawing his keen-edged sword, slashed through his midneck, striking off to the ground helmet and head together, and still the heavy spear stuck firm in the eye socket. He held it aloft, displayed it like a poppy head to the Trojans, and spoke exultingly, Trojans, tell the dear father and mother of the lordly Ilioneus, from me, to begin mourning in their halls, for the wife of Elegina's son Promachos will never welcome back her dear husband with joy when we youthful Achaeans return with our ships out of the land of Troy. So he spoke, trembling seized the limbs of them all, each man glanced around, for some way that he might escape sheer ruin. Tell me now, you muses who have abodes on Olympos, who was the first Achaean to bear off the bloodstained spoils of a slain foe, once the battle was turned by the famed Earthshaker? Aias, Telamon's son, was the first, who wounded Hershios, Gershios' son. The leader of the stout hearted Mysians, Antilocho stripped off the gear of forks and murmuros. Hippotion and Morris were cut down by Meriones, and Tucros dispatched Prothoon and Periphetes, Atreus's son stabbed Hyperina, shepherd of the people, in the flank, and the bronze, shearing through, spilled out his innards, and his soul now burst through the open wound. Fled away fast, and darkness shrouded his eyes. But Aias, the swift son of Oileus, laid low the most men for there was no one to match him in the pursuit on foot of fugitive fighters when Zeus had stirred them to flight. Book 15. But when the Trojans had recrossed both stakes and ditch in their retreat, and many had fallen by Dane and hands, they came to a halt by their chariots, and remained there, pale with fear, panic-stricken, and meanwhile Zeus awoke on that topmost peak of Ida, beside here the golden throned. He sprang to his feet, and stood, and saw Trojans and Achaeans, the first in rout, and behind them, driving them on, the Argives, and there among them the Lord Poseidon. Hector too he saw, stretched out on the plain, his comrades sitting around him, his breathing painful, his mind dazed, vomiting blood, it was no weakling Achaean who'd hit him. At this sight the father of gods and men felt pity, glared furiously at here, and thus addressed her, there's no stopping you, here. It's your vile deceitful plotting that's put Hector out of the fighting and routed his troops. Well, maybe once more you'll be the first to reap the rewards of your own dangerous scheming. And I'll give you a whipping. Don't you remember that time when you were strung up aloft? And I weighted your feet with two anvils, and fastened about your wrists an unbreakable golden chain? In the upper air amid clouds you hung, and the gods throughout high Olympos raged, but stood there, unable to free you. Any I caught I'd toss down from the threshold, already half dead by the time they reached the earth. Yet not even so was my heart relieved of incessant pain over godlike Heracles, whom you, along with the north wind, whose gales you'd bought, sent on the unharvested deep, with evil intent, and then carried away to Kos, that well populated island. Him I rescued from there, and brought back once more to horse pasturing Argos, after his many travails. Need I once more remind you of this to stop your deceptions, make you see if the bed love you had with me when you came from the gods, and deceived me with, gives you any protection? So he spoke, and the ox-eyed lady here shivered, and, speaking in winged words, replied to him thus, to this let earth now bear witness. And the broad skies above, and Styx's cascading water, which is the greatest, most terrible oath for the blessed gods themselves, and your own sacred head, and the bed that we two share in wedded love, an oath that I'd never swear to falsely, not by my wishes Poseidon, the earth-shaker, bringing grief to the Trojans and Hector, and aiding their enemies. It's his own heart dictates his actions, after seeing the Achaeans in rout by their ships, and taking pity on them. But truly, even him I'd advise to go wherever you, my lord of the dark cloud, might lead the way. So she spoke, and the father of men and gods smiled, and in response with winged words now addressed her, if ever hereafter, my ox-eyed lady here, were our thoughts to agree, when sitting among the immortals, then would Poseidon, however contrary his own wishes, at once change direction, follow your heart and mine. But if you're speaking honestly, and mean what you say, go now to the gods assembled. And summon hither both Iris and Apollo, the far-famed archer. She is to visit the troops of the bronze corseleted Achaeans, and carry a message from me to the Lord Poseidon, that he must abandon warfare and go back home. Phoebos Apollos to go to Hector and urge him to fight, once more breathe power into him, make him forget the pains now afflicting his senses, and drive the Achaeans back once more, 
fill them with craven panic so that they're routed, and fall among the benched ships of Achilles, Pelis' son, who'll send out into battle his comrade Patroclos, but him will illustrious Hector slay with the spear before Ilion, though first Patroclos will kill many other young men, including my noble son. Sarpedon. Then, in his wrath for Patroclos, noble Achilles will slaughter Hector. Then I'll set up a countercharge from the ships, continuous, unremitting, until, through the counselling of Athene, the Achaeans capture steep Ilion. But till then I'm neither abating my anger, nor will I let any other immortal there give aid to the Danans until Peleus's son's desire is wholly fulfilled as I promised him at the beginning, with my nod of assent, that day when the goddess Thetis clasped my knees, and begged me to honour the sacker of cities, Achilles. So he spoke, and here, white-armed goddess, did not disobey him, but went from the mountains of Ida to lofty Olympos. Like a man who's travelled to many countries, who hurries about, reflects, how I wish I was here, or there, whose sharp mind speeds its way through a mass of desires, so rapidly in her eagerness flew the lady here, and came to lofty Olympos, where she found the immortal gods assembled in Zeus's house. On seeing her they all stood up, and lifted their cups in welcome. The rest she ignored, but accepted the cup from fair cheek the miss, for she was the first to run up and greet her. Speaking with winged words. And saying, here, why have you come here? You look quite distraught, Cronos' son, your own husband, must have scared you badly. Then the white-armed goddess here answered her thus, the miss, goddess, don't ask me, you yourself know how arrogant and unbending his temper is. Rather set out for the gods in his halls the fairly apportioned feast, and then, together with all the immortals, You'll hear Zeus announce all the vile acts his planning, in no way, I tell you, will this please the hearts of all, either mortals or gods, if indeed even now any feast with a cheerful mind. After making this speech the lady here sat down, and throughout Zeus's hall the gods were troubled. She smiled with her lips, but above the dark brows her forehead revealed no comfort, it was in anger she now spoke among them all, fools we are who so witlessly rage against Zeus, or are even hot to confront him, thwart his intentions by argument or force. He sits apart, quite indifferent. Not caring at all. For he says that among the immortal gods for power and strength is beyond all doubt the best. So each of you must put up with whatever ills he sends you, as now already, I think, grief's been fashioned for ours, since his sons perished in the fighting, no man he loves more, Ascalaphos, whom strong ours claims as his own. So she spoke. Both muscular thighs are struck with his flattened palms, and, lamenting aloud, then made this declaration, you can't blame me now, you who have homes on Olympos, if I seek the Achaean ships to avenge my son's killing, though it may be my fate to be struck by the bolt of Zeus, and to lie among other corpses in the blood and the dust. So he spoke, and commanded terror and rout to yoke his horses, while he himself put on his gleaming armour. Then would yet greater, less endurable resentment and anger have been engendered between the immortals and Zeus, had not Athene, in great fear for all the gods, hurried out through the doorway. Leaving the chair she sat on, she took our shield from his shoulders, the helmet from his head, the bronze spear from his brawny hand, and set it down, and lit into reckless ours with words of rebuke, you're mad, out of your senses, done for. Your ears listen, but uselessly, your understanding and sense of shame have perished. Didn't you hear what the goddess, white-armed here, told us, she who indeed has come straight here from Olympian Zeus? Or do you intend to get your quota of suffering, and be forced back, in great distress, to Olympos, to sow for the rest of us the seeds of great misfortune? Zeus will very soon leave the Achaeans and the high-spirited Trojans, will come to Olympos and throw us into confusion, laying hands on all alike, the innocent with the guilty. So I'm telling you now to forego your wrath for your son, since in times past there's many a stronger, more dexterous fighter has been killed. And will be hereafter, it's a difficult business to safeguard the line and the offspring of every last mortal. So saying, she made reckless Ars return to his seat. But here summoned Apollo to come outside the hall, and Iris too, the messenger of the immortal gods. And addressed them both, speaking in winged words, Zeus orders the two of you to come with all speed to Ida and when you've come, and looked on the face of Zeus, then to do whatsoever he may urge and command you. So saying, the lady here returned inside, and sat down on her chair, while the two went quickly on their way. To spring-rich Ida they came, mother of wild beasts, and found Kronos as far-seeing sun perched on the topmost peak of Gargaros, wreathed about with a fragrant cloud. They approached, and stood before Zeus the cloud-gatherer. At the sight of them he felt no wrath in his heart, since they'd quickly obeyed the instructions of his dear wife. 
To Iris first of the two he then addressed winged words, Go now, swift Iris, report to the Lord Poseidon all that I tell you. You're not to be a false messenger. My command is, he shall cease from warfare and battle, and seek the God's company, or go down to the shining sea. But if he ignores my words, or fails to obey them, let him ponder this well in his mind and in his heart, will he, strong though he is, have the will to confront my coming? I declare that I far surpass him in might, um, too, the elder by birth, yet his heart does not hesitate to rank himself equal to me, whom all others dread. So he spoke, and wind-footed swift Iris did not disregard him, but went down from the mountains of Ida to sacred Ilion, as when from the cloud snowflakes or frozen hail pelt down, impelled by the north wind's blast, that's born in the clear heavens. So swiftly did urgent Iris fly, and stood by the far-famed earth shaker, and addressed him, a message for you, O dark-maned earth encircler, I'm here to deliver, from Zeus who bears the aegis. His command is that you must cease from warfare and battle, and seek the gods' company, or go down to the shining sea. But if you ignore his words, or fail to obey them, then he threatens to come here in person, and to confront you in man-to-man -man combat, and you should stay clear of his hands. He says, since he far surpasses you in might, is, too, the elder by birth, yet your heart does not hesitate to rank yourself equal to him, whom all others dread. Then to her, much troubled, the far-famed earth-shaker responded, Look now, great though he is, he's speaking arrogantly if he means to restrain me, his equal in honour, by force, against my will. Three brothers were born to rear by Kronos, Zeus and I, the third being Hades, Lord of the Dead. All was divided three ways, each of us got his domain, I was allotted the grey sea to dwell in forever when the lots were shaken, while Hades obtained the murky darkness, and Zeus won the wide airy firmament and the clouds but the earth and lofty Olympos remain common to us all. So I will in no way walk as Zeus is minded, let him, powerful though he is, stay at ease in his own third portion, nor try to scare me with toughness. As though I were some mere weakling, better for him to threaten with violent words his own sons and daughters. Those he sired himself, will be obliged to obey him, whatever his commands. Then wind-footed swift Iris answered him, Is this really the message, O dark-maned earth encircler, that I'm to take back to Zeus? so forceful, so unyielding? Or will you concede a little? Good men's minds can be changed, and you know how the Furies always side with the Elderborn. Poseidon the Earthshaker now answered her once more, Iris, goddess, your message you delivered correctly, an excellent thing it is when the messenger knows what's right. But there's this bitter resentment comes over heart and soul whenever a person's minded to upbraid in angry terms one of like station, to whom fate's allotted an equal share. Still, for now, despite my indignation, I'll yield, but another thing I'll tell you, and I make this threat in my rage, if, in despite of me, and Athene the spoilbringer, and here, and Hermes, and Lord Hephaestos, he spares steep Ilion, and proves unwilling to lay it waste, or to concede to the Argives their great victory. Then let him know this, that between us will be bitterness without cure. So saying, the earthshaker left the Achaean forces, and plunged in the sea. The Achaean heroes missed him. Then Zeus the cloud gatherer thus addressed Apollo, Go now, dear Phoebos, in search of bronze clad Hector. Already the earth encircler and earth shaker has gone down into the shining sea, avoiding our unbridled wrath. Others too must have learned of our fight, those gods who are in the lower world with Kronos. But this way was far better, both for me and for him, that though earlier angered he still should yield to my hands, since not without sweat would this business have been settled. So do you now take in your hands the tasseled aegis, shake it at these Achaean heroes, put them to flight. For yourself, long-distance archer, let illustrious Hector be your concern, stir up great rage in him, until the Achaeans, routed, flee to their ships and the Hellespont. But from then on I myself will devise, in deed and word, how the Achaeans once more shall have respite from the toil of war. So he spoke, and Apollo did not disregard his father, but went down from the mountains of Ida like a falcon, that swift dove killer, of all winged creatures the swiftest. He found the son of wise Priam, noble Hector, no longer flat on his back, but sitting, he'd come round, recognized the comrades around him, his gasping and sweating had stopped, ever since the will of Zeus of the Aegis revived him. Apollo, far worker, standing close, now said, Hector, son of Priam, why, quite apart from the rest, are you sitting here, barely alive? Are you in some trouble? Bright-helmeted Hector asked faintly, Which of the gods are you, noble sir, who thus question me face to face? Have you not heard how, at the ship's sterns of the Achaeans, as I was killing his comrades, 
Eyes of the fine war cry hit my chest with a great rock, cut short my fighting valor? Truly. I thought that day I'd be looking upon the dead in the house of Hades. After gasping my dear life out. Lord Apollo the far worker then addressed him again, take heart now, such is the helper that the son of Kronos has sent from Ida to stand by you and protect you, Phoebus Apollo of the golden sword. As in the past I'm here to guard both you and your steep citadel. So come now, urge all your many charioteers to drive their swift horses on against the hollow ships, and I shall go forward, make the whole way smooth for the horses, and I'll turn the Achaean heroes to flight. So saying, he breathed great strength into the people's shepherd. Just as a stabled horse, that's fed well at its manger, will snap its halter and charge, hooves clattering, over the plain, since it likes to bathe in the nearest fast-flowing river, proudly, head held high, its full maness streaming out over its shoulders, as, confident in its splendor, it plies its nimble limbs towards the haunts and pastures of mares, so Hector worked feet and knees fast, while urging on his charioteers. Now that he'd heard the voice of the god, as when an antlered stag or a wild goat is pursued by country folk along with their dogs, but is saved by some high rock face or shady thicket, the hunters are out of luck, they weren't fated to catch it, and then a great bearded lion appears in their path. Roused by their shouting, turns all back, even the eager, so, for a while, the Danans kept up the chase in a body, jabbing away with their swords and double-edged spears, but when they saw Hector going to and fro in the ranks of the Trojans they panicked, their courage sank to their boots. Then there spoke up among them Thoas, Andraemon's son, father best of the Aetolians, well skilled with the javelin, a good hand-to-hand -hand fighter too, while few Achaeans outdid him at public speaking, when young warriors debated. He now with friendly intent spoke before the assembly, something truly amazing I'm now witnessing, the way he's recovered, has somehow eluded the death spirits, yes, Hector. Every man jack of us had high hopes he'd died at the hands of Aeus, Telamon's son, but once more some god or other has rescued him. Kept him alive, Hector, who's unstrung the knees of so many Danans, as I fear will happen again now. Since it can't be without loud thundering Zeus that he stands as so ardent a champion. Come then, let's all of us do what I suggest, let's order the rank and file to return to the ships, but we, all those who claim we're the cream of the army, let's stand and face him, see if we can thrust him back first, with leveled spears, I think, despite his determination, he'll be scared at heart to venture into the Danans' ranks. So he spoke, they heard him out readily, and obeyed. Those who were comrades of Aias and the Lord Idomeneus and Tucros and Meriones and Megs, ours equal, summoned the finest warriors and prepared for battle, lined up to face the Trojans and Hector, meanwhile the common troops went back to the ships of the Achaeans. Now the Trojans advanced in a body, led by Hector, taking long strides, while in front of him Phoebus Apollo, shoulders enveloped in cloud, bore the fearsome Aegis, terrible, shagger-fringed. Gleaming, the smith Hephaestos gave it to Zeus to carry. To cause panic in mortals, this Apollo had in his hands as he headed the attack. The Argives in close order awaited them, and a piercing clamor arose from both sides, while arrows leapt from the bowstring, and many spears, hurled by bold hands, lodged, some of them, in the flesh of battleswift youths, though many, before they could reach a white body, stood fixed in the earth midway, still yearning to glut themselves with flesh. Now so long as Phoebus Apollo kept the aegis still in his hands, the missiles from both sides struck home, and men kept falling. But when, looking straight at the swift horse Danans, he shook it, and gave a great shout, he cast a spell on the hearts in their breasts, they forgot their fighting valor. Just as a herd of cattle or a great flock of sheep can be stampeded in black night's darkness by a couple of wild beasts that come on them suddenly, when no herdsmen's nearby, so the Achaeans were routed. Their courage lost, for Apollo loosed panic on them. Gave the glory to Hector and the Trojans. Then man slew man once the conflict was broken open, Hector brought down Arcasileos and Stichios, the first a leader among the bronze corsleted Boeotians, the second a trusty companion of great hearted Menestheus, while Aeneas finished off Medon and Yasos. One of these, Medon, was the bastard son of godlike Oileus and Aeus's half brother, but the place where he dwelt was in Philake, far from his homeland, since he'd killed a kinsman of Eriopis, his stepmother, whom Oileus married. Yasos was a commander of the Athenians, known as Philos's son, and the grandson of Bucolos. Machistius was taken down by Pulidamas, while Poltes slew Echios in the battle's forefront, and noble Agenor laid Clonios low, and Paris stabbed Deochos as he fled with the frontline fighters, from behind, in the lower shoulder, and drove the bronze clean through. While they were stripping the gear from these men, the Achaeans. Tripped up by the stakes. 
caught in the ditch they dug, fled this way and that, were forced inside their own wall, and Hector called out to the Trojans, in a carrying voice, press on to the ships, and forget the blood-stained spoils. Any man I see going elsewhere, not making for the ships, I'll do to death on the spot, he'll not get his due share of fire as a corpse from his kinsmen or kinswomen, no, rather will dogs tear his flesh here, outside our city. So he spoke, brought the whip down hard, lashed on his horses, calling out to the Trojans along the ranks, and they all, cheering, together with him drove their horses onward, raising a fearsome clamour. Ahead of them Phoebos Apollo easily kicked down the banks of the deep ditch, heaping them into the middle, creating a causeway both long and wide, as far as a spear will fly when a man's making trial of his strength. Along this now they streamed, still in formation, with Apollo in front holding the awesome Aegis breaking down the Achaeans' wall with no trouble. In the way that a child at the seaside first builds, as children will, sandcastles, but as part of the game, with feet and hands will then knock them down again, so you, Lord Phoebos, destroyed all the long hard work of the Argives, and also panicked them into flight. So these made a halt by the ships, and held their ground, calling out one to another, then lifting up their hands to all the gods, prayed aloud, and most fervently of all Gerenian Nestor, protector of the Achaeans, prayed, stretching out his hands to the starry heavens, Zeus, Father, if ever any of us, back in weak rich Argos, burned fat thigh pieces of sheep or cattle, and prayed for a safe return, and you promised, and nodded in consent, remember that now, Olympian. Stand off our pitiless day, don't let the Achaeans be thus worsted by the Trojans. So he spoke in prayer, Zeus the counsellor thundered loudly on hearing the prayer of the old man, Nellius's son. But the Trojans, on hearing the thunder of Zeus of the Aegis, pressed the Argives still harder in their relish for battle, and as a great wave of the wide-roaming sea bears down over a ship's bulwarks, when winds at full gale force are driving it on, this really swells big breakers, so the Trojans, with loud shouts, kept coming beyond the wall. Driving their horses on, joined the fight at the ship's sterns with two-edged spears, in close combat, they fought from their chariots, and their foes who'd climbed to the decks of their black ships, wielded long naval pikes that lay there for sea battles, jointed in sections, their ends all tipped with bronze. Now Patroclos, so long as the Achaeans and the Trojans were fighting for the wall, away from the swift ships, remained sitting back in the hut of kindly Eurypylos, cheering him up with chat while on his grievous wound he spread powerful applications to ease the black agony. But when he perceived the Trojans rushing the wall, and the Danans crying out in their panicked flight, then he groaned aloud struck both thighs with the flat of his hands, and then, lamenting, uttered these words, Eurypylos, there's no way, despite your need for me, that I can remain here, a great conflict's underway. Your attendant can entertain you. But I myself am going in all haste to Achilles. To urge him into battle. Who knows? With divine assistance I may yet arouse his spirit by argument, a friend has persuasive power. So saying, he hurried away. The Achaeans stood firm, awaiting the Trojans' assault, yet proved unable to thrust them back from the ships, though they were fewer, while the Trojans never managed to break the Danaans' ranks, and so get through in among the huts and the vessels. As the chalked string marks off a straight line on a ship's timber in the hands of a skilled carpenter, who's familiar with all aspects of his high craft through Athene's promptings, so tautly and evenly was their conflict stretched between them. Some were fighting by one ship, some beside another, but Hector charged straight at famous Aias. They both were battling for possession of the same ship, but were unable, the one to dislodge the other and set the ship on fire, or the other to force him back, since a god had brought him there. Then illustrious Aya speared Kaeltor in the chest. Clitios' son, who was bringing fire to burn up the ship, and he fell with a thud, and the torch dropped from his hand. But when Hector took in the fact that it was his cousin who was down in the dust, out in front of the black ship, then he called to the Trojans and Lycians, in a carrying voice, Trojans and Lycians. You Dardanian hand-to-hand -hand fighters. Don't back off one step from the fighting on this narrow front, but rescue the son of Clitios, don't let the Achaeans strip a fallen man of his armour in this battle for the ships. So saying, he let fly his gleaming spear at Aias, him he missed, but Lycophron, master's son, Aias's henchman from Kithra, who lived with him now, after killing a man in sacred Kithra, him he struck on the head, just over the ear, with the keen-edged bronze as he stood beside Aias, he slumped from the stern of the ship on his back in the dust and his limbs were unstrung, and Aias shivered, and said to his brother, Two crows. Dear heart. A most loyal comrade of ours has been killed, yes, the son of Master, that guest from Kithra whom we honoured like our own parents during his stay in our halls, great-hearted Hector has slain him. Where, now, are your shafts of swift death, 
where's the bow that Phoebus Apollo gave you? So he spoke, two crows heard, ran up and stood beside him, grasping the backbent bow and the quiver that held his arrows. And quickly let fly at the Trojans. His first shaft struck Clato's, the splendid son of Paisinior, comrade to Puladamas, Panthusa's noble son, who, reins in hand, was occupied with his horses, driving them where the most troops were in headlong flight, to oblige the Trojans and Hector. But a disaster soon caught him that none, though wanting to, could prevent, for into the back of his neck flew the grief-laden arrow, and he fell from the driver's seat, while his horses shied aside, rattling the empty chariot. Lord Puladamas, quickly observing this, was the first to come up and stop the horses, these he gave to Astinus, Protian's son, with firm orders to keep them in check, and close, and watch him, while he himself went back to rejoin the frontline fighters. Two crows lined up another shaft against bronze-clad Hector, that would have cut short his fighting by the Achaean's ships had he hit him as he fought valiantly. Would have taken his life away, but he failed to escape the notice of sharp-minded Zeus who, guarding Hector, robbed two crows of his glory, snapping the well-twisted string of his matchless bow as he drew it, so that the shaft with its weight of bronze flew wide of its target, and the bow dropped from his hand. Then two crows shivered, and thus addressed his brother, look, our battle plans being ruined by some maleficent spirit, which struck the bow from my hand and broke the fresh-twisted bowstring I gave it this morning, to stand the force of shafts leaping out from it, thick and fast. Then great Aias, Telamon's son, made him this answer, so, brother, leave your bow and your showering arrows to lie where they are, some god with a grudge against the Achaeans has disabled them. Take a lance, put a shield on your shoulder, join the fight with the Trojans, urge on our other troops. Don't let them capture our benched ships without a struggle even though they've outfought us, let's put our minds to battle. So he spoke. Two crows stowed away his bow in the hut and over his shoulders slung a fourfold shield, and on his strong head settled a well-made helmet with horsehair crest, its plume nodding terribly above it, and picked out a solid spear, tipped with sharpened bronze, and went on his way, at the double, to stand with Aias. When Hector saw that Teucros's shafts were made useless he called out to Trojans and Lycians in a carrying voice, Trojans and Lycians. You Dardanian in hand-to-hand -hand fighters. Be men, my friends. Remember your fighting Vela here by the hollow ships, for I've seen, with my own eyes, one of their best men's weapons rendered harmless by Zeus. Easily recognized is the aid Zeus gives to men, both by those on whom he bestows the greater glory and those whom he diminishes, has no mind to assist, as now he's reducing the Argive's strength and supporting us. So close ranks, and fight by the ships, and if any man, whether shot or speared, meets his death and destiny. Let him die. No Dishner if it's in defense of one's country that he dies, his wife will be safe. And his children after him, and his house and land intact if it be that the Achaeans sail away with their ships to their own dear fatherland. So saying he stirred the strength and spirit of every man. On the other side Aias too called out to his comrades, for shame, Argives. Now it's certain, we must perish, unless we can save ourselves by removing this danger from the ships. Do you think, if bright-helmeted Hector captures our ships, you'll each of you then walk home to your native country? Can't you hear the way that Hector's firing up all his troops in his consuming passion to set the ships ablaze? It's not to a dance he's inviting them, but to battle. For us there's no better counsel or purpose than this, to grapple with them, in furious hand-to-hand -hand combat, better, once and for all, either to perish or survive than to be worn out in this grim and hopeless conflict beside the ships, by men inferior to ourselves. So saying, he encouraged each man's strength and spirit. Then Hector slew Scedios, Pyramides' son, a leader of Phocians, and Aias took down Laodamas, an infantry captain, Antinor's handsome son, while Puladamas killed a Kalenian, Otos, the comrade of Phileas' son, the great hearted Epeans' leader. Megs, on seeing this, sprang at Puladamas, who ducked away from the blow. Megs missed him, Apollo would not let Panthusa's son be vanquished among the frontline fighters but instead hit Croismo's full in the chest with his spear. He fell with a thud, Meg started stripping the gear from his shoulders, but Dollops, a highly skilled spearman, attacked him, Lampos's most warlike son, and Laomedon's grandson, a man well acquainted with fighting Vela, who now thrust his spear squarely into the shield of Phileas's son, coming at him from close quarters. But the thick and plated corslet he wore protected him, that Phileas long ago brought back out of Ephire, by the Salace River a gift from a guest friend, Euphetes, lord of men, to wear in battle, a defense against enemies, this was what now kept destruction from the flesh of his son. 
Megs took aim at Dollops' bronze horsehair plumed helmet with his sharp spear, hit its topmost plate, broke off its horsehair crest, so that the whole piece, freshly dyed scarlet, fell to the dusty ground. As Megs, holding his ground, fought Dollops, still hoping to win, Menelos the warlike came over to help him, stood with his spear, unseen, broadside on, through, from behind, and pierced Dollops' shoulder. The point tore through his chest. Driving onward, he collapsed on his face. They both rushed forward, eager to strip the bronze armor off his shoulders. But Hector called out to his kinsmen, one and all, the first to get the rough edge of his tongue was Hyktaean's son, strong Melanippos. Till lately, the foe still far off, he'd stayed to pasture his shambling cattle back at Pocote, but when the Danans came with their curved ships, then he went back to Ilion, one distinction among the Trojans, and lived with Priam, who treated him like his own son. Him now Hector upbraided in these words, are we to give up like this, Melanippos? Does your dear heart feel nothing for your slain cousin? Do you not see the way they're busily taking possession of Dollops's battle gear? So come on with me, no longer can we fight the Argives from a distance, either we must slaughter them now, or else root and branch they'll vanquish steep Ilion, slaughter her people. That said, he led on, Melanippos. Mortal but godlike. Followed, while Telamon's son, Great Aias, urged on the Argives, my friends, be men now, let shame into your hearts, feel shame before one another in this violent combat, of those who feel shame more survive than lose their lives, while runaways get no glory, win no battles. So he spoke. They themselves were hot to stand off the foe, and laid up his words in their hearts, fenced the ships about with a hedge of bronze. While Zeus roused the Trojans against them, Menelos, of the fine war cry, encouraged Antilochos, no other Achaean, Antilochos, is younger than you, or a swifter runner, or as valiant in battle, could you not spring out in front, hit a Trojan fighter? So saying, he backed off himself, but stirred up Antilochos, who emerged from the frontline troops, took aim with his bright spear, glancing quickly around. The Trojans all shrank back as he threw, not in vain was his missile cast, but struck Hyktaean's son, overconfident Melanippos. In the torso. By one nipple, as he came to the battle line, and he fell with a thud, and darkness shrouded his eyes, and Antilochos leapt upon him, like a hunting dog pinning down a wounded fawn, that some hunter aims at and hits as it darts from its den, and unstrings its limbs. Even so on you, Melanippos, did warlike Antilochos leap to strip you of your armor. But he failed to escape the notice of noble Hector, who ran through the fighting to confront him. Antilochos didn't stay put, nimble fighter though he was, but fled like a wild beast that's done something really bad, such as kill a dog or a herdsman guarding his cattle, and makes its escape before a mass pursuit gets started, so fled the son of Nestor, while the Trojans and Hector noisily showered their pain-laden missiles at him, but he turned and stood at bay when he reached his comrades. The Trojans still, like lions that devour raw flesh, kept up their assault on the ships, obeying the behests of Zeus, who constantly stirred up great fury in them, but beguiled the Argives' hearts, stole their glory, spurred on their opponents, since to Hector, Priam's son, it was that his heart longed to give the glory, to let him cast fire, consuming and weariless, on the curved ships, and thus finally to fulfill the exorbitant prayer of the Tees. What Zeus the counselor was waiting for was to see the flare of a burning ship, since at that point he'd arrange a repulse of the Trojans from the ships, and thus to the Danans now grant glory. With this end in mind, he urged Priam's son Hector on against the hollow ships, he being eager enough already, as enraged as ours the spearwielder, or like a deadly fire raging up in the mountains, in a deep woods thickets. Foam gathered round his mouth, and his eyes blazed bright under his shaggy brows. And about his temples fearsomely quivered the helmet of this embattled man. Of Hector, for from high heaven came as his helper, alone though he was among many, Zeus himself, to grant him honour and glory since he was fated to be short-lived, for already his day of doom at the hands of Pelis's violent son was being hastened by Pallas Athene. And now his aim was to break the ranks by assault, wherever he saw the most troops and the finest armour, yet not even so could he break them, enraged though he was, for they stood firm, set like a high wall, or a rocky headland, huge and sheer, that faces the grey sea, holding its own against the screaming gale's swift tracks and the swollen breakers that belch forth their might against it just so the Danans stood off the Trojans, were not routed. But Hector, a gleam like bright fire, now assailed their ranks, fell upon them, as when a wave falls on a swift ship beneath the clouds, fierce, wind-driven, and the entire vessel is hidden in foam. And the gale's wild blast comes roaring against the sail. And the mariners quake in terror, being borne along on the very edge of death, 
so too the Achaeans' courage was shredded in their breasts, for Hector assailed them like a killer lion that's found cows grazing the bottomland beside an extensive marsh, lots of them, watched by a herdsman who as yet has no idea how to fight a wild beast off from a sleek heifer's carcass, he always either keeps pace with the leading cows, or with those in the rear, but it's in the middle the lion now pounces. To devour a heifer, the rest stampede in panic. Just so the Achaeans were now stampeded by Hector and Zeus the father, all of them, even though Hector slew only Peripheets from Myconae, dear son of Coprius, who'd served as a messenger from the Lord Eurystheus to that mighty force Heracles, by him, a far meaner father, was sired a son who proved better in all kinds of excellence, speed of foot, warfare, brains, in all these he ranked with Myconae's leading men. This it was now that increased the glory he gave Hector. For as he turned back, he tripped over his own shield's rim, one that reached to his feet, a defence against javelins. On this he stumbled, fell backwards, and about his temples loud clanged the helmet as he went down. Now Hector was quick to note this, ran swiftly up beside him, planted a spear in his chest, and, so close to his own comrades, slew him. Though sad for their comrade, these could not rescue him, being themselves too scared of noble Hector. They came in among the ships, and the beam ends of those vessels first drawn up confined them, but their enemies still followed. The Argives were forced to make a further retreat from the outermost ships, but held a line by their huts all in a body, not scattering through the camp for very shame and fear. They kept calling to one another, and above all Gerenian Nestor, the Achaean's guardian, begged each man, imploring him in his parents' name, my friends, be men now. Let shame into your hearts before other men, and remember. Each one of you, your children and wives, your possessions and your parents whether for you they're living or dead. On behalf of them, far distant now, I who am here beseech you to make a strong stand, not to turn back in craven flight. So saying, he stirred up each man's strength and spirit. From their eyes Athene removed the heavenly cloud of mist, and clear light shone down on them on either side. On that of the ships, and that of levelling warfare. Thus all could see Hector, good at the war cry, and his comrades, both those holding back in the rear, not committed to battle, and all who were fighting the good fight beside the swift ships. No longer did it suffice the courageous heart of Aias to stand back where the other Achaean sons had withdrawn to. He went with great strides from deck to deck of the ships, in his hands a huge pike that was intended for sea battles, jointed in sections, and twenty-two cubits long. As a man who's an expert rider of horses harnesses four out of many together, and drives them at a smart clip from the plain towards a great city, using the public highway, with everyone marvelling at him, both men and women, while he, quite safely, and controlling all his movements, will leap from horse to horse as they gallop on, so Aias kept ranging from deck to deck of the various ships with long strides. And his voice went up to heaven as, fearsomely shouting, he kept exhorting the Danans to safeguard their ships and huts. Nor did Hector hold back among the common mass of the well coarse-leated Trojans, but as a tawny eagle will swoop down on a covey of winged fowl feeding beside the bank of a river, geese or cranes, or long-necked swans, so Hector made straight for a dark-proud ship, charging right at it, while Zeus from behind thrust him forward with one mighty hand, cheering on both Hector himself and the troops that went with him. So once more bitter fighting took place beside the ships, you'd have thought they were facing each other now in battle fresh and unwearied, so determinedly did they fight, and as they fought, these were their thoughts, the Achaeans feared they would never escape from danger, but would perish, and as for the Trojans, the heart in each man's breast hoped to fire the ships and to kill the Achaean heroes. Such were their thoughts as they stood confronting one another. Now Hector caught hold of the stern of a fine seafaring ship, swift to traverse salt water, that had carried Protesilaus to Troy, but never returned him to his own dear fatherland. It was all around his ship that Achaeans and Trojans were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand slaughter, nor did they now await volleys of arrows and javelins, but came right in, squared off at close quarters, the same thought in every mind, and battled it out with sharp axes and hatchets, large swords and double-edged spears, many fine sword blades there were, hilts bound with black cord, that found their way to the ground, some dropped from the hands, some fallen from shoulder baldricks of men. As they fought, and the black earth ran with blood. Hector, the ship's stern once grasped, would not let go of it, kept his hands on the stern post as he called out to the Trojans, bring fire here, and you all as one man raise the war cry, for Zeus has now granted us a day worth all the rest. To take the ships that came here against the gods will and have brought us much trouble. Through the cowardice of old men who, when I was ready to fight by the ship's sterns held me back, and restrained my troops. Though it may have been far-seeing Zeus who at that time addled our wits, now it's he who's urging us on, indeed, commanding us. 
so he spoke, and they redoubled their onslaughts on the Argives. Now Aias, hard pressed by missiles, stood firm no longer but backed off a little, thinking he well might die, along the seven foot crossbench, and left the trim ship's deck, and stood there, watching warily, using a spear to thrust back. Away from the ships, any Trojan who came with a flaming torch, and kept urging the Danans on, in his terrifying voice, friends. Danan heroes. You henchmen of ours. Be men, my friends. Call up your fighting courage. Do we suppose we have other helpers at our backs? Or some stronger wall, to ward off disaster from our troops? No way, and there's no close city, well fortified with towers. Where we could find allies. Turn back this assault together. Here we're stuck, here, on the well-armoured Trojans' terrain, our backs to the sea, far away from our native country, in our own hands lies our salvation, not in respite from battle. So saying, Aias, enraged, made fierce play with his keen-edged spear, any Trojan who now came charging against the hollow ships with a blazing torch, in answer to Hector's exhortations, Aias would wait for, and wound with that same long spear, and a dozen men he laid low in close combat beside the ships. Book 16. While these fought on around the well-benched vessel, Patroclus came and stood by Achilles, the people's shepherd, shedding warm tears, like a spring of black-sourced water that sends its dark stream coursing down some deserted rock face. At the sight of him swift-footed noble Achilles felt pity, and addressed himself to him, speaking with winged words, Why are you weeping? Patroclus, like a girl, a small child who runs to her mother's side and begs to be picked up, clutching at her dress delays her when she's busy, looks up at her tearfully, till she gives in and carries her. That's what you're like, Patroclos, shedding those big round tears. Have you got some news for the Myrmidons, or for me myself, or a message from Thea that you alone know about? Menoishios, Actor's son, still lives, they say, and Peleus Iacos' son, is alive there, among the Myrmidons. For those two indeed would grieve sorely if they were dead. Or is your lament for the Argives? the way they're being slaughtered by the hollow ships. On account of their own presumption? Speak up, don't keep it a secret, we both should know it. Then, horseman Patroclos, sighing heavily, you replied, Ah, Achilles, Peleus's son, for the mightiest of the Achaeans, do not be angry. Such trouble has come upon the Achaeans, for all those who were once the very best of our warriors are laid up aboard their ships either shot or speared, shot is the son of Tydeus, mighty Diams, speared are Odysseus, famed spearman, and Agamemnon, shot. Two, is Eurypylos, with an arrow through his thigh. Healers well skilled in medicaments are now busy about them, treating their wounds. But Achilles, you are so stubborn. Never may such wrath master me, as that which you cherish in your lethal valiance. How will men not yet born profit by you, if you don't keep vile ruin from the Argives? Pitiless man, your father was not Peleus the horseman, nor was that he's your mother, no, the grey sea bore you, and the towering rocks, for your mind is unchangeable. But if in your thoughts it's some prophecy you're evading, some word from Zeus passed on by your lady mother. At least send me out now, and the rest of the Myrmidon force with me, and maybe I'll prove a light to the Danans, and give me your armour, to wear on my own shoulders, so the Trojans may take me for you, back off from the fighting, let the Achaeans war like sons who are now exhausted, catch their breath, too brief is the breathing space from battle. We're fresh, not tired, we should easily drive men exhausted by battle back to the city, away from the ships and huts. Such his entreaty, the great fall, but as fate decreed, his own ghastly death and destruction it was for which he prayed. To him swift-footed Achilles, deeply troubled, then replied, Ah! Me, Zeus-born Patroclos, what's this that you've said? I'm not bothered by any prophecy that I know of, nor has my lady mother told me of any word from Zeus, but there's bitter grief invades both heart and spirit when a man decides to rob somebody who's his equal and take back his prize, just because he has the greater power. Bitter grief this to me, for I was wounded in my pride. That girl the Achaean sons had given me as an award, whom I won with my spear after sacking a well-walled city, her now has the Lord Agamemnon. Yes, Atreus's son, snatched back from my arms, as though I were some unhonoured refugee. Still, all this will let go as past and done with, no way was it in my heart to be wrathful forever, although I did declare I'd not put an end to my anger until the sounds of war and the fighting arrived at my own ships. So do you, then, array my famed armour on your shoulders, and lead out the war-loving Myrmidons into battle, if indeed the dark cloud that's the Trojans has surrounded the ships by main force, 
and the seashore with a thin strip of land is all that's left in the hands of the Argives, and the Trojans' whole city has come out in force against them. Boldly, since they don't see the light glinting off my helmet up close, soon enough they'd be routed, choking the creeks with their corpses, if only the Lord Agamemnon had been minded to treat me well, whereas now they're fighting around the camp. For not in the hands of Diams, Tydeus' son, is the spear now raging to hold off disaster from the Danans, nor as yet have I heard the voice of Atreus' son bellowing out of his loathsome head, no, it's man-killing Hector's I hear echoing round me, exhorting the Trojans, while they with their war whoops fill all the plain, as they trounce the Achaeans. Yet even so, Patroclos, to keep disaster from the ships have at them mightily, lest with their blazing torches they fire the ships and deprive us of our longed-for return. Now, follow well the instructions I shall put in your mind, so you'll win me great honour and glory from all the Danans, and they'll deliver that beautiful girl back to me. Along with more splendid gifts besides. When you've driven them from the ships, come right back here. Should here's loud thundering husband let you achieve glory, don't be too eager to go battling on without me against the war-loving Trojans, you diminish my honour. Nor should you become so exultant in warfare and fighting that, while you're killing Trojans, you press on towards Ilion, lest one of the gods eternal descends from Olympos and pitches in, Apollo the archer loves them dearly. Turn back as soon as you've set the light of deliverance among the ships, leave the others to battle it out on the plain. How much I wish, Zeus, Father, Athene, and Apollo, that not one out of all the Trojans might escape death, nor a single Argive but that only we two should not perish, and together, alone, should loosen Troy's sacred diadem. Such was their conversation, each to the other. Meanwhile Aeus no longer held firm, being hard-pressed by missiles, overcome by the will of Zeus. And the noble Trojans all letting fly at him, terribly rang the gleaming helmet about his temples as it was struck, the well-wrought cheekpieces took endless hits. His left shoulder grew weary as he held up his bright shield yet they remained unable to knock it away from him, despite their many missiles. He kept gasping painfully, the sweat poured down in rivers from all his limbs, he never was given the least chance to catch his breath, on all sides trouble was piled on trouble. Tell me now, you muses, whose homes are on Olympos, how fire first came to be flung on the Achaean ships. Hector confronted Aeus and struck his ashwood spear with his own great sword, near the socket below the tip, and sheared the tip clean away so that Aeus, Telamon's son, was left with a mere lopped shaft, while far from him the bronze spearhead clanged as it fell to the ground, and Aeus recognized, with a shudder, in his peerless heart the work of the gods, so all his battle plans had been wrecked by loud thundering Zeus, who wanted victory for the Trojans. He backed off from the missiles, the Trojans flung wearyless fire on the swift ship, at once unquenchable flames broke out. And the whole stern was set ablaze. But now Achilles struck both hands upon his thighs, and called out to Patroclos, Up with you now, Zeus-born Patroclos, master horseman. I clearly see by the ships the rush of devouring fire. Don't let them take the ships, leave us no way of escape. Arm yourself quickly, I'll muster the men. So he spoke, and Patroclos accoutred himself in the gleaming bronze. The greaves first he fastened on about his shins, finely made, and fitted with silver ankle pieces. Next, to cover his chest, he put on the corslet, fine-wrought and starry, of Iaco's swift-footed grandson. About his shoulders he slung the silver-studded sword of bronze, and next grasped the shield, both huge and sturdy. Then he set on his noble head the well-made helmet, with its horsehair crest nodding terribly above it, and picked out two strong spears, well-fitted to his grasp, but of Iaco's peerless sign the spear alone he left, massive and strong. That no other Achaean fighter could wield but only Achilles had the strength to wield it, the Pelian spear of ash wood, that Chaion had given his father, felled on Pelian's heights, to be the death of heroes. The horses he ordered Automedon to harness quickly, the man whom he honoured highest after Achilles the rank-breaker, and held as most trustworthy to await his battle orders. For him now Automedon yoked up the swift horses, Xanthos and Balios, fleet as the gale's blast, that the storm mare Podarge conceived to the west wind as she browsed in the meadows beside the stream of ocean. While in the side traces he harnessed unmatchable Pedasos, the horse that Achilles bore off when he took Aetian city. And which, though mortal, kept pace with those immortal coursers. Meanwhile Achilles went to and fro through the huts, getting the Myrmidons armed in their battle gear, like wolves that devour raw flesh, boundless fury in their hearts, and have killed a great antlered stag up in the mountains, and tear at the corpse, their jaws all reddened with blood and then go off in a pack to some blackwater spring to lap with their narrow tongues at its dark flow surface, 
belching up blood from the killing, while in their breasts the spirit is dauntless, and their bellies are glutted. So did the Myrmidons' leaders and chieftains quickly assemble around the noble henchman of Iacos's swiftfoot grandson, while there in the midst of them stood warlike Achilles, urging on both horses and shield-bearing warriors. Fifty were the swift ships that Achilles, beloved of Zeus, had brought to Troy as commander, and in each one fifty men, his companions, sat at the tholepins, five in whom he had trust he'd made captains, to issue orders, while he himself was the high commander over them all. The first squadron's captain, Menestheos, he of the bright corslet, was the son of Spacheos, Zeus's rain-fed river, whom Pelis's daughter, the beautiful Polydora, bore, to unwearying Spacheos, a woman laid by a god, though in name she conceived him by Boros, Perier's son, who openly wed her, and paid a bride price past reckoning. Of the second squadron the captain was warlike Eudoros, born, though out of wedlock, to a fine dancer, Polymele, daughter of Phylas. It was the strong Argos slayer who fell in love when he saw her among the maiden singers dancing for Artemis, she of the loud chase, the golden arrows. No waiting, Hermes the healer went up into her room, lay with her secretly, she bore him a splendid son, Eudoros, outstanding as both swift runner and warrior. But when finally Ilethia, goddess of childbirth, brought him out to the light, and he saw the sun's rays for the first time. Echiclos, actor's son, a man of might and power, took him home, having paid a bride price past reckoning, and old Phylas brought him up well, and cherished him dearly, giving him all the love he'd have given a son of his own. The captain of the third squadron was warlike Paisandros, Mimalos' son, unrivaled among all the Myrmidons in spearfighting, second only to the comrade of Pelis' son. The fourth squadron was led by Phoenix the old horseman, and the fifth by Alcimedon, Lex peerless son. Then when Achilles had mustered them all in good order, them and their captains, he spoke very harshly to them, let none of you Myrmidons be unmindful of those threats with which beside the swift ships you menace the Trojans throughout the time of my wrath, each one of you blaming me, stubborn Achilles, you cried, did your mother rear you on Gaul? Pitiless man, who hold back your comrades by the ships against their will. Let's go home, then with our seafaring vessels. Since this loathsome bile has so invaded your spirit. With such charges you'd often assail me when you all met, but now a great work of war confronts you, what you once longed for, so let each of you with a bold heart go battle the Trojans. So saying he roused the passion and spirit of every man, and their ranks drew closer together when they heard their king. As a man with close-fitting stones erects the wall of a tall house, builds to defy the fury of the winds, so closely pressed were their helmets and bossed shields, bucklers, helmets, and men packed so tight together that the horsehair crests on their helmets gleaming bosses nudged as they bent their heads, so close were the ranks, while, out in front of them all, two armed warriors stood, Automedon and Patroclos, each with the same intent, to do battle before the Myrmidons. But meanwhile Achilles went into his hut, and lifted the lid of a chest, fine, intricately wrought. That silver-footed that had stowed on his ship to go with him filled it with tunics and cloaks to keep out the wind chill, and thick woolen rugs. In it Achilles kept a fine crafted cup, from which no other man could drink the fire-bright wine, and he poured libations from it to no god but Zeus the father. This cup he took from the chest, first cleansed it with sulphur, then rinsed it off in fresh-flowing streams of water, washed his own hands, and drew the fire-bright wine. Now he stood in the forecourt and prayed, poured out the wine-gazing skyward, not unseen by Zeus who delights in thunder, Zeus, king, Pelasgian, Dodonian, distant dweller, ruler in wintry Dodona, where round you live the Seloi, with unwashed feet, your interpreters, who sleep on the ground, just as before you heard my message when I prayed, and honoured me by smiting the forces of the Achaeans, so once again for me now accomplish my desire. I myself shall remain here, where the ships are drawn up, but my comrade I'm sending out, with a body of Myrmidons, to do battle. Far-seeing Zeus, send out glory with him, make strong the heart in his breast, that Hector too may know whether my henchman skilled in the business of warfare when he's alone, or whether his hands irresistibly rage only when I myself also enter the grind of battle. And after his freed our vessels from the fight and its clamour, then unscathed let him come back to me at the swift ships with all my battle gear and my front-rank comrades. So he spoke in prayer, and Zeus the counsellor heard him. One wish the father granted, but refused him the other, that Patroclos from their ships should drive off warfare and combat he granted, but a safe return from battle he denied him. His libation made, after praying to Zeus the father Achilles returned to his hut, put away the cup in its chest, then went back outside the hut, and stood there, still determined to watch the fearsome conflict between Trojans and Achaeans.
now those armed and ready with great-hearted Patroclos marched on, till with high resolve they assailed the Trojans. All at once they came charging out like a swarm of wasps by the roadside that boys have a way of provoking to fury, constantly teasing them in their nests along the highway, as children will, creating a widespread nuisance. So that if some traveller passing by should happen to annoy them by accident. They with aggressive spirit all come buzzing out in defence of their offspring, like them in heart and spirit the Myrmidons now streamed forth from the ships, and an endless clamour arose, and Patroclos called in a carrying voice to his comrades, Myrmidons, comrades of Pelis's son Achilles, be men, my friends, bear in mind your fighting spirit, win honour for Pelis's son, father best of the Argives by the ships, he and his henchmen, all of them frontline fighters, that Atreus's. Son, wide ruling Agamemnon, may know his blind delusion in failing to honour the best of the Achaeans. So saying he stirred the strength and spirit of every man, and they fell in a pack on the Trojans, while all around them the ships echoed dauntingly to the Achaeans' war cries, and when the Trojans saw Menoetios's valiant son, himself and his henchmen, both agleam in their armour, their hearts quaked, and all their ranks were shaken, they thought the swift-footed son of Peleus. There by the ships had foregone his wrath and turned instead to alliance, and each man looked for some way to escape sheer ruin. Patroclos was the first to let fly his gleaming spear, right into the midst, where most troops were huddled together, by the stern of the ship of great-hearted Protosilaus, and he hit Pyrachmes, who'd brought his Paeonian horsemen from Amidon, close by the wide-flowing Axos river. Pyrachmes' right shoulder he hit, and he fell back in the dust, groaning aloud, and his comrades around him panicked for Patroclos by killing their leader, that outstanding fighter, spread terror throughout the ranks of all the Paeonians. Back from the ships he drove them and put out the blazing fire, leaving the ship half burnt there, while the Trojans retreated with an astonishing outcry, the Danans hot on their heels among the hollow ships, the outcry was never ending. As from the topmost peak of some lofty mountain a thick cloud is moved away by lightning gatherer Zeus. And all the heights are revealed. The towering headlands and glens, and from on high the infinite air shines clear, so the Danans, when they'd thrust off devouring fire from the ships got a short breathing space. Yet from warfare there was no respite, for not yet were the Trojans by the war like Achaeans driven in headlong rout, away from the black ships, but still fought back, even when forced to give up ground. Then, as the conflict spread widely, man slew man among the leaders, first, Menoetios's valiant son hit Aurelikos in the thigh with a cast of his sharp-edged spear just as he turned to run. The bronze was driven clean through, the spear shattered his thigh bone, he sank to the ground face downward. Menelos the warrior wounded Thoas where his shield left his torso exposed and unstrung his limbs, and Phileas's son, waiting as Amphiclos made his charge, got his own blow in first, at the top of the leg, where a man's muscle is thickest, around the point of his spear the tendons were sliced apart, darkness shrouded his eyes. One son of Nestor, Antilochos, with his sharp spear wounded Atimnios, drove the bronze point clean through his flank, and he slumped at his feet. Then Meris from close quarters faced Antilochos with his spear, enraged for his brother's sake, standing in front of the corpse, but godlike Thrasymedes moved in before he could strike, and did not miss, but hit his shoulder, the spear point stripped away the base of his arm from its muscles, shattered the bone. He fell with a thud, and darkness shrouded his eyes. So these two, laid low by two brothers, went on their way to Erebos, noble comrades, both, of Sarpedon. Spearmen sons of Amisadaros. Who reared the monstrous Chimera to bring disaster to many a mortal. Aias the son of Oileus now went for Cleobulos and took him alive, a man who tripped in the crush, then unleashed his strength, struck with his hilt sword at the man's neck, the whole blade was warmed by his blood, scarlet death and all mastering fate overpowered his eyes. Penelios and Lycan now ran at each other, they both missed with their spears, had let fly to no purpose, so now they moved in with their swords, Lycan aimed a blow at the helmet's boss with its horsehair crest, but his sword broke off near the hilt, while Penelaus struck him under his ear on the neck, the blade sheared in so deep that only the skin held firm, his head hung, his limbs went slack. Meriones, striding quickly, now overtook Akamas as he mounted his chariot, scored a hit on his right shoulder. He slumped from the chariot, a mist obscured his eyes. Idomeneus speared Eremus with his pitiless bronze in the mouth, the bronze point sheared clean through beneath the brain. Split the white bones apart, shook his teeth loose, while both his eyes were flooded with blood, and, as he gaped, from his mouth and nostrils blood spurted, and death's black cloud enshrouded him. So these Danan leaders each of them slew his man, and as wolves attack lambs or kids in their ravening hunger, picking them off from the flocks, 
when through their shepherd's carelessness they are scattered up in the hills, and the wolves, seeing this, promptly snatch the timorous young ones. Just so did the Danans fall on the Trojans, who then sought refuge in ill-famed flight, forgot their fighting spirit. Great Aeus as always was eager to let fly a spear at bronze panoplied Hector, who, highly skilled in warfare, broad shoulders protected by his bull's hide shield, kept alert for the whir of arrows, the thud of spears, though he recognized that the tide of victory was turning, even so he remained, did his best to save his loyal comrades. As from Olympos a cloud comes into the heavens from the bright upper air. When Zeus deploys a tempest, so from the ships came the sound of cheers and panic as the Trojans, disordered, recrossed the ditch. Now Hector was carried out, with his gear, by his fast horses, left the Trojan troops behind, to be stopped, frustrated, by the Greek dug ditch, in which many swift horses broke their pole at the end, abandoned their master's chariots. Patroclos, hot in pursuit, called urgently on the Danans, planning ills for the Trojans, who, shouting and panic-stricken, choked all the ways, broken-ranked, while high in the air a dust storm formed under the clouds, and the whole-hoofed horses strained hard back to the city from the ships and huts. Wherever Patroclos saw men huddled the thickest, there he drove, shouting, beneath his axles new victims kept slumping down from their chariots, that then overturned, and right over the trench his swift horses, those immortal steeds that the gods gave to Peleus, glorious gifts. Pressed eagerly forward, his heart now urged him against Hector. Hot to attack, but Hector's own swift horses saved him. As under a storm cloud the whole black earth's weighed down at harvest time, when rainfall from Zeus is torrential, as he, enraged, takes punitive measures against those men who in the assembly enforce their crookback judgments and drive justice out, indifferent to the scrutiny of the gods, and all their swollen rivers are overflooded, and many a hillside scored deeply by the plunging torrents that roar headlong down from the mountains into the dark sea and men's tilled fields are ruined, so loud and grieving was the neighing of those Trojan mares as they sped on their way. When Patroclos had cut off the front ranks from their retreat he herded them back to the ships, would not let them go on to the city, much though they longed to, but in between the ships, the high wall, and the river he ranged amongst them killing, exacting requital for the deaths of many. Here he hit Pronus first with his gleaming spear, in the chest, left exposed by the shield, and unstrung his limbs, he fell with a thud. Next Patroclos charged at the Rista, Inops's son, who crouched there in his polished chariot, out of his mind with terror, while from his hands the reins slipped away. Patroclos closed in with his spear, rammed the right side of his jaw, drove the spear through his teeth, dragged him over the chariot's rim, like a man who, perched on a jutting rock, reels in a sacred fish from the deep on his line and bright bronze hook, just so from the chariot on his bright spear he hauled in the gaping pronus, dumped him face downwards. He dropped, and life fled from him. Next Erilaus, charging at him, he hit with a rock square on the head, which split completely in two inside his heavy helmet. He collapsed on the ground face foremost, and death, the spirit queller, embraced him. Amphiteros next, Eremus and Apoltes, Tlepolemos son of Damaestia, then Echios, Pyrrhus, and Iphias, as well as Euippos, and Argeas' son Polymelos, all these in turn he laid low on the nurturing earth. When Sarpedon saw his comrades of the unbelted tunics being felled at the hands of Menoetios's son Patroclos, he cried out, addressing his words to the godlike Lycians, Shame on you, Lycians! Where are you fleeing? Be keen now! I myself shall confront this fellow, so I may learn just who he is that's unmatched here, who's inflicted such hurt on the Trojans, who's unstrung so many fine men's limbs. So saying, he sprang, armed, from his chariot to the ground, and Patroclos on the other side, seeing him, sprang down too, and as two vultures, with hooked beaks and crooked talons, fight, screaming loudly, up on some lofty rock, so these two, shouting, charged the one at the other. When he saw them, the son of Cronos, that devious schemer, felt pity, and said to hear, his sister and wife, woe is me, that it's fate for Sarpedon, my best-loved mortal, to be laid low by Patroclos, the son of Menoetios. My heart is divided two ways as I debate the matter, shall I snatch him up while he lives still, and then set him down, far from this grievous warfare, in Lycia's rich terrain? Or shall I let him be vanquished by Patroclos, Menoetios's son? Then the ox-eyed lady here replied to him, saying, Most dread son of Cronos, what's this that you're telling me? Here's a man, a mortal, his fate long since determined, are you minded to free such a one from sorrowful death? Then do it, but we other gods will not all approve. One other thing I will tell you, and you should take it to heart, if you send back Sarpedon alive to his own abode, think of this, 
that hereafter some other god may be minded to send his own dear son away from the grind of battle, for fighting round Priam's great city there now are many sons of immortals, in whom you'll cause serious resentment. But if he's so dear to you, and you're grieved at heart, then let him be vanquished in the grind of battle at the hands of Patroclos, the son of Menoitios, and when the soul and life have departed from his body. Send death and soothing sleep to convey him away till they reach the land of broad Lycia. And there his brothers and kinsfolk will give him due funeral rites with burial mound and gravestone, a dead man's entitlement. So she spoke. At this the father of gods and men did not ignore her, but showered bloody raindrops on the earth in honour of his dear son, whom Patroclos was very soon to kill off in rich soil Troy, far away from his own country. Now when? Advancing, they finally joined battle, then it was that Patroclos hit illustrious Thrasymelos, the valiant henchman of the Lord Sarpedon, him he speared in the nether belly, unstrung his limbs. Sarpedon, letting fly next with his gleaming spear, missed the man himself, but speared the horse Pedasos in its right shoulder. It screamed, gasped out its spirit, dropped neighing into the dust, and the breath of life fled from it. The other two pulled apart, the yoke creaked, and the reins were tangled, now that the trace horse lay there in the dust. But for this the famed spearman Automedon found an answer. Unsheathing the long sword from beside his sturdy thigh he jumped down and cut free the trace horse, wasted no time, and the other two were thus righted, strained at the reins, while the two fighters got back together in heart-devouring strife. Then once more Sarpedon missed with his gleaming spear, and over Patroclos's left shoulder the spear point flew. Not hitting him. And Patroclos in turn made play with the bronze, and not vainly did the shaft fly from his hand, but struck at the point where the lungs enclosed the solid heart, and Sarpedon fell like an oak tree or a white poplar, or a tall pine that up in the mountain's shipwrights fell with their newly sharpened axes to serve as a ship timber, so there in front of his horses and chariot he lay stretched out, bellowing, hands clutching the bloody dust. As a lion that comes on a herd will slaughter a bull, tawny, great-hearted, in among the shambling cattle, and it perishes, bellowing still, in the jaws of the lion, so now, laid low by Patroclos, the Lycian spearman's leader, dying, still struggled, and called his comrade by name, dear Glaucos, warrior among men, today there's urgent need for you to be both spearman and dauntless warrior too, if you're ready, let violent warfare be your choice. First, you must urge on the Lycian's warrior leaders, checking them all to fight for Sarpedon's body. Then join them, and battle in my defence with the bronze, for even in time to come I'll be a reproach and a cause of disgrace to you all your days, unendingly, should the Achaeans strip my gear from my fallen body by the drawn-up ships. Now hold the line bravely, and urge on all our troops. As he spoke thus death's conclusion enshrouded him, his eyes and his nostrils. Patroclos set one foot on his chest, and tugged the spear from his flesh. The lungs followed with it. Sarpedon's soul and the spear point he drew out together, as the Myrmidons reigned in the snorting horses that now, freed from their master's chariot, wanted only to escape. Terrible grief seized Glaucos as he heard Sarpedon's voice, and his heart was wrung, since he'd not been able to help him. With one hand he gripped and pressed his arm, for the wound vexed him, that Tucros had dealt him with an arrow, in support of his own comrades, as Glaucos charged the high wall. Now he addressed in prayer Apollo. The deadly archer, Hear me, Lord, you who may be in Lycia's rich terrain or perhaps here in Troy, wherever you are, you are able to listen to men in trouble, just as troubles come on me now, for I have this serious wound, and my arms shot through with sharp cutting pains, nor can the flow of blood be stanched, and my shoulders are dead weight because of it. I can't hold my spear in place, or join the battle against our enemies, while our best fighter has perished, Sarpedon, son of Zeus, who won't even save his own flesh and blood. But do you, Lord, now at least heal this serious wound of mine, lull my pains to sleep, and give me the strength to exhort my Lycian comrades to keep up the fight, and myself to join the battle for Sarpedon's body. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him. The pains the god stopped at once, dried up the black blood that flowed from his hurtful wound, put strength in his heart. Glaucos knew what had happened. Rejoiced in silence that the great god had listened. And answered his prayer so soon. First he urged on the Lycian's warrior leaders, checking them all, to fight for Sarpedon's body, then he made his way, taking long strides, to the Trojans. To Puladamas, Panthus's son, and noble Agenor, and sought out Aeneas and the bronze panoplied Hector, whom he now went up to, and addressed with winged words, Hector, it's plain you've completely forgotten your allies, who on your account, far distant from friends and country are wasting their lives away, yet you will not help them. Sarpedon lies dead now, the Lycian spearman's leader, whose judgments and strength were Lycia's protection, 
him Brazenars has vanquished through Patroclus' spear. My friends, stand beside him now, think shame to hold back, lest he be stripped of his arms and his corpse maltreated by the Myrmidons, angered at all the Danan deaths, those whom we killed with our spears at the swift ships. So he spoke, and the Trojans were possessed from head to foot by grief, uncontrollable, unendurable, for Sarpedon had been their city's prop, though a foreigner, since numerous troops came with him, and he himself was a champion warrior. They made straight for the Danans. Fiercely, their leader Hector enraged for Sarpedon's sake. The Achaeans were urged on by the shaggy heart of Patroclos, Menoitios's son. First he addressed both Iases, already hot for the fray, you two needs must be keen to defend yourselves, as brave as you were in time past among fighters, or even braver. The man who first got beyond the wall of the Achaeans, Sarpedon, is lying there dead, let's grab him, disfigure his corpse, strip the battle gear from his shoulders, with the ruthless bronze dispatch any comrade of his who tries to defend him. So he spoke, and they themselves were raging to attack. Then, when on both sides they'd reinforced their ranks, Trojans and Lycians, Myrmidons and Achaeans, they clashed in battle over Sarpedon's corpse, with terrible shouts, and their battered armour rang loud, and Zeus spread deadly darkness over the grinding conflict, to match the deadly war work centred on his dear son. At first the Trojans forced the sharp-eyed Achaeans back. For a man by no means the worst of the Myrmidons was stricken, the son of great-hearted Agacles, noble Epagius, who'd formerly ruled as king in well-populated Budion, but at this time, after he'd killed a noble kinsman, came as a suppliant to Peleus and silver-footed the Tees, and they sent him to serve with Achilles, the breaker of ranks, at Ilion, rich in foals, as a fighter against the Trojans. Him, as he grabbed at the corpse, illustrious Hector struck, with a rock, on the head, which split completely in two inside his heavy helmet, he collapsed on the body face foremost, and death, the spirit queller, embraced him. Then over Patroclos came grief for his slaughtered comrade, and he charged through the front ranks like a speedy hawk in pursuit of fleeing jackdaws and starlings, even so, Patroclos, driver of horses, straight for the Lycians and the Trojans did you charge, in your wrath for your comrade. Sthenelaus too he struck, dear son of Ithamines. On the neck with a rock. And tore away the tendons. Frontline fighters gave ground, illustrious Hector with them, as far as is the flight of a good long hunting spear thrown by a man making trial of his strength in sport, or even in war, when hard pressed by murderous foemen, so far did the Trojans retreat, and the Achaeans drove them. Glaucos, the Lycian spearman's commander, was the first to turn around, and he slew high-spirited Bathicles, Chalcon's dear son, who made his home in Hellas, and ranked high among Myrmidons for wealth and prosperity. Him Glaucos struck full on the chest with his spear, turning suddenly on him when about to be overtaken, and he fell with a thud, and thick grief now seized the Achaeans, since a good man had fallen, while the Trojans, with loud cheers, closed and crowded round them. Yet the Achaeans did not forget their fighting spirit, but pitted their strength against them. Merion's next took down a helmeted Trojan fighter, Laogonos. Wanta's bold son, a priest of Idrian Zeus, who was honoured by his people like a god. Him he struck under the jaw and ear, at once the breath of life fled his limbs, and loathsome darkness seized him. Aeneas then let fly his bronze spear at Meriones, hoping to hit him as he advanced behind his shield, but Meriones was watching, and avoided the bronze spear by ducking down forward, so that its long shaft stuck in the ground behind him, its but end quivering, and their mighty ours took its power away from it. And Aeneas's shaft ended quivering, point first, deep in the ground, flung in vain from his sturdy hand. At this Aeneas was angered, and spoke to him, saying, Soon enough, Meriones, dancer though you are, my spear would have stopped you forever, had I but hit you. Meriones, famed spearman, made him this answer, Aeneas, it's hard for you, however strong you may be. To quench the strength of every man who confronts you in his own defence, you two were born a mortal. Should I aim and hit you squarely with my sharp bronze? Soon enough, strong though you are, with trust in your hands, you'd give glory to me, and your soul to horse-proud Hades. So he spoke, but Menoitios's valiant son rebuked him, Meriones, you're a good man, why carry on like this? Look, friend, insulting words are not what will make the Trojans back off from the corpse, that would take killing most of us. War's outcome rests in our hands, talk's place is the council. No point in endless words, what we need is to fight. So saying, he led the way, and the other, mortal but godlike, followed, and from the armies, like the din made by woodcutters at work in some mountain clearing, audible far away, there went up off the wide wade earth the thud and clatter of bronze and oxide and cleverly fashioned shields, 
as they thrust at each other with swords and two-edged spears, and no longer could any man, though he knew him well, have recognized noble Sarpedon, now covered with blood and dust and missiles. From his head to the soles of his feet. Men crowded around the corpse the way that flies in a farmyard buzz round the brimming pails of milk in springtime, when the milk spurts down into the buckets, just so they kept crowding around the corpse. Nor did Zeus ever turn his sharp gaze away from the grind of battle, but watched them closely, debating a problem in his mind. Uncertain regarding the matter of killing Patroclos, was illustrious Hector right now, in the grind of battle over godlike Sarpedon, to slay him too with the bronze, and strip the gear off his shoulders, or rather should he, Zeus, prolong the sheer labour of fighting for yet more men. And as he debated, this struck him as being the better way, that the excellent henchman of Pelias's son Achilles should once more drive the Trojans and bronze-clad Hector back to the city, and take the breath of life from many. In Hector first he aroused craven panic, Hector boarded his chariot, turned to flight, and called upon the rest of the Trojans to flee. Having seen Zeus's sacred scales in action. Nor did the brave Lycians stand fast, but panicked to a man when they saw their king laid low, pierced through the heart, lying in a heap of corpses, for many had fallen on him since Cronos's son stretched taut the cords of powerful strife. They stripped from Sarpedon's shoulders the gleaming armor of bronze, which Menoitios's valiant son now gave to his comrades to carry back to the hollow ships. Then Zeus the cloud-gatherer thus addressed Apollo, Go now, dear Phoebos, and wipe the dark clotted blood from Sarpedon, first get him clear of the missiles, then take him far off, find a river, wash him clean in its flowing waters, spread ambrosia on him, have him clothed in immortal raiment, then give him to fast-moving escorts, to carry him away. Sleep and death, twin brothers, will lose no time, but speedily set him down in broad Lysha's rich terrain. There his brother and kinsfolk will give him due funeral rites with burial mound and gravestone. A dead man's entitlement. So he spoke, and Apollo did not disregard his father, but went down from the heights of Ida to the grim battlefield, and at once raised noble Sarpedon, got him clear of the missiles, took him far off, found a river. Washed him clean in its flowing waters, spread ambrosia on him, had him clothed in immortal raiment, then gave him to fast-moving escorts, to carry away, sleep and death, twin brothers, they lost no time, but speedily set him down in broad Lysha's rich terrain. Patroclos now commanded Automedon as driver to keep chasing the Trojans and Lycians, being blindly deluded, the fool, since had he followed the advice of Pelias's son he'd surely have kept well clear of Black Death's foul spirits. But the mind of Zeus is always more potent than that of men, turns even a hero cowardly, steals victory from him, easily, too, and as easily stirs up a man to fight. He it was now who put spirit in Patroclos's breast. So whom did you slaughter first, and whom last, Patroclos, when the gods thus summoned you death ward? First of all was Adrestos, and then Autonus, Echiclos, Pyramos son of Megas, Epista, followed by Melanippos, Elasos next, and Mulios. And Pilates, these he killed. And the rest of them then chose flight, every last man of them. Then the Achaean sons would have taken high-gated Troy through Patroclos's hands, so widely he raged with his spear, had Phoebos Apollo not stood on the well-built ramparts with death in mind for him, while aiding the Trojans. Three times Patroclos climbed up the lofty wall's elbow bend, and three times Apollo violently beat him back, thrusting against the bright shield with his immortal hands. But when for the fourth time he came on like a god, in a terrible voice Apollo addressed him with winged words, Withdraw, Patroclos, scion of Zeus. It's not fated that the lordly Trojan city should be laid waste by your spear, nor by that of Achilles, a far better man than you. So he spoke, and Patroclos backed off a healthy distance, to avoid the wrath of Apollo, the deadly archer. At the Scurrian gates Hector reigned in his whole-hoofed horses, in two minds, should he drive them back to the tumult and fight? Or should he recall his forces? Regroup inside the wall? As he pondered thus, Phoebos Apollo approached him in the form of a man both vigorous and strong, Aetios, who was uncle to Hector the horsebreaker and Hecabe's brother, but the son of Dimas, who dwelt in Phrygia near the Sangarios river. In his likeness now Apollo, the son of Zeus, addressed him, Hector, why have you quit the fight? You must not. If I were stronger than you, as much as I'm really weaker, it'd be to your instant hurt that you'd hold back from the battle. Come on, now. Set at Patroclos your strong-hoofed horses. You might kill him, and then win glory from Apollo. So he spoke, and went back, a god to the struggle of mortals, and to warlike Kebrion's illustrious Hector gave the word to whip on his horses to battle. Meanwhile Apollo had made his way to the troops, loose dangerous confusion on the Argives, 
thus giving glory to the Trojans and Hector. Other Danaans Hector ignored, made no effort to slay them. But set his strong-hoofed horses at Patroclos alone, and Patroclos over against him sprang down from his chariot. A spear in his left hand, while the other grasped a rock, jagged and glinting, his hand enclosed it. With all his weight behind it he threw. The missile did not fall short, he did not throw in vain, but hit Hector's charioteer, Kebriones, a bastard of glorious Priams, now holding the reins, in his forehead with the sharp rock, it crushed both eyebrows together, the bone did not hold firm, both eyeballs bolted out, dropped to the ground in the dust right in front of his feet, and he, like a diver, fell from the well-built chariot. The breath of life left his bones. Then mockingly you addressed him, horseman Patroclos, oh ho, such a nimble fellow, such an effortless tumbler. I'm sure if he were out there on the fish breeding deep this fellow would catch enough sea squirts to feed a multitude, diving in from his ship, even when it's bad weather. So lightly he somersaults now from his chariot on the plain. It would seem that even the Trojans have their share of acrobats. So saying, he went after Kebriones the hero with the pounce of a lion that, while ravaging a farmstead, is hit in the chest and thus it's its own courage that destroys it, just so at Kebriones, Patroclos, you sprang in your fury, while on the other side Hector jumped down from his chariot, and they fought over Kebriones like a pair of lions that high up in the mountains over a slain hind. Both ravenous, both determined, battle it out. Just so for Kebriones these two veterans of the war cry, Patroclos son of Menoitios and illustrious Hector, long to cut up each other's flesh with the pitiless bronze. Hector seized the corpse by the head, and would not let go, while Patroclos on the other side clung to a foot, and round them Trojans and Danaans contested the grind of battle. As the east and south winds compete the one with the other at shaking some deep wood in a mountain clearing, a wood of beech and ash and smooth-barked cornel, their long boughs grinding together with an amazing racket, along with a crackle of snapping branches, so the Achaeans and Trojans now went for one another, killers all. Neither side had deadly rout in mind, and all round Kebriones many sharp-edged spears were planted, and flighted arrows that had leapt from the bowstring. And many large rocks that shattered against the shields of the men fighting over him, but amid the swirling dust great in his greatness he lay. His horsemanship forgotten. As long as the sun still straddled the midpoint of the sky, both sides shot struck home, and men dropped, hit. But when the sun declined to the point at which oxen are unyoked, then it was the Achaeans proved stronger, beyond what was destined. The hero Kebriones, they pulled out of the range of missiles, away from the Trojans war cries, stripped the gear from his shoulders, and Patroclos with deadly intent now went after the Trojans. Three times he charged them, the equal of swift R's, shouting terribly, three times he slew nine men. But when for the fourth time he came on like a god, then for you, Patroclos, the end of your life showed clear. For Phoebos confronted you in the grind of battle, dread god, yet Patroclos missed him coming through the turmoil, for he was wrapped in a thick mist when they met. Standing behind him, Apollo slammed his back and broad shoulders with the flat of one hand. His eyes turned in his head, from which now Phoebos Apollo struck off the helmet, and it rolled away, clattering, under the horse's hoof's crest, visor, and all, its horsehair plumes besmirched with blood and dust. Never till then had the gods allowed that crested helmet to be besmirched with dust, when it guarded the head and fine brow of a godlike man, Achilles, but now Zeus made a present of it to Hector to wear on his head, though his own doom was very near. In Patroclos's hands the far-shadowing spear, so huge, so solid, bronze-tipped, was all broken, and from his shoulders the fringed shield with its baldric fell to the ground, and his corslet the son of Zeus, Lord Apollo, now undid. Delusion clouded his mind, his bright limbs were unstrung, he stood in a daze, and was struck from behind, at close range, midway between the shoulders, with a sharp-edged spear, by Euphorbos, Panthus's son, a Dardanian, who excelled all those of his age as a spearman and horseman. And at running, twenty men by now he dislodged from driving their horses since he first arrived with his chariot. Still a novice at warfare. He it was first threw his spear at you, horseman Patroclos, yet did not kill you but pulled his ash spear from your flesh and ran back into the ranks, did not stay there to face Patroclos, even unarmed, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, while Patroclos too, overcome by the god's blow and the spear, turned back towards the ranks of his comrades, avoiding fate. But Hector, when he perceived great-hearted Patroclos backing off, after taking a hit from the sharp-edged bronze, came up close to him through the ranks, and with his spear stabbed into his nether belly, driving the bronze clean through, and he fell with a thud, greatly grieving the troops of the Achaeans. As a lion brings down an unwearying boar in battle, 
when the two of them up in the mountains battle with high resolve for a small spring from which both are determined to drink, and the boar pants hard, but the lion's might prevails, from Menoishios's valiant son. When he'd killed so many. Priam's son Hector now took the life with his spear, close up, and, boastfully, over him spoke winged words, Patroclos, you imagined you were going to sack our city, and take the day of freedom from the women of Troy. And carry them off in your ships to your dear fatherland. You fool. It was for their protection Hector's swift horses galloped out to battle, and with the spear I myself, outstanding among warlike Trojans, I'm here to ward off the day of doom from them, but you the vultures will eat here, you wretch. And brave though he is, Achilles couldn't save you, he stayed behind, but I'm sure he gave you marching orders, don't you come back to me, Patroclos, master horseman, at the hollow ships, before you've sliced up the tunic of Hector, killer of men, round his chest, left it bloody. That's how, I fancy, he spoke to you, thus persuading your mind in its mindlessness. Then, strength ebbing, you answered him, horseman Patroclos, go on, boast big while you can. You were handed this triumph by Apollo and Zeus, son of Cronos, who overwhelmed me easily, they themselves removed the gear from my shoulders. If twenty men such as you had confronted me, all would have perished here. Quelled by my spear. Oh no, it was deadly fate and the son of Leto that slew me, and of mortals you forebows, you're only the third hand in my killing. And another thing I'll tell you, and you lay it to heart, you yourself are not for a long life, now already death's moved in close beside you, you're all mastering fate to be slain at the hands of Achilles, Iacos' peerless grandson. When he'd spoken thus, death's end enshrouded him, and the soul fled from his limbs, fluttered down to Hades bewailing its fate, youth and manhood all abandoned. Yet still Hector harangued him, dead though he was, Patroclos, why do you prophesy sheer destruction for me? Who knows if perhaps Achilles, fair-haired Thetis' son, may, struck by my spear, lose his life before that happens. So saying, he tugged out his bronze spear from the wound, with one foot on Patroclos' chest, eased him backward off the spear. Then he and his spear were gone, pursuing Automedon. The godlike henchman of Iacos' swift-footed grandson. Very zealous to hit him, but him the swift horses carried away, immortal steeds, that the gods gave to Peleus, glorious gifts. Book 17. It did not escape Atreus's son, the warlike Menelaus, that Patroclos had been brought down in the struggle with the Trojans. Through the front ranks he went, armoured in gleaming bronze, and stood there, straddling his corpse, as over her firstborn calf its mother stands lowing, plaintively, having never given birth before. So over Patroclo's fair-haired Menelaus stood, holding before him his spear and well-balanced shield, ready to kill any fighter that came out and confronted him. Nor was Panthus's son, of the Goodash spear, indifferent to the fall of peerless Patroclo's, he came and stood near warlike Menelaus, and thus addressed him, Atreus's son Menelaus, Zeus's nursling, leader of armies, yield ground now, leave the corpse, forego these blood-stained spoils. No man prior to me of the Trojans or their famed allies put a spear in Patroclos during the grind of battle, so you now allow me to win true glory among the Trojans, or else I'll let fly and hit you. Rob you of honey-sweet life. Deeply stirred, fair-haired Menelaus answered him thus, Zeus, father, such over-proud boasting is most unseemly. Of neither lion nor leopard is the rage so great, nor of the deadly wild boar, in whose breast the greatest fury exults in its strength as is the arrogant spirit of Panthusa's sons, they of the good ash spear. Not even Hyperina, the mighty one, the tamer of horses, had any joy of his youth, when he mocked and confronted me, called me the feeblest warrior among the Danans, not on his own feet, I tell you, did he make his way back home to gladden his dear wife and his devoted parents. Just so will I unstring your strength, if you persist in standing against me, back off, I tell you, into the crowd. Don't try confrontation, get out before you suffer some hurt, what's done even a fool can recognize. So he spoke, but did not persuade him, Euphorbos replied, now indeed, Menelaus, Zeus's nursling. You'll pay the price for the brother of mine you killed, you rant boastfully over him. His wife you left a widow in her new bridal chamber, unspeakable grief and sorrow you brought on his parents. Surely for them in their misery I could be an easing of grief if I bring them your head and your armor. Lay these in the hands of Panthus and of noble Frontis. No longer shall this struggle between us go untested or unfought, whether it end in victory or in flight. That said, Euphorbos struck Menelaus's well balanced shield, but the bronze failed to break through, its point was turned by the strong shield. Then Atreus's son Menelaus in his turn attacked with the bronze, praying to Zeus the father, and as Euphorbos drew back, 
speared him hard at the base of his throat, leaning into the thrust, relying on his strong fist, and clean through his delicate neck the spear point passed. He fell with a thud, and his armor rattled upon him. Blood soaked his hair that was such as the graces have, those locks wasp wasted with spirals of gold and silver. As a man cultivates an olive tree's flourishing slip in a lonely spot, where spring water wells up in abundance, a fine, healthy sapling, and breezes from every quarter make it shiver, and soon it bursts out in white blossom, but then a sudden gale comes, with abundance of storm winds, tears it up root and all and lays it out flat on the ground, in such wise Panthusa's son, the ashen-speared Euphorbos, was slain by Atreus's son Menelos, stripped of his armor. As some mountain-bred lion, confident in its strength, from a grazing herd snatches a cow, the best one there, when he's caught her. He first breaks her neck with his powerful teeth, then gulps down her blood, along with all her innards, tearing her flesh, while all round him hunting dogs and herdsmen make much noise, but from a distance, not being minded to confront him, for pale fear has them in its grip, just so the heart in the breast of no Trojan dared to come out and confront. Illustrious Menelos. Easily, then. Would the famed arms of Euphorbos have been borne off by Atreus's son? Had not Phoebos Apollo, in a man's likeness, as Mentes, the Ciconian's leader, begrudging this, stirred against him Hector, peer of swift Rs, whom he addressed as follows, in winged words, Hector, while you're vainly chasing a quarry you'll never catch. The horses of Iacos's warrior grandson, hard are they for any mortal to master or to drive, save only Achilles, who had an immortal mother, meanwhile Menelos, the warlike son of Atreus, straddling Patroclos's corpse has slain the best of the Trojans, Panthus's son Euphorbos, cut short his fighting spirit. So he spoke, and went back, a god to the struggle of mortals. Bitter grief now spread round Hector's dark spirit, he glanced along the ranks, and at once perceived both men, the one stripping off the famed armour, the other one lying there, blood trickling out of the stab wound. Then Hector gave a sharp cry, strode out through the foremost fighters, armed in gleaming bronze, like Hephaestos's unquenchable flame. Nor did Atreus's son miss that sharp cry, deeply perturbed he now communed with his own great-hearted spirit, Ah, me, if I leave that fine armour behind, and Patroclos too, who lies here dead in his quest to restore my honour. Any Danan who sees it, I fear, will blame my action. But if, single-handed, I take on Hector and the Trojans out of shame, I fear they'll surround me, being many against one, bright-helmeted Hector's bringing every last Trojan here. Yet why should my heart and I be debating any of this? When, against heaven's will, a man chooses to fight with a mortal whom some god honours, at once great trouble rolls over him. So, no Danan will be indignant on seeing me retreat before Hector, since his fighting with a god as his backer. Yet, if I could only find Ias of the fine war cry, then we too might turn back and battle it out, even against divine will, in the hope of rescuing the corpse for Achilles, Peleus' son, that would be the best of evils. Meanwhile, as he was pondering thus in his mind and spirit, the Trojan ranks advanced, with Hector leading them. Menelos began to retreat now, abandoning the corpse, but constantly looking back. Like a bearded lion that dogs and men are chasing away from the cattle pen with spears and shouting. The bold spirit in his breast is chilled, and reluctantly he slinks off from the farmstead, so fair-haired Menelos moved away from Patroclos. But on reaching his comrade's division he stood there, looking round, attempting to find great Aias, Telamon's son, and quickly located him, at the far left side of the battle, encouraging his companions, urging them on to fight, because of the awesome fear put in them by Phoebos Apollo. He set off at a run, reached him quickly, addressed him thus, Aias my friend, come with me, we must hurry to save dead Patroclos, at least let's rescue his body for Achilles, his naked body, his armor bright helmeted Hector holds. So speaking he roused the spirit of warlike Aias, through the frontline fighters he strode, Menelos with him. Now Hector had stripped Patroclos of his famed battle gear, and was dragging him off to cut his head from his shoulders with the sharp bronze, and leave his body for Trojan dogs, but up came Aias. Behind his towering shield. And Hector retreated into the body of his comrades, boarded his chariot, turned the famed armor over for the Trojans to take to the city, to bring him great glory. But Aias with his broad shield covered Menoishios' son, and stood there like a lion protecting its young, one that hunters meet as it leads these cubs in the forest, and it bears itself proudly, glorying in its strength, hooding its eyes with the downdrawn skin of its brow, just so did Aias bestride the hero Patroclos, while on the other side Atreus' son, the warlike Menelos, stood there, nursing great sorrow within his breast. 
And now Glaucos, son of Hippolochos, the Lycian warrior's leader, scowling darkly at Hector, upbraided him with harsh words, Hector, so handsome, but sadly wanting in battle, this fine reputation of yours conceals a girlish coward. You'd better start thinking now of some way to save your city and citadel on your own, helped only by native Trojans. For at least of the Lycians not one man will turn out to fight the Danans over this city. Since I now see there's no thanks for struggling, without respite. Forever against the foe. How would you rescue a lesser fighter, one of the crowd, you callous brute, when you leave Sarpedon, your guest, your comrade, there for the Argives, to be their prey, their booty? Often enough he helped you, your city and yourself, while he lived, yet now you don't dare keep the dogs off him. So now, if my Lycian troops will obey my orders, we're going home, and for Troy sheer ruin is like to follow. If only that dauntless courage was in the Trojans, unflinching, that comes to men who, for their country's sake, shoulder the strife and the struggle with their foes, then soon enough would we drag off Patroclos to Ilion, and if this man came, dead, to King Priam's great city, when we'd dragged him out of the battle, then quickly enough would the Argive surrender Sarpedon's fine battle gear and we'd bring the man himself back into Ilion, for such a fighter is he whose squire has been slain, the best of these Argives by their ships, he and his veterans, but you lack the courage to stand up. Face to face, against great-hearted Aeus, amid enemies' battle cries, and fight him head on, since he's a better man than you. Scowling darkly, bright-helmeted Hector replied, Why, Glaucos, being who you are, have you spoken so arrogantly? My friend, I once regarded you as the most sensible man of all those who have their homes in rich-soiled Lycia, but now what you say makes me doubt your sense entirely, when you claim that I failed to stand against huge Aeus. I tell you, I don't fear battle or the hoof beats of horses, but the mind of Zeus of the Aegis is always too strong, he scares even the valiant, deprives men of victory without effort, and as easily stirs them up to fight. Come, friend, stand by me, watch my actions, see whether, as you proclaim, I'm a coward the whole day through, or whether many a Danan, however fierce a fighter, I'll stand off from battling over the dead Patroclos. So saying, he called out to the Trojans. In a carrying voice, Trojans! Lycians. You Dardanian in hand-to-hand -hand fighters. Be men. My friends. Remember your fighting spirit, until I put on the armor of peerless Achilles, the splendid gear that I stripped from mighty Patroclos when I slew him. Having spoken thus, bright-helmeted Hector withdrew from war's deadly turmoil, ran fast, overtook his comrades who were not far off yet, hastened on swift feet after those bearing towards the city the famed armor of Pelis' his son. Then he halted, away from the grievous conflict, changed his armor, his own he gave, to be taken to sacred Ilion, to the Trojans, lovers of warfare, and himself put on the immortal gear of Achilles, Peleus' son, that the heavenly gods gave to his father, and he bequeathed, when old, to his son, but the son did not grow old in his father's armor. Now when from far off Zeus the cloud-gatherer saw him arming himself in the war gear of Peleus' godlike son, he shook his head and said, addressing his own heart, ah, wretched man, death has no place in your thoughts. Near though it is to you, you're putting on the immortal gear of a prince among men. Before whom others, too, tremble. His comrade you've slain, a man as gentle as he was strong, and improperly stripped the armor from his head and shoulders. Still, for now I'll allow you great power, in compensation for the fact that no way are you coming back from battle, nor will Andromarsh get from you the famed arms of Pelis's son. So the son of Cronos spoke, and, nodding his dark brows, made the armor fit Hector's body, and there entered him then fearsome in Yaelian ours, and his limbs were filled with inner courage and strength. Then he went in among the far-famed allies, shouting his war cry, and displayed himself to them all, a gleam in the battle gear of Pelis's great-hearted son, urging on every man he approached with his winged words, Mestels and Glaucos, Medon, Thersolochos, Hippothous. Dazena, and Asteropios, Forkies, and Chromios, the bird auger in Omos, these he approached, to these his winged words were addressed, Hear me, you countless tribes of allies that dwell around us. It was not in search of mere numbers, or because I lacked them, that I brought each one of you here from your cities, but rather for you to rescue the Trojans' wives and children, of your own will, for me, from these war-loving Achaeans. It's with this aim that I'm straining my people's resources for gifts and food to keep strong the spirit in you all. So let each man make straight for the foe, whether to perish or come safely through, that's the sweet embrace of warfare. And whoever drags Patroclos, dead though he is for sure, back among the horse-breaker Trojans, and Aeus yields to him, half my booty I'll share with him, keep only half myself, for his glory will be as great as mine.
So he spoke, they charged, full force, straight at the Danans, spears raised. The hearts within them brimming with hope that they'd drag the corpse away from Ias. Telemann's son, the fools, for over that body he robbed many of their life. Yet now Ias spoke to Menelos of the fine war cry, saying, My friend Menelos, Zeus is nursling. No longer do I hope that the two of us will ever come home safe from this war, it's not so much the corpse of Patroclos that concerns me, which all too soon will glut the dogs and vultures of Troy, it's my own head I'm afraid for, lest ill befall it, and yours as well, for a cloud of war, I mean Hector, now enshrouds everything, its sheer destruction confronts us. Still, call to the Danans' leaders, someone may hear us. So he spoke, Menelos of the fine war cry did not ignore him, called out to the Danans in a carrying voice, friends. Leaders and rulers of the Argives, you who with Atreus' sons, Agamemnon and Menelos, drink at the public cost, who, each of you, issue orders to your people, who from Zeus have honour and glory. Hard it is for me to distinguish each individual leader. So vast the strife of war that's flared up. So let each man advance unnamed, but with fury in his heart that Patroclos should end as a plaything for the dogs of Troy. So he spoke, Oileus's son, swift Aias, heard him clearly. He was the first who came to him, at a run, through the fighting, and after him Idomeneus, and Idomeneus's comrade Meriones, the equal of Inyalios, killer of men. As for the rest, who, from memory, could reel off all the names of those who followed, who woke the Achaeans' battle spirit. The Trojans charged in a massed body, Hector leading. As at the outflow of some rain-fed river, giant waves come roaring against the current and all around the coast's headlands re-echo as the salt sea breaks in foam, with such huge clamour the Trojans came on. But still the Achaeans stood steadfast around Menoetios's son, united in purpose, fenced with bronze shields. Upon them Cronos's son shed thick mist, hid their gleaming helmets, since, even before, he'd not hated the son of Menoetios, the squire of Iacos's grandson. While he still lived, so now, hating the thought of his becoming the prey of his Trojan enemy's dogs. Zeus stirred up his comrades to defend him. At first, the Trojans thrust back the sharp-eyed Achaeans, who retreated, leaving the corpse. Not a single one of them did these spirited Trojans spear, though they longed to, but started dragging the body away. Yet for a short while only were the Achaeans to hold off, being quickly rallied by Aias, a man who for handsome looks and warcraft surpassed all Danans, after Pelis's peerless son. Through the frontline fighters he stormed, in prowess resembling a wild boar, that in hill country easily scatters dogs and vigorous youths as it charges, swerving, through the glens, just so lordly Telamon's son, illustrious Aias, easily, once in among them, scattered the Trojan ranks that had closed in over Patroclos. Determined above all to drag him back to their city, and so win glory. Hippothous now, Pelasgian Lethos's illustrious son, was dragging the corpse by one foot through the grind of battle with his baldric lashed fast around the ankle's tendons, delighting the Trojans and Hector, but swiftly disaster struck him, that no one, though desperate to, could ward off. Out from the crowd darted Telamon's son, closed in, and hit him, right through his bronze cheek-pieced helmet, which, horsehair crest and all, split round the spear point, struck by a heavy spear. From a powerful hand, the brains, all blood bespattered, shot out from the wound along the spear's socket, his strength was loosened, his hands let fall great-hearted Patroclos's foot. It fell to the ground and lay there. He fell prone, close by it, on the corpse, far from rich-soiled Larissa, and never repaid his parents the cost of his upbringing. Brief indeed was his life. Cut off short by the spear of mighty-spirited Aias. Hector let fly in turn at Aias with his gleaming spear, but Aias, watching him closely, avoided the bronze-tipped shaft, a near miss. It hit Scedios, great-hearted Iphitos's son, best by far of the Phocians, who in famous Panopeus had his dwelling, and reigned as king over many subjects. Hector hit him under the collarbone, in the midpart, the bronze spear point drove right through, emerged at the shoulder's base. He fell with a thud, and his armor rattled upon him. Next Aias hit Phorkes, the warlike son of Phanops, who was standing over Hippothous, in the mid-belly, broke the plate of his corslet, so that his guts spilled out through the bronze, in the dust he fell, and clawing the earth. Then the frontline fighters and illustrious Hector gave ground, and the Argives, cheering loudly, dragged off the corpses, Phorkes, Hippothous, and started stripping the gear from their shoulders. Now would the warlike Achaeans have once more driven the Trojans. Undone by their lack of spirit. Back up to Ilion, and the Argives would have won glory, even beyond the measure approved by Zeus, through their forceful strength. But Apollo himself roused up Aeneas, assuming a herald's likeness, that of Periphas, Epitos's son, 
in Aeneas's aged father's house he'd grown old as a herald, was on friendly terms with him. In his likeness now Zeus's son Apollo addressed Aeneas, Aeneas, how, against a god's will, could you all safeguard steep Ilion? I've seen other men who relied on their forceful strength, on their bravery, on their common people, even when their numbers were very few, but now it's for us Zeus wants victory, not for the Danans, yet nevertheless your scared witless, refuse to fight. So he spoke, Aeneas, face to face with him, recognized Apollo, the deadly archer, and shouted to Hector, saying, Hector, and you other leaders of the Trojans and allies. This is a shameful business. That by the warlike Achaeans we're being driven back up to Ilion. Undone by our lack of spirit. But one of the gods just approached me, who says that Zeus, the all-highest counsellor, is our backer in this battle. So let's go straight for the Danans, not leave them undisturbed to carry the corpse of Patroclos back to their ships. So he spoke, then charged far beyond the frontline fighters, and stood there. The Trojans rallied to him, confronting the Achaeans, and Aeneas with his spear now wounded Laocritos, Arisba's son, Lycomedes' worthy comrade, and Lycomedes, fierce warrior, in sorrow for his death advanced to close quarters, let fly with his gleaming spear, hit Hippasos' son Apiseon, a shepherd of men, in his liver, below the midriff, and at once unstrung his knees, Apiseon, who'd come out there from rich soil Paeonia, and after Asteropaios was Paeonia's finest fighter. Asteropaios. Fierce warrior, in sorrow for his death likewise charged forward, eager to challenge the Danans, but no longer could, for their shields now fenced them in as they encircled Patroclos, spears couched before them, while Aeus ranged round them all, with endless directions, that none of them should give ground, fall back from the corpse, or come pushing forward in front of the other Achaeans to fight, but keep close order round the body, battle hand to hand. Such were huge Aeus's orders, the earth grew sodden with dark red blood, and jostling men dropped dead in mingled heaps. Trojans and their proud allies, and Danans too, though these did not avoid bloodshed, far fewer of them were falling, they took constant care in the crush of battle to save one another from death. So they battled on like fire, and you could not tell if the sun and the moon were still in their place, intact. For a dark mist now enshrouded all the bravest who stood and fought in the struggle around Menoetios's dead son. While the rest of the Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans engaged, unimpeded, in the clear air, with the sun's keen rays spread over them, and not one single cloud to be seen above plain or mountain. These fought with occasional breaks, avoiding each other's grief-laden missiles, and standing well apart, whereas those in the center were under duress from the conflict as well as the darkness, all the bravest worn down by the pitiless bronze. But two men who'd not yet learned, Antilochos, Thrasymedes, famous fighters both, of peerless Patroclos's death, and thought he was still alive, and battling the Trojans there in the foremost ranks were now, though alert for their comrades' death or rout, fighting off at a distance, as Nestor had told them to do while urging them into battle, away from the black ships. All day long the great struggle of their grievous conflict raged on, and endlessly with the sweat of action every man's knees and calves, and the feet below them, and his arms and eyes, were bespattered, as they fought over the noble squire of Iacos' swift-footed grandson. As when a man consigns the hide of a hefty bull to his people for stretching, one already made supple with fat, and they take it and all stand round in a circle and stretch it, so that at once the moisture goes out, while the fat sinks in, with many hands pulling, and the whole hide surface is stretched, so this way and that both sides were tugging the corpse in a narrow space, and they all were hopeful at heart that they'd get it away, the Trojans to Ilion. The Achaeans to the hollow ships, and around it a contest arose. So fierce that neither ours, driver of armies, nor yet Athene could have made light of it, however great their rage. Such was the grim labour of men and horses that Zeus stretched taut that day over Patroclos. Nor did noble Achilles yet have any knowledge of Patroclos's death, for far distant from the swift ships the conflict raged, beneath the Trojans' ramparts. So he never expected that Patroclos would die, thought that once he'd reached Troy's gates he'd come back alive for it did not enter his mind that Patroclos would try to sack Troy, with or without him, having often heard that from his mother, in private talk, when she brought him news of mighty Zeus's intentions, while now indeed his mother did not tell him the great disaster, that his comrade, of all men the dearest to him, had been slain. The combatants round the corpse, sharp spears in hand, pressed on without pause, kept up their killing of one another. And of the bronze coarse leated Achaeans thus would one declare, friends, We'd achieve no glory by going back at this point to the hollow ships, here and now let the black earth gate for us all, far better indeed that would be for us, if we must surrender this man to the Trojan horsebreakers, to drag back to their city and so win glory. 
Thus likewise would one of the great-hearted Trojans declare, My friends, even though it may prove our destiny to be slaughtered beside this man, one and all, let no one give up the battle. This was how they spoke, arousing each man's passion. So they fought on, and an iron clatter went up through the still upper air till it reached the brazen heavens. But the horses of Iacos's grandson, now far from the conflict, were weeping, since first they learned that their charioteer had been laid low in the dust by Hector, killer of men. Automedon, valiant son of Dior's, again and again lashed them with blows from his swift whip, many times tried shifting them with kind words. Many times with curses, yet neither back to the ships by the broad Hellespont were they willing to go. Nor yet to join the Achaeans in battle, but as firm as stands the marker that set up over the burial mound of some dead man or woman, so they stood immovable. Still hitched to the exquisite chariot, heads bowed down to the ground, while the warm tears flowed from their eyelids earthward as they shed them, mourning their charioteer, and dust soiled the rich manes that streamed down from the yoke pad, both sides of the yoke. Their mourning was viewed, with compassion, by Cronos's son, who shook his head while communing with his own heart, wretched pair, why, oh, why, did we give you to King Peleus, a mortal, when you yourselves are immortal and ageless? Was it to bring you sorrows among these wretched humans? For surely there's nothing more pitiable than man among all the creature that breathe and creep on this earth. But never behind you, upon that subtly worked chariot, will Priam's son Hector mount, I shall not let him. Is it not enough that he has the armour, brags over it? Into your knees and spirit I'll channel strength, to bring Automede and also back safe from the fighting to the hollow ships. Since I'll still bestow glory on the Trojans. To go on killing until they reach the well-benched ships, and the sun goes down, and sacred darkness comes on. So saying, he breathed great power into the horses, they both shook off the dust from their manes to the ground, and lightly took their swift chariot in among Trojans and Achaeans, while behind them Automedon, though grieving for his comrade, fought on, swooped with his team like a vulture after geese, easily would he retreat from the Trojans' noisy conflict, easily make his charge, force a passage through the crowd. Yet not one man did he bring down during his urgent pursuit, since no way was he able, alone in that headlong chariot both to attack with a spear and rein in his speeding horses. In the end a comrade of his observed his behaviour, Alcimedon, son of Lex and Hymen's grandson, and getting behind the chariot now spoke to Automedon, Automedon. Which of the gods has put such profitless counsel into your mind? Who so robbed you of common sense that you're fighting among the foremost Trojan troops alone? Your comrade's dead. And his armour, Achilles' own, Hector himself now wears on his shoulders, flaunts it. To him Automedon, son of Dior's, responded, Alcimedon, what other Achaean save you is able to curb and control the might of these immortal steeds, except for Patroclos, the god's own equal in counsel, while he still lived. But now death and his fate have claimed him. So you take from me the whip and shining reins, and I'll dismount from the chariot, join the fighting. So he spoke. Alcimedon boarded the rescue-swift chariot, quickly gathering in his hands both the reins and the whip, while Automedon jumped down. Illustrious Hector saw them, and at once said to Aeneas, who was standing nearby, Aeneas, counsellor of the bronze corseleted Trojans, I've just seen the team of Iacos' swift-footed grandson showing up in the battle line with incompetent charioteers. These two horses I'd hope to capture, if you in your heart are agreeable. Since if the two of us went at them they wouldn't dare to stand firm. To face us in battle. So he spoke, and Anchis's fine son did not disregard him, the pair strode forward, shoulders hooded with oxide, dried, stiff, with thick bronze hammered upon it, and with them went both Chromios and the godlike Artus, hearts brimming with hopeful expectation that they'd now kill the two men and drive off their strong-necked horses, fools that they were, for they wouldn't come back without bloodshed from Automedon, who now was praying to Zeus, the father, his dark heart within him. Filled with courage and strength. Quickly he spoke to Alcimedon, his trusty comrade, Alcimedon, don't keep the horses any distance from me, let their breath fall close on my back, for I don't suppose Hector, the son of Priam, will be stayed from his raging might till he either mounts behind Achilles' fine-maned horses after killing us both, and rooting the rank and file of the Argives, or else himself is slain in the front line. So saying, he called out to both Iases and Menelos, Iases, leaders of Argives, and you, Menelos. Entrust the body to those who are the best men we have, to stand around it and fend off these crowding assailants, but we're alive. Come help us, keep the ruthless day from us, for here, bearing hard down on us in grievous battle are Aeneas and Hector, the Trojans' best fighting men. 
Still, the outcome of all this lies on the knees of the gods, I too will let fly my spear, for the rest, let Zeus decide. So saying, he poised and threw his far-shadowing spear, and hit the well-balanced shield of Artus. That failed to stop its passage, clean through the bronze it drove, and pierced through the baldric into the nether belly. As when a strong young man, wielding a sharpened axe, lands a blow behind the horns of a country ox, cuts clean through the tendon, and the ox starts forward, falls, so Artus jerked forward, then fell on his back, the spear, razor sharp, quivered deep in his innards, unstrung his limbs. Now Hector with his bright spear let fly at Automedon, but Automedon was watching, and avoided the bronze spear by ducking down forward, so that its long shaft stuck in the ground behind him, its butt end quivering, and their mighty ars took its power away from it. They'd have faced off with their swords then, fought hand to hand, had the two Iases not parted them, both hot for battle, coming out through the ranks in response to their comrades' call, so that from fear of them both Hector and Aeneas, together with godlike Chromios, retreated once more leaving Artus behind. Mortally wounded, still lying there. Automedon now, the peer of speedy Ars, stripped off Aretos's armour and boasted over him, saying, indeed, if only a little, I've eased my heart of its grief for Menoitios's son, though it was a lesser man that I killed. So saying, he picked up the bloodstained trappings, put them in the chariot, climbed aboard it himself, his feet and hands above them all bloody, like a lion that's devoured a bull. Once more over Patroclos the grinding battle was stretched, tear-laden and agonizing, Athene stirred the conflict, coming down from the sky, dispatched by far-seeing Zeus to urge on the Danans, for by now his mind had been changed. As Zeus from heaven stretches a rainbow shimmering arc as a portent for mortals, it may be either of war, or of some chill winter storm, that stops men from working outdoors on the land, and distresses their flocks, just so Athene, enshrouding herself in a dark cloud, now ranged through the Achaean forces began spurring each man on. First, with encouraging words she addressed the son of Atreus, brave Menelaus, since he was near at hand, assuming the form of Phoenix, and his unwearying voice, for you indeed, Menelaus, there will be sure disgrace and shame, if lordly Achilles' trusty comrade is torn apart by quick dogs beneath the walls of Troy. So hold your position firmly, encourage all your men. Menelaus of the fine war cry made her this answer, Phoenix, old daddy, aged sir, if only Athene would give me strength fend off the oncoming missiles, then I'd be ready to stand by Patroclos, protect him, for his death touched my heart to the quick. But Hector's strength is like fires, he never rests from slaughtering with the bronze, since it's to him Zeus now grants glory. So he spoke, and the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, rejoiced, since it was to her, before all other gods, that he'd prayed, and she put power into his knees and shoulders, and filled his breast with the aggressiveness of the fly, however often swatted away from a man's skin. Still it persists in biting him, so sweet it finds human blood. Such the daring with which she flooded his dark spirit, he went and stood over Patroclos, let fly his gleaming spear. Now among the Trojans there was one Pods, Aetian's son, both wealthy and a good fighter, and honoured by Hector, above all the people, as his friend and dinner companion. Him fair-haired Menelaus struck on the baldric as he leapt into flight, the bronze made its way clean through. He fell with a thud, and Atreus's son Menelaus dragged his corpse from the Trojans into his comrades' ranks. Then Apollo intervened, gave encouragement to Hector, in the likeness of Phaenops, Aetios' son, who of all his guest friends was dearest him, whose house was in Abydos. In his likeness the deadly archer Apollo now addressed him, E Hector. What other Achaean will be afraid of you, now you've fled before Menelaus, who, at least in the past, seemed a faint-hearted fighter? yet single-handed his snatched a corpse from the Trojans, and killed your trusty comrade, a good frontline fighter, Pods, Aetian's son. So he spoke, and a black cloud of grief enshrouded Hector, and he strode through the frontline fighters, clad in gleaming bronze. Now, too, the son of Kronos took his aegis, tasseled, glittering bright, enveloped Ida in clouds, sent lightning, made a huge thunderclap, shook the aegis, gave victory to the Trojans, put the Achaeans to flight. First to panic and flee was Boeotian Penelios, who, turning to face the enemy, was hit in the upper shoulder, a glancing blow, yet Puladamas's spear spearpoint nicked the bone, it was he who'd speared him, at close range. Leto's too, great-hearted Electrian son, was wounded, in the wrist, at close quarters, by Hector. Put out of the fight, he backed off. Glancing round, since he no longer hoped, spear in good hand, to do battle with the Trojans. As Hector chased after Leto's, Idomeneus struck his corslet, upon the chest by the nipple, 
but the long spear shaft broke off at the socket so that the Trojans raised a loud cheer. Now Hector had a shot at Idomeneus, Deucalion's son, as he stood in his chariot, just missed him, but hit the charioteer and comrade of Merion's, Coiranos, who'd accompanied him from well-built Lictos. Idomeneus had at first come on foot from the curved ships, and would have yielded a great triumph to the Trojans had Coiranos not quickly driven up his swift horses, come as a light of deliverance to him, warding off his pitiless day, but died himself at the hands of Hector, killer of men, who hit him below the ear, in under the jawline. The spear dashed his teeth out by their roots, cut his tongue at the midpoint. He fell from the chariot, dropped the reins on the ground. Meriones bent down. Gathered them up in his own hands from the earth, and addressed Idomeneus, use the whip now till you get to the swift ships. You yourself can recognize that the upper hand is no longer with the Achaeans. So he spoke, and Idomeneus lashed the fine-maned horses back to the hollow ships, for fear had seized his heart. Nor did great-hearted Aias and Menelos fail to see that Zeus was backing the Trojans, turning the tide of battle. Of these it was Telamon's son, great Aias, who spoke first, what's to be done? By this time even the merest idiot could figure that Zeus himself, the father, is for the Trojans, all their missiles, whoever throws them, coward or hero, hit their target, Zeus anyway steers them straight, but for us every man's shot falls uselessly to the ground. So let's think up a plan, the best way we can contrive to drag that corpse out of the fray, and as for ourselves, manage to get back home, a great joy to our comrades. Who must be distressed by the scene here? Who don't believe that the rage and invincible hands of Hector, killer of men, can now be stood off, are sure they'll descend on the black ships. If only there were some comrade to take a message post-haste to Peleus's son, since I don't think he's yet received the sorrowful news that his own dear comrade is slain. But such a one I can't see amongst the Achaeans, since they're all shrouded in mist, themselves and their horses. Zeus, father, rescue the Achaean sons from this mist, make the sky clear, let us see with our eyes, if you mean to kill us. If that's your pleasure, at least do it in daylight. So he spoke, the father pitied him as he wept, and forthwith scattered the darkness, drove the mist away, the sun shone on them. The battle was all now in clear view. Then Aias addressed Menelos of the fine war cry, take a look, Menelos, Zeus's nursling, in case you can spot Antilocho still alive there, great-hearted Nestor's son, and send him, as fast as may be, to war like Achilles to tell him his dearest comrade by far has been killed. So he spoke, Menelos of the fine war cry did not disregard him, but went on his way like a lion from a steading, tired of provoking the dogs and men that won't let him get in and seize the fattest steer, who are vigilant the whole night through, yet he, so desperate for meat, keeps coming, but gets nowhere, has to face a shower of hunting spears flung by strong hands, and blazing firebrands before which, for all his eagerness, he shrinks back, and at dawn goes on his way, his. Spirit crushed, so from Patroclos went Menelos, of the fine war cry, against his will, for he greatly feared that the Achaeans in their disastrous flight might leave him a prey for his foes. Repeatedly he adjured Meriones and both Iases, you Iases. Argive leaders, and, Meriones, you too, each one of you should remember the gentleness of Patroclos, unhappy soul. For he knew how to be kind to all men while he still lived, but now death and destiny have claimed him. This said, Fair-haired Menelos went on his way, glancing from side to side like an eagle, which, they say, has the keenest eyesight of all the sky's winged creatures, and from it, high though it glides, the hare is not hidden crouching under a leafy bush, but the eagle swoops straight down, and having caught it, quickly robs it of life. Thus then, Menelos, Zeus's nursling, did your glinting eyes roam everywhere over the company of your many comrades, in the hope of discovering Nestor's son still alive there. Menelo soon picked him out, at the far left of the battle, encouraging his comrades and urging them on to fight, and went over, and said, standing near him, come here, Antilochos, Zeus's nursling, there's news you need to learn. Distressing news. That I wish had never come about. By now I think you must know, from what you've seen, that there's some gods who's rolling disaster upon the Danans, that the Trojans are winning. Slain is the best of the Achaeans, Patroclos, leaving the Danans with a huge sense of loss, so you must run, at once, to the Achaean ships, bring word to Achilles, let him quickly bring the body back to his ship, the naked body, his armor bright helmeted Hector holds. So he spoke, Antilochos heard his words with horror. For long he was stricken speechless, while both his eyes were brimming with tears, and his strong young voice was stilled. 
Even so he did not ignore the command of Menelos, he set off at a run, gave his gear to his peerless companion Laodokos, who was turning his whole hoof team close by. So Antilochos's feet bore him, weeping, away from the battle to bring these evil tidings to Pelis's son Achilles. Nor, Menelos, Zeus's nursling. Was your spirit minded to lend help to those hard-pressed Pilian comrades whom Antilochos, going, had left with a huge sense of loss. He sent noble Thrasymedes to them, but himself, at a run, went back to the hero Patroclos, stood once more over him. Going first up to the Iases, he told them at once, that man you mentioned I've sent on to the swift ships, to go to swift-footed Achilles, who, even now, I don't think will come out, enraged though he is at noble Hector, there's no way he would fight without armour against the Trojans. So let's think up a plan, the best way we can contrive to drag that corpse out of the fray, and as for ourselves, to stay clear of death and its spirits amid the Trojans' clamour. Then great Aias. Telamon's son, responded to him, all you've said, renowned Menelos, is right and proper. So you and Marion's go quickly, shoulder the corpse, carry it out of the struggle, we two behind you will do battle with the Trojans and noble Hector, one in name as in spirit, we who in times gone by have stood firm in sharp battles, each supporting the other. So he spoke, they gathered the corpse in their arms and with huge effort heaved it up, while behind them the Trojan troops all cried out when they saw Achaeans lifting the body, and charged straight at them, like hounds that go for a wounded wild boar, out in front of their young huntsmen, at first, they keep rushing at it, eager to tear it apart, but when, trusting its strength, it turns at bay amongst them, they back off, scatter in panic, one this way, one that, so the Trojans at first kept after them in a body, stabbing at them with swords and two-edged spears, but each time the two Iases turned and made a stand against them. Then would their colour change, and none now dared to come forward and do battle for the corpse. So these two, hurriedly, bore the body out of the fighting back to the hollow ships, against them pressed a conflict as savage as flames that raced to reach a populous city, set it ablaze in an instant, and houses collapse in the vast fire that's driven, roaring, by the wind's force. So against these now the uproar of chariots and spearmen came beating ceaselessly as they struggled on their way, but like mules that put their strong backs into the effort and drag from the mountains, down. Some steep stony track, a beam or a huge ship timber, their hearts within them worn down with sweat and exhaustion as they strive onward. So these two, straining, bore off the corpse, while behind them the Iases held back the foe, as a ridge holds off a flood, a wooded ridge, that by chance lies right across a plain, and checks the dangerous onset of even the strongest rivers. Turns all their streams back to wander over the plain. Nor can their mighty torrent ever burst through it, so the two Iases constantly stood off the assaults, yet the Trojans kept on coming, two of them above all, Aeneas, son of Anxes, and illustrious Hector. As a cloud of starlings or jackdaws will take wing, and cry the alarm when they catch sight of a hawk approaching, the creature that bodes plain murder for all small birds, so from Aeneas and Hector fled the Achaeans' young warriors, crying the alarm, forgetful of their fighting spirit. Many fine pieces of armour were lost now, round and about the ditch, as the Danans fled, but from warfare there was no respite. Book 18. So these fought on in the likeness of blazing fire, but swift-footed Antilochos came to Achilles as messenger, and found him in front of his high stern ships, his mind foreboding what indeed had already been fulfilled. Deeply vexed, he addressed his own proud spirit, army, why yet again are the long-haired Achaeans being driven over the plain, panic-stricken, back to their ships? May the gods not be fulfilling that grim grief for my heart spelled out to me once by my mother, when she told me that the very best of the Myrmidons, while I still lived, would flee the light of the sun, at the Trojans' hands. It must be that his dead, Menoitios's valiant son. The fool. I told him, when he'd beaten the fierce fire back, to return to the ships, not match his strength with Hector's. While he was reflecting thus, in his mind and heart, the son of illustrious Nestor came into his presence shedding hot tears and announced his unhappy message, alas, son of warlike Peleus. Painful indeed is the news you must hear. Of what never should have been, Patroclos lies dead, and they're fighting over his body, his naked body, his armour bright helmeted Hector holds. So he spoke, a black cloud of grief closed over Achilles. With both hands he gathered up the dark grimy dust, scattered it over his head, befouled his handsome features, and on his fragrant tunic the black ash settled. There stretched in the dust, great in his greatness he lay, with his own hands he tore and defiled his hair. Those maidservants won as spoils by Achilles and Patroclos shrieked aloud in their heartfelt anguish, ran out of doors, stood around warlike Achilles, all with their hands beat on their breasts, the limbs of all were weakened. 
Antilochos, opposite them, lamented, shedding tears, and grasped the hands of Achilles, whose heartfelt groans made Antilochos fear he might cut his throat with his knife. So terrible was his outcry, his lady mother heard him, ensconced in the sea's depths. Beside the old man. Her father, and shrieked in her turn, and the goddesses gathered round her, all of Nereus's daughters there were in the sea's depths. Thither came Glauc and Thalea, Chimadoke, Nasia, Speo, and though, and Oxide Haley, Chimatho, and Actaia, along with Limnorea, Melite and Iaira, Agor, Amphitho, Doto and Prota, Diamine and Ferusa, Dexamine and Amphenome and Callianera, Doris and Panope and far-famed Galatea, Nemertz, Aspudes, and Callianassa. With these also came Clymene, Ianera, and Ianassa, Myra and Orethia and fair Trest Amathea, and other Nereids from elsewhere in the sea's depths, and with them the bright cave was filled, and all alike beat their breasts, and their lamentation was led by the tees, listen, my Nereid sisters, that one and all you may hear and know well the sum of the sorrows within my heart. Ah, wretch that I am, most miserable in my splendid offspring. A son indeed I bore, incomparable and mighty. Preeminent among heroes, like a sapling he shot up. And when, like a tree on an orchard knoll, I'd reared him, I sent him out to Ilion in the curved ships, to fight the Trojans. But now I'll never welcome him back to his home, he'll never return to the house of Peleus. Now, even while he still lives, and sees the sunlight, he has sorrow, nor can I be of help by going to him, but go I will to see my dear child, and learn what grief has come upon him while he's still keeping out of the war. So saying, she left the cave, and the nymphs went with her, shedding tears, on each side of them the waves of the sea broke into surf. When they came to rich soil Troy, they stepped out onto the beach one by one, where, in serried ranks, the Myrmidon ships were drawn up round swift Achilles. As he groaned heavily, his lady mother went to him, gave a sharp cry, then cradled the head of her son in her arms, and, lamenting, addressed him with winged words, Why are you weeping, child? What grief has touched your heart? Tell me, don't hide it. What you wanted has been fulfilled by Zeus, what you earlier prayed for, hands uplifted, that all the Achaean sons should be huddled by their ships, in desperate need of you, enduring shameful treatment. To her, sighing deeply, swift-footed Achilles replied, Mother, all this indeed the Olympian managed for me. But what joy have I from it, now my dear comrade is dead, Patroclos, whom I honoured above all other comrades, as I would my own life. Him I've lost, while his armour Hector stripped when he'd killed him, a marvel to look at, fine gear, that the gods gave to Peleus as glorious gifts the day they delivered you into the bed of a mortal. Better you'd stayed among the sea's deathless maidens. And that Peleus had brought to his home a mortal bride. But now there's measureless grief awaiting you too. For the death of your son, whom you'll not welcome home ever again, my heart won't let me live on, either, in mankind's company, unless it happens that Hector, struck down by my spear, shall lose his life first, and pay for the way he despoiled Patroclos, Menoetios's son. The tease then answered him, shedding tears, Oh, my child, what you say now means that you're doomed to an early death, since your own fate awaits you very soon after Hector's. Deeply moved, swift-footed Achilles replied, Let me die very soon, then. Clearly I wasn't fated to save my comrade from being killed, far away from his native soil he perished, in need of me as his protector from harm. So now, since I'll not return to my own dear fatherland, nor have been of the slightest help to either Patroclos or my other comrades, those many destroyed by noble Hector, but sit, a useless burden on earth, here by the ships, I, who am such as no other bronze corsleted Achaean is as a fighter. Though others may be better in counsel, would that strife might perish among both gods and men, and bitter resentment, that stirs even sensible men to fury, and, far sweeter than honey dripping down, increases in men's breasts like billowing smoke. Thus, lately, did the lord of men, Agamemnon, arouse my resentment. Still, all this, despite our grief, we'll treat as past and done with, restraining, because we must, the heart in our breast. So now I shall come out, to run down that dear soul's killer, Hector, my own death I'll accept whenever Zeus and the other immortal gods decide to bring it on, for not even the mighty Heracles could escape death, dearest of all though he was to Zeus the son of Cronos, but fate overcame him, and here, es grim resentment. So I too, if indeed there's a like fates in wait for me, shall lie when I'm dead. But for now, let me win high renown, causing many a one of all those deep-bosomed women, Trojan, Dardanian, to wipe tears from their tender cheeks with both hands to keen ceaselessly, to get it into their heads that I'd held off too long from battle. So do not try, though you love me, to stop me fighting, you'll not persuade me. 
Then the goddess, that is the silver-footed, replied, Yes, this is certainly true, child. It's no bad thing to fend off sheer destruction from hard-pressed comrades. But your fine battle geese in Trojan hands, your armor of gleaming bronze, bright-helmeted Hector himself wears it now on his shoulders. Flaunts it, but won't, I think, glory in it for long, since his own killing's very close. Do not, for now, go into the turmoil of battle until with your own eyes you see me return here, I'll be back in the morning at sunrise. Bringing with me fine new armor for you from the Lord Hephaestos. With that she turned away from her son, and having left him approached her marine sisters, and spoke thus among them. You now go back down into the sea's wide gulf, call on the old man of the sea, visit our father's house, tell him all the news. I myself am off to high Olympos, to approach Hephaestos, famed craftsman, and see if he'll agree to furnish my son with new battle gear, fine and gleaming. So she spoke, at once they plunged under the sea's waves, while she, the tease, the goddess, silver-footed, made her way to Olympos, to fetch splendid armor for her beloved son. Her then her feet took to Olympos, but the Achaeans, with deafening outcry, pursued by Hector, killer of men, came in their flight to the ships and the Hellespont. Nor could these well-grieved Achaeans drag Patroclos out of missile range, corpse though he was, an Achilles' squire. For now once more Troy's troops and chariots were on him. And Hector, Priam's son, a man of flame like valor. Thrice did illustrious Hector seize his feet from behind, bent on dragging him off, and yelling to the Trojans, while thrice the two Iases, clothed in courage and daring, beat him back from the corpse, yet, sure of his own prowess, he'd now make a charge in the fray, and now stand firm, shouting aloud, but he backed off not one step. Just as there's no way country shepherds can drive off a tawny lion from a carcass when he's starving hungry, so the two Iases could not, prime warriors though they were, scare Priam's son Hector away from the corpse. And now he'd have dragged it off, and garnered ineffable glory, had not swift Iris, wind-footed, come to Pelis's son from Olympos in haste, with a message to arm himself for battle, sent by here, unknown to Zeus and the other gods. Now standing beside him she addressed him with winged words, up with you, son of Peleus, of all men the most fearsome. And rescue Patroclos. On whose account grim fighting is going on before the ships, men are slaughtering one another, some striving to defend the fallen warrior's corpse, while others, the Trojans, are determined to haul him away from the fighting to windy Ilion. Of them all, illustrious Hector is most set on dragging him off, for his heart's bidding him cut the head from that tender neck, stick it up on a sharp stake. Up, then, lie here no longer, shame should possess your heart that Patroclos may become sport for the dogs of Troy, yours the disgrace, if his body should reach us at all disfigured. Swift-footed noble Achilles responded to her, Iris, goddess, which god was it sent you as messenger to me? Swift Iris, wind-footed, made him this reply, it was here who sent me, Zeus's far-famed bedfellow, the high-throned son of Cronos knows nothing about it, nor any other immortal that dwells upon snow-clad Olympos. In answer to her then swift-footed Achilles said, but how can I enter the struggle? They have my armor. And my mother told me not to arm myself for the fray until with my own eyes I see her come back here, since she promised to bring me fine new armor from Hephaestos. No other man do I know whose famed battle gear I might use, except for the shield of Aias, the son of Telamon, but he, I think, will be out himself with the frontline fighters, dealing death with his spear in defense of dead Patroclos. To him again spoke swift Iris, the wind-footed, we too are well aware that the Trojans now have your famous armor. Go just as you are to the ditch, show yourself to these Trojans, see if they fear you enough to back off from the fighting. Let the warlike Achaean sons, now worn out, catch their breath for a little, too brief is the breathing space from battle. This said, swift-footed Iris went on her way, but Achilles, beloved of Zeus, now stood up, and Athene around his powerful shoulders arranged the tasseled aegis, and about his head she, bright among goddesses, set a golden cloud, and from him made blaze a shining flame. As when smoke rises up to heaven from a city on some distant island that enemies are besieging. And all day long men contend in hateful warfare from the city's walls, and then when the sun goes down the beacon fires are lit one after another, their flames blazing high for those dwelling round about to observe, in the hope that they'll come in their ships, help fix the trouble, so from Achilles' head the gleam went up to heaven. From wall to ditch he went, and stood there, but did not mingle with the Achaeans, respecting his mother's wise advice. There he stood, and shouted, and Athene, standing apart, gave voice to, arousing vast panic among the Trojans. As clear as the trumpet's note sounds out when a township's encircled by enemies with destruction on their minds, 
So clear was the war cry uttered by Iacos's grandson, when the Trojans heard that brazen voice, and knew its author, the spirits of all were confounded. The fine-maned horses turned their chariots backwards. Sensing trouble ahead, their charioteers were in panic when they saw the tireless fire blaze marvellously over the head of Pelias's great-hearted son. A fire lit and kept shining by the goddess, grey-eyed Athene. Three great shouts over the ditch did noble Achilles give, and three times the Trojans and their far-famed allies panicked, twelve of their finest fighters perished there and then, among their own spears and chariots. But the Achaeans happily dragged Patroclos out of range of the missiles, laid him down on a litter. His comrades gathered around him, weeping, swift-footed Achilles accompanied them, shedding warm tears. On seeing his loyal comrade stretched out on the bier, cut about by the sharp bronze, he'd sent him out, along with his chariot and horses, to war, but never was he to welcome him back again. The ox-eyed lady here now forced the unwearying sun to make its unwilling return to the streams of ocean, so the sun set, and the noble Achaeans had some respite from the powerful turmoil and warfare's uncertain outcome. The Trojans, for their part, went back from the grind of battle. Unyoked the swift horses from their chariots. And gathered in assembly, before any thought of supper. They stayed on their feet right through the meeting, not one man dared to sit down, scared to trembling as they all were by Achilles' appearance, so very long he'd been gone from injurious battle. Shrewd Puladama spoke first, Panthusa's son, who alone looked both forward and back, Hector's comrade he was, and born on the same night, though the one excelled with words, with a spear the other. He with friendly intent now spoke before the assembly, think hard on both sides, my friends. For myself, I urge you to go back now to the city, not to wait for the bright dawn out on the plain by the ships, we're far from our walls here. While this man remained wrathful at noble Agamemnon, it was an easier business to fight against the Achaeans. I too gladly stayed all night out by the swift ships then in the hope of seeing them captured, rounded hulls and all, but now I'm truly afraid of Pelis's swift-footed son. His spirit's so headstrong. He won't be willing to stay here in mid-plain, where both Trojans and Achaeans share the rage of battle between them on disputed ground, it's for our city he'll be fighting, and for our women. So, back to the city, this, believe me, is how things will be. For now night has stilled the swift-footed son of Peleus, Ambrosial Knight, but if tomorrow he comes out armed, and finds us still here, there are those who'll get to know him too well, and then happy the man who escapes to sacred Ilion, for many the victims that dogs and vultures will eat, Trojans. But may such tidings never reach my ears. Now, if we follow my plan, however reluctantly, tonight we'll keep our forces in the place of assembly, while the ramparts, the high gateways, and the tall polished doors close fitted in them, well bolted, will safeguard the city. Tomorrow at dawn, then, armed, armoured, and ready, we'll position ourselves on the ramparts, the worse for him. If he wants to come up from the ships and fight us for our wall, back he'll go to the ships. After glutting his high necked horses with all his to and fro dashing, in vain, beneath the city. As for getting inside, that he won't, however great his rage, nor ever sack Troy, before that swift dogs will devour him. Scowling darkly, bright helmeted Hector responded, Puladamas, what you're proposing no longer pleases me, telling us to retreat, to stay cooped up in the town. Haven't you yet had your fill of being stuck inside the ramparts? Time was when Priam's city was talked of by all mankind, how rich it was in gold, all its wealth of bronze, but its homes have now lost their fine treasures, while many possessions have gone to Phrygia and to lovely Myonia, sold for cash, ever since great Zeus turned his wrath against us. But now, when the son of devious Kronos has let me win renown at the ships, blockade the Achaeans by the sea, no longer, you fool, promote such ideas as these in public, not one Trojan will support you, I'll not allow it. So come, then, let us all agree to do as I say, for now, take your dinner throughout the camp, as usual, and keep a good lookout. Every one of you stay alert, any Trojan who's overmuch concerned for his possessions should turn them all in for the populace to eat up, better that they should enjoy them than the Achaeans. Tomorrow at dawn, then, armed, armoured, and ready, let's go to the hollow ships, start some sharp engagements, and if noble Achilles has really stood up to fight by the ships, so much, if he's that way minded, the worse for him. I for one won't avoid him or miserable warfare, but face to face I'll confront him, and see whether he then triumphs, or I do. Inyalios is impartial, he kills the would-be killer. Such was Hector's address. And the Trojans cheered him, the fools, for their wits had been stolen by Pallas Athene, on Hector, for his bad counsel, they all heaped praise, but none praised Puladamas, though he'd offered them excellent advice. So throughout the camp they ate dinner, 
but the Achaeans wailed all night long in their mourning for Patroclos. Peleus' son it was led them in their heartfelt lamentation, laying his murderous hands upon his comrade's breast, with quick loud sobs. He was like a bearded lion whose cubs a deer hunter has stolen away from some dense thicket, later, the lion returns and ranges, grieving, through many a glen on the hunter's tracks, hoping to catch him somewhere, possessed by bitter fury. So, groaning deeply, to the Myrmidon spoke Achilles, Ah, me, vain indeed were the words I uttered that day reassuring the hero Menoitios in our halls, I said I'd bring his son home to Opoes wreathed in glory from the sacking of Ilion. With his fair share of the spoils. But not all their designs does Zeus fulfil for mortals. We too are both fated to redden the selfsame earth here in Troy, since I too shall never come back home to be welcomed by the old horseman Peleus in his halls or by the Tis my mother, the earth will hold me here forever. But now, Patroclos, since the earth will claim me later than you, I'll not bury you till I've brought here Hector's armour and head, he, the killer of your mighty heart, and in front of your pyre I shall cut the throats of a dozen noble Trojan youths, so enraged I am at your slaying. Till then you'll lie as you are alongside my curved ships, and round you deep-bosomed women, Trojans, Dardanians, will mourn for you, shedding tears, by day and by night, women we toil to win by the force of our long spears, laying waste the wealthy cities of mortal men. That said, noble Achilles now gave the word to his comrades to set on the fire a great cauldron, so they might quickly wash Patroclos clean of oozing blood and gore. They stood in the blaze a vessel for heating bathwater and filled it. And under it gathered and kindled much firewood, flames licked round the cauldron's belly, the water warmed. When the water came to a boil in the shining bronze then indeed they washed him and rubbed his body with oil, filled his wounds with an ointment nine years old, then laid him out on a bier, wrapped from head to foot in soft linen and over that they dressed him in a white robe. The whole night through then, round swift-footed Achilles, the Myrmidons wailed in mourning for their Patroclos. Now Zeus spoke to here, his sister and his wife, you've had your way, then, my oxide lady here, you've aroused swift-footed Achilles. Surely they must be your very own offspring, all these long-haired Achaeans. The oxide lady here then responded to him, most dread son of Kronos, what is this that you've said? Even a human, surely, will do things for his fellow man, though, being mortal, he doesn't possess all the wisdom that I do. I who declare I'm the highest of all goddesses. As the eldest born, and because I'm recognized as your consort, and you're the king of all the immortals. How, in my rage, could I not cobble trouble for these Trojans? Thus they spoke to each other, but meanwhile the Tees, the silver-footed, came to the house of Hephaistos, imperishable, starry outstanding among God's homes, made of bronze, and built by the little clubfoot himself. Him she found sweating as he bustled around his bellows, working fast, he was making tripods, twenty in all, to stand round the wall of his solidly built dwelling, and under the base of each he'd fixed golden wheels, so that of themselves they could enter the divine assembly and come back again to his house, a marvel to behold. So far, then, they were finished, but the intricately wrought ear handles had not yet been added, these he was fitting and hammering in the rivets. As he worked with expert skill, he was approached by the Tees, the silver-footed goddess. She was seen by bright-veiled Charis, who now came forward, lovely Charis, wed by the far-famed lame of both legs god, and clasped her hand, and addressed her in these words, What, long-robed the Tees, brings you now to our house? Though a dear and respected friend, you've not visited us before. Do come in. And let me offer you entertainment. So saying, the bright goddess led her inside the house, seated her on a chair, all silver-studied, finely and intricately worked, with below it a stool for the feet, and called to Hephaistos, famed craftsman, in these words, Hephaistos, come out here. The tease has need of you. The far-famed lame of both legs god answered her, it's an awesome and venerable goddess who's in my house. She rescued me, when I was hurting, having fallen so far because of my bitch of a mother, who had her mind set on hiding me and my lameness. I'd have suffered agonies had Euronome and the Tees not welcomed me warmly, that Euronome who's the daughter of encircling ocean. The nine years I was with them I made much intricate metalwork, brooches, spiral earrings, rosettes and necklaces, in their hollow cave, and round it the stream of ocean flowed, boiling with foam and boundless, nor was anyone else, whether god or mortal man, aware of my presence, only the Tees knew, and Euronome. They who'd saved me. Now herself has come to our house, and I have a great need to repay fair trust that is fully for having saved my life. So you set before her our best entertainment for a guest, while I put away my bellows and all my working tools. 
With that, he rose from his anvil, hard breathing, bulky, limping, yet under him his stunted legs moved lightly. His bellows he put well away from the fire, and all his tools that he worked with he stored in a silver chest. Then with a sponge he cleaned his face and both his hands, and his bull neck and shaggy breast, and put on a tunic, and chose a thick stick, and took himself to the door, limping, and quickly there moved to support their master handmaids of gold, in the likeness of young living girls. There was mind and intelligence in them, they could speak, they had bodily strength, the immortal gods taught them skills. Now they bustled around their lord, while he limped across to where the tees was, sat down on a shining chair, took her hand in his, and greeted her with these words, What, long-robed the tees, brings you now to our house? Though a dear and respected friend, you've not visited us before. Tell me what's on your mind, my heart bids me fulfill it if fulfill it I can, and if it's fulfillable. The tees then answered him, weeping, Is there any goddess today, Hephaistos, of all those on Olympos? Who's endured so many grievous sorrows in her heart as the woes that Zeus son of Kronos has given me, far beyond all others? Of all marine nymphs only me he made wed a mortal, Peleus, Iacos' son, I endured that mortal's bed greatly against my will. Now he lies in his halls, broken up by wretched old age, but today there are other woes I endure. A son indeed he gave me, to bear and to bring up, preeminent among heroes, like a sapling he shot up, and when, like a tree on an orchard knoll, I'd reared him, I sent him out here to Ilion in the curved ships. To fight the Trojans, but now I'll never welcome him back to his home. He'll never return to the house of Peleus. Now. While he still lives and sees the sunlight he has sorrow, nor can I be of help by going to him. That girl given him as a prize by the Achaean sons has been snatched back out of his hands by the Lord Agamemnon. In grief for her he was eating his heart out, then the Trojans penned the Achaeans in by their ship's sterns, would not let them break out. The Argive elders appealed to him for help, detailed by name the many rich presents they'd offer, he himself still refused to keep disaster from them, but instead arrayed Patroclos in his own armour, and sent him to fight the war, with many men besides. The whole day long they struggled around the Scurrian gates, and that day they'd have sacked the city, had not Apollo. After much damage done by Menoetios's brave son, killed him in the front line, giving Hector the credit. This is why I now beg you, clasping your knees, to agree to make my short-lived son a shield and a helmet. And a corslet and fine greaves equipped with ankle pieces, for the gear he once possessed his trusty comrade lost when slain by the Trojans. And now he lies heartbroken on the ground. The far-famed lame of both legs God then answered her, Don't despair, and don't let these matters become a burden on your mind. I just wish that I could conceal him, far away from grievous death, when his dread fate comes on him, as surely as now he'll get his fine new armour, such gear that in time to come all mankind will be thunderstruck at the sight of it. So saying, he left her there, and went back to where his bellows were, turned them to face the fire, gave them their working orders, and the bellows, twenty all told, blew through their nozzles, sending out blasts of air from every angle, at times to support Hephaistos's quick actions, or again to do whatever he needed to make his work complete. Into the fire he now cast solid bronze and tin, silver, and precious gold, next he set a large anvil to stand on its anvil block, and then grasped in one hand a weighty hammer, in the other his forging tongs. First he fashioned a shield. Both huge and sturdy, adorned intricately all over, and around it set a bright rim, three-layered, and glinting, complete with silver baldric. Five were the layers of the shield itself, and on it with consummate skill he set a number of decorations. On it he fashioned the earth, the sea, and the heavens, the unwearying sun, the moon on its increase to full, and every constellation with which the heavens are crowned, the Pleiades, the Hyades, the majesty of Auron, and the bear, that's also known to mankind as the wane, that revolves in one place, keeping a watchful eye on Auron, and alone never sinks into the baths of ocean. On it he also fashioned two cities of humankind, fine ones, in the first there were marriages and banquets with brides being led from their quarters by flaring torchlight through the city, to the accompaniment of many a wedding song, and young men a whirl in the dance, while for them the pipes and lyres played on without stopping. And the women stood at their doors. Admiring spectators. There was a crowd of citizens drawn to the meeting place, a dispute had arisen between two men, at loggerheads over the blood price of a man who'd been killed, one claimed, in a public speech, to have paid it all but the other swore he'd been given nothing, and both were determined to win the arbitrator's verdict. People were backing both sides, cheering one or the other, while heralds held them back, and the elders were sitting on polished seats of stone in the sacred circle, the loud-voiced herald's staffs in their hands, holding these they would rise to deliver judgment, each in turn, 
and there between them were set two talents of gold, to go to the one who delivered the fairest verdict. But around the other city there lay two bodies of troops, a gleam in their armour, divided by two competing plans, should they lay the place waste, or share between both sides all the wealth that this lovely city contained. However, the besieged would have none of it, were arming for an ambush. The ramparts were manned by their dear wives and children, and along with them such men as were crippled by old age, but the rest were out after action, led by Ars and Athene, both of gold, and golden the raiment in which they were clad, handsome and tall in their armour, as befits gods, and clearly visible all around, the men below them were smaller. When they reached the spot where they'd chosen to set their ambush, in a riverbed, with a watering place for flocks and herds, then they settled down, all of them, armoured in gleaming bronze, and two scouts were posted. Some way from the main body, to watch out for a glimpse of the sheep and well-fed cattle. These very soon arrived, and with them a pair of herdsmen playing their pipes, unaware of the trap. Then the ambushers, when they saw them coming, charged out, and in a trice cut off the herded cattle, the splendid flocks of white-fleeced sheep, and slaughtered both the herdsmen. The besiegers, now hearing loud tumult among the cattle from the meeting place where they sat, mounted at once behind their high-stepping horses, set off, and quickly reached them. Then they halted, and fought there beside the river's banks, letting fly, each side of the other, with their bronze-tipped spears, and strife and tumult mixed with them, and the baneful death spirit, seizing one man alive, but wounded, another without a wound, yet another dragged through the turmoil, dead. By the feet, and the shift strife wore round her shoulders was scarlet with men's blood, like living mortals they engaged and fought. And each of them dragged off bodies that the others had slain. On it he also fashioned a broad field of rich ploughland, soft-soiled, thrice ploughed from fallow, with many ploughmen on it, turning their teams, driving them up and down, and when, at the turning point, they reached the edge of the field, then a man would come up and hand them a cup of wine, honey sweet, and the ploughmen would speed to the furrow's end, eager to reach the turn in the deep soil, and behind them the field grew black, as though it had really been ploughed, though made of gold, here indeed was marvellous artistry. On it he also fashioned a royal estate, where farmhands were reaping, sharp sickles in hand. Of the cut swathes some were falling in rows, along the line of the furrow, while others the sheaf binders were tying with twists of straw. Three binders stood there ready, while behind them boys collected the swathes and delivered them, by the armful, without pause. And all the time the king stood by. In silence, at the line of the swathes, staff in hand, and happy at heart. Away under an oak tree were heralds, preparing a feast, dressing a great ox that they'd sacrificed, while women lavishly sprinkled white barley upon it for the farmhand's dinner. On it he also fashioned a vineyard, lush with clusters, fine and golden, black the bunched grapes, while the vines were propped up throughout on silver poles. Around it he set a ditch, done in cobalt enamel, and outside that a fence made of tin, with one path to the vineyard on which the great pickers went to and fro when harvesting the vines, and he had girls and boys, all innocently light-hearted, carrying the honey sweet fruit in wicker baskets, while in the midst of them a boy with a clear-toned lyre made sweet music, and accompanied his own singing, soft and exquisite, of the lino song, while they, stamping the beat and shouting, danced along after him. On it he also set a herd of straight-horned cattle, the cows were fashioned out of gold and tin and went eagerly, lowing, on their way from byre to pasture beside a rushing river, a rippling reed bed. Of gold were the herdsmen accompanying the cattle, four of them, together with nine swift-footed dogs. But among the foremost cattle two fearsome lions had got hold of a noisy bull, which, bellowing loudly, was being dragged off, with dogs and youths in hot pursuit. The lions had ripped up the great bull's hide and were gobbling its innards and black blood, while the herdsmen tried, in vain, to scare them urging on their swift dogs, but these fought shy of biting the lions, instead they ran up close, barking, then swerved aside. On it the far-famed lame of both legs God made a pasture in a charming glen, a large pasture of white-fleeced sheep along with their sheepfolds and pens and covered shelters. On it the far-famed lame of both legs God subtly inlaid a dancing floor like the one in spacious nossos that long ago Didalos fashioned for, fair tressed Ariadne. Here were young men, with maidens worth many oxen in bride price, dancing. Hands on each other's wrists, the girls robed in fine linen, while the men wore fine woven tunics, softly gleaming from worked in oil, and the girls had on sweet garlands, the men their daggers of gold, suspended from silver baldricks. Now they would dance in a circle, feet well skilled, very lightly, as when a potter sits at a wheel that matches his hand's grasp, and tries it, to see how it will run, and now they'd approach each other in dancing lines while a crowd of spectators stood round them, 
much enjoying such an elegant dance, and among them a sacred bard sang to his lyre, and two tumblers whirled among them, taking the lead in all their sport and pleasure. On it he also set the mighty stream of ocean to run round the outermost rim of this strongly fashioned shield. Then, when he'd finished the shield, both large and solid, he forged him a corslet more bright than the blaze of fire, and forged him a heavy helmet to fit his temples closely. A fine piece. Cunningly wrought, with a golden crest set on it, and lastly fashioned him greaves, made out of pliant tin. The far-famed lame of both legs god, this battle gear all finished, took it and laid it before Achilles' mother, who then swooped down like a hawk from the high snows of Olympos, bringing from Hephaestos the glinting armor he'd made. Book 19. Now saffron-robed dawn rose up from ocean streams to bring light to the immortals and to mortal mankind, and the tees arrived at the ships bearing the gods' gifts. She found her beloved son lying clasping Patroclos to him, and weeping loudly, while round him large numbers of his comrades were shedding tears too. The bright goddess came among them, stood at his side, clasped his hand, and spoke to him, saying, My child, this man we must let lie, for all our sorrow, since from the start it was the gods that willed his death. Accept rather now, from Hephaestos, this splendid armour, fine gear, such as never man yet wore upon his shoulders. So saying, the goddess set down the pieces of armor in front of Achilles, each rang clear in its intricate splendor. Trembling swept through the Myrmidons, no man dared to look directly at them, but flinched away. As Achilles viewed them, his wrath swelled further, his eyes glared out terribly under their lids. Like blazing fire. And he rejoiced as he handled these dazzling gifts from the god. But when, to his mind, he'd spent enough time admiring their workmanship, then to his mother he spoke winged words, Mother, these arms the gods given me are such as immortal work should be, what no mortal could accomplish. Now indeed I shall arm myself. Yet I'm desperately anxious for the valiant son of Menoitios, lest meanwhile flies may enter the wounds that the bronze has inflicted on him, engender worms there, to outrage his body, now that the life's killed from it, and so all his flesh will rot. Then the goddess, silver footed the tees, replied, My child, don't let these things bother your mind. I'll take good care to fend off from his body those savage tribes, the flies that feed on the flesh of men lately slain in battle. Suppose that he lies for a year's full cycle, his flesh will remain fresh and whole, or even better than now. But first you must call the Achaean heroes to assembly and renounce your rage against Agamemnon. The people's shepherd, that done, you can arm yourself for battle, be clad in valor. So saying, she filled him with dauntless strength, while for Patroclos she dripped ambrosia and red nectar through his nostrils, to keep his flesh forever unspoiled. Along the seashore he went now, did noble Achilles, shouting scarily loud, to alert the Achaean heroes, and even those who before had stayed where the ships were hauled up, the steersmen, those who handled the ship's steering oars, or the ship's stewards, who served out rations, all now made their way to the meeting place, since Achilles had appeared, after long abstention from grievous battle. Two men, veterans both, came limping in together, Tydeus' son, steadfast fighter, and noble Odysseus, both of them leaning on spears, since their wounds still hurt them, and went and sat down in the front of the assembly. Last of all there arrived the lord of men, Agamemnon. He too nursing a wound, in the grind of battle he'd been hit by the bronze-tipped spear of Kuhn. Antinor's son. Then, when all the Achaeans were gathered together, swift-footed Achilles stood up and addressed them, saying, Son of Atreus, was it really the best thing for both of us, for you, for me, that we too, grief-filled as we were, should rage on in heart-eating strife because of a girl? I wish she'd been killed by an arrow from Artemis that day at the ships when I chose her, after sacking Lernesos. Fewer Achaeans then would have bitten the boundless earth at the enemy's hands, on account of my fierce wrath. Good news, this, for the Trojans and Hector, but the Achaeans will long, I think, remember the strife between you and me. Still, despite our grief, we'll treat this as past and done with, restraining, as now we must, the spirit in our breasts. So now I renounce my wrath, that I should rage on forever unrelentingly is not fitting. Come then. Waste no time, urge on the long-haired Achaeans into battle, let me, once again, face these Trojans, make trial of them. Find out if they're still ready to spend a night by the ships, though I think there are some who'll be happy to rest their knees, those who escape my spear, and the struggle of battle. So he spoke, and the well-grieved Achaeans all rejoiced, because Peleus's great-hearted son had abandoned his wrath. There then addressed them the lord of men, Agamemnon, from the place where he sat, not standing up among them, my friends, you Danan heroes, you henchmen of ours. 
it's good to hear out a man on his feet, nor is it seemly to interrupt him, vexation to even a skilled speaker. Against the clamour of many how can a man either listen or speak? He's disabled, however clear his voice. It's to Pelis's son I'll declare myself, but you other Argives should pay attention to, and mark my words, all of you. Many times have the Achaeans addressed me in the same terms. Reviling me, yet it's not I who am the one at fault, but rather Zeus, and fate, and some night-walking fury, who in the assembly cast wild delusion on my mind that day when, acting alone, I took his prize from Achilles. But what could I do? It's a god that fulfills all matters, Zeus's eldest daughter, delusion, who blinds all mortals, a cursed creature, with delicate feet, for it's never the ground she touches, she treads on the heads of men, damaging mortals' minds, has trapped others before me. Indeed, she once blinded Zeus, though men declare him the greatest of men and gods both, him even here, though only a woman, deceived by her crafty whiles the day when that mighty force Heracles was due to be born, to Alcmene, in they with its fair crown of walls. Zeus spoke in boastful tones, among all the gods, listen to me, every god, and all you goddesses, while I tell you what the heart in my breast now bids me say. Ilethia, spirit of birth pangs. Today will bring to the light a man who will rule over all those dwelling about him. One of that line of men whose ancestry is my own. To him, with deception in mind, lady here then declared, you'll turn out a liar, once more not see your words fulfilled. Very well, then, Olympian, swear me a strong oath that he'll truly rule over all those dwelling about him, he who today drops between the feet of a woman and is of the line whose blood is also your own. So she spoke, but Zeus failed to understand her deception, and swore a great oath, and thus was greatly deluded. Now here swooped down from the peaks of high Olympos, and quickly made her way to Achaean Argos, where, she knew, was the noble wife of Perseus's son Sthenelos, then pregnant with a son, and her seventh month had come. This child here brought out, though its months were incomplete, while delaying Alcmene's delivery, restraining her birth pangs. Then she herself broke the news to Zeus, the son of Cronos, Zeus, father, lord of the bright thunderbolt. Just let me drop a word in your mind. A great man indeed is born, will be lord of the Argives, Eurystheus, Sthenelos's son, Perseus's grandson, your line, so not unfit to rule Argos. So she spoke, and sharp pain struck him, deep in his mind, and promptly he seized delusion by her glossotressed head, infuriated at heart, and swore a powerful oath that never more to Olympos and the starry heavens should delusion come, she who blinds all. So saying, he flung her down from the starry heavens, whirling her round with one hand, and soon she reached human soil. Ever after Zeus groaned at the thought of her, when he saw his son demeaned by the tasks that Eurystheus set him. So I too, then. At the time bright-helmeted Hector was busy slaughtering Argives at the sterns of their ships, could not forget delusion, by whom I was first blinded. But since blinded I was, and robbed of good sense by Zeus, I'm willing to make amends, to give recompense past counting. So up with you to the battle, rouse the rest of your troops. Gifts I'm ready to offer you, all that you were promised by noble Odysseus earlier when he came to your hut. Or wait a bit, if you'd rather, eager to fight though you are, an attendant will gather and fetch you these gifts from my ships, to let you see that I'll give you what will satisfy your heart. Then in answer to him swift-footed Achilles declared, most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon lord of men, as regards the gifts, if you want to, present them, as is proper, or keep them, your choice. But for now. Let's turn to battle right away. We've no business to sit here wasting our time in idle chatter when there's great work still to be done. As each of you once again sees Achilles among the foremost. With his bronze spear spreading death through the ranks of the Trojans, let him have that in mind as he battles his own opponent. In answer to him resourceful Odysseus now said, Do not thus, godlike Achilles, brave warrior though you are, urge the Achaean sons to go against Ilion fasting to fight the Trojans, since it's for no short time that this struggle will last, from when the warriors' ranks first engage and the god breathes might into either side. Rather command the Achaeans by their swift ships to consume both food and wine first, for in them is strength and courage. No man through the livelong day, till the setting of the sun, will be able to stand and fight who hasn't eaten, for though in his heart he may be eager for battle, yet his limbs unawares grow heavy, hunger and thirst come on him, while as he moves his knees get weaker. But the man who's taken his fill of wine and food can fight with enemy warriors all day long, the heart in his breast still steadfast. His limbs don't tire until everyone's disengaged from the business of fighting. 
Come then, dismiss the troops, give the order to make ready their meal, and as for the gifts, the lord of men, Agamemnon, should have them brought to the meeting place, where all the Achaeans can see them, and your heart may be comforted, and let him stand up and swear an oath before the Argives, that he never went into that woman's bed nor lay with her, as is the custom, my lord, between men and women, and let the heart in your own breast be gracious. Let him give you a feast in his hut by way of amendment, a lavish one, that you may lack nothing that's due to you. And you, son of Atreus, will be more just in future to others, there's nothing blameworthy in a king, when he's started the trouble, making amends to any man. Then the lord of men, Agamemnon, answered him, saying, I'm very glad, son of Let's. To have heard your speech, all you set forth and discussed was properly stated. This oath I'm ready to swear, my heart bids me do so, nor will I perjure myself to a deity. But Achilles should stay here, however eager he may be for battle, and all the rest of you too, until the gifts are fetched from my hut, and we pledge ourselves in solemn agreement. And you yourself I charge with this duty, that you choose the best young warriors out of all the Achaeans to bring the gifts from my ship, all that earlier we promised to bestow on Achilles, and also to fetch the women. And in the Achaeans' broad camp let Tolthibios right now prepare a boar, to sacrifice to Zeus and the sun. Then swift-footed Achilles made answer to him, saying, Most glorious son of Atreus, Agamemnon lord of men, better at some other time for you to fix these matters, when perhaps there's a break in the fighting, when at least the rage in my breast's less intense. But at this moment they are lying there, flesh rent open. All those warriors that Priam's son Hector slew when Zeus gave him his glory. And you two are saying we should eat. If I had my way I'd tell the Achaean sons to join battle, here and now, fasting, and fed, and then, when the sun went down, to prepare their great feast, when we'd wiped out this defilement. But until that moment, down my own throat at least, neither food nor drink will pass, now my comrade is dead, who lies in my hut, flesh rent by the keen-edged bronze, feet facing the door, while around him our companions shed tears. So it's not such things that at all concern me now, but killing, and blood, and the groans of dying men. Then in answer to him resourceful Odysseus said, Ah, Achilles, Pelis' son, far the greatest of the Achaeans, you are stronger than me, and greater by no small measure with the spear, but as for wisdom, I'd far surpass you, since I'm the older man, with much more knowledge, so let your heart be receptive to what I have to say. Mankind very soon gets surfeited with its crop of fighting, the stalks of which the bronze spreads in plenty on the ground, but the harvest is all too small, since the scales are tipped by Zeus, who is for mankind the steward of warfare. No way by denying the belly can Achaeans mourn a corpse, too many, one after another, are endlessly falling day after day. When would anyone get a respite? No, what we have to do is to bury our casualties, harden our hearts, shed tears on that one day only. And all those of us who survive the loathsome struggle must be mindful of drink and food. That we may the better battle it out with our enemies, forever, unceasingly, flesh clad in the stubborn bronze. Let no one of our troops hold off from action while awaiting some other order, there's one order only, he'll betide any man who hangs back at the ships of the Argives. Let's all advance together, and raise a sharp battle against these horse-breaking Trojans. That said, he took with him far-famed Nestor's sons, and Phileas's son Megs, and Thoas, and Meriones, and Crayon's son Lycomedes, and Melanippos, and they made their way to the hut of Atreus's son Agamemnon. The word had been given, and straightway the thing was done, seven tripods they fetched from the hut, as he'd promised Achilles, a score of bright cauldrons, a dozen horses, and then quickly they led out the women, skilled in fine handiwork, seven there were of these, with fair cheek Briseis the eighth. Odysseus weighed out gold, ten talents in all, and led off. While the other Achaean warriors carried the gifts, and set them down in the midst of the meeting place. Then Agamemnon rose, while Tolthibios, a man whose voice was like a god's, stood, with the boar in his hands, beside the people's shepherd. The son of Atreus now grasped and drew the knife that always hung at the side of his sword's great scabbard, cut the first ritual hairs from the boar, and raising his hands prayed to Zeus, while every Argive sat silent in his place, as was right and proper, ears alert to the king, who now, looking up to the broad heavens, made his prayer, let Zeus, first, be my witness highest and best of gods, and earth, and sun, and the furies that underground exact retribution from those men. Who swear false oaths, that never did I lay hands on the girl Briseis, either to bed her, or with any other intention, and that she's remained untouched all the time she's been in my huts. If any of this is sworn falsely, may the gods give me all the many griefs they inflict on perjurers in their name. 
That said, he cut the boar's throat with the pitiless bronze, and the body Tolphibio swung round and hurled into the grey sea's wide gulf, food for fishes. Then Achilles stood up and spoke among the battle-minded Argives, Zeus, father, great the delusions with which you visit mankind. Not otherwise would the son of Atreus have so stirred up the heart in my breast, nor would he have taken the girl against my will, so determinedly, it may be that Zeus was set on bringing death to large numbers of Achaeans. Go eat your meal now, and then let's move to battle. So he spoke, and broke up this very brief assembly. The rest all scattered, each man to his own vessel, while the great-hearted Myrmidons busied themselves with the gifts, and carried them off to the ship of godlike Achilles. Some they stowed in the huts, and settled the women there, while stalwart henchmen drove off the horses to the herd. But now Briseis, the image of golden Aphrod. When she saw Patroclos, his flesh all rent by the sharp bronze, flung herself on him, keening shrilly, her hands tearing her breasts and tender neck and lovely face, and amid her weeping this woman, so like a goddess, exclaimed, Patroclos, in my misery the man most dear to my heart, it was living I left you when last I went out from the hut. And now, great leader, it's dead I return to find you. Thus in my life does trouble always breed trouble, the husband bestowed on me by my father and lady mother I saw rent by the sharp bronze in front of our city, and the three men who were born to that self-same mother, my much-loved brothers, all these met their day of death. Yet you'd not even let me weep when swift Achilles killed my husband and sacked the city of godlike minds, you said you'd see me the lawful wedded wife of godlike Achilles, you'd take me back on your ships to Thea and hold a marriage feast for me among the Myrmidons. So I mourn your death without cease, you were always kind to me. So she spoke, weeping, the women lamented with her, for Patroclos professedly, but each one for her own sorrows. Meanwhile the Achaean elders gathered around Achilles, all imploring him to eat, but he refused them, sobbing, I beg you, if any of you, my dearest comrades, will listen, please. Please don't tell me to glut my heart with food or drink. Now this terrible grief has come upon me, until sundown I shall remain thus, and endure, whatever. So saying, he sent away all the other princes, except the two sons of Atreus, who stayed, as did noble Odysseus, and Nestor and Idomeneus and Phoenix the old horseman, to comfort him in his great sorrow, but not one whit would his heart be comforted till he'd entered war's bloody jaws, and as he reflected, he heaved a deep sigh, and said, Time was when you, so ill-fated, my dearest comrade, would yourself lay out an enjoyable meal in our hut, quickly and skillfully, when the Achaeans were impatient to bring grievous warfare against the horse-breaking Trojans. But now here you lie, flesh rent, and my heart's indifferent to food and drink, though both are to hand, through yearning for you, no other worse thing is there that I could suffer, not even news of the death of my own father, who now perhaps in Thea is shedding heavy round tears for the loss of a son such as I am who now in a foreign land, all because of hateful Helen, am at war with the Trojans, not even were it my own dear son, now being raised on Skyros, if indeed it is true that godlike Neoptolemos still lives. Until now the heart in my breast had cherished the hope that I alone should die far from horse-grazing Argos, here at Troy, but that you should return to Thea, and that you'd pick up my son in your swift black ship from Skyros, and show him everything that was mine my possessions, my servants, my splendid high-roofed house, since by now I suppose that Peleus must either be at last dead, or, if barely alive still, bowed down by the inroads of loathsome old age, and by waiting forever to hear unhappy tidings of me, that at last I've perished. So he spoke, weeping, the old men lamented with him, remembering, each of them, all that he'd left back at home, and as they mourned, the son of Cronos observed them, was moved to pity, and quickly spoke winged words to Athene, my child you're completely neglecting your favourite mortal. Do you no longer have the least care in your heart for Achilles? There he sits, in front of his high stern vessels, in mourning for his dear comrade, the others indeed have all gone to dinner, but he stays fasting and foodless. So off with you now, dribble nectar and sweet ambrosia into his breast, so that hunger may not come on him. So saying, he encouraged Athene, herself already most eager, and she, like a shearwater, long-winged and raucous-voiced swooped down through the high air from heaven. The Achaeans were promptly arming throughout the camp. While she into Achilles' breast dribbled nectar and sweet ambrosia in order that joyless hunger should not come upon his knees. Then she herself was gone to the strong abode of her mighty father, while from their ships the Achaeans poured out. As when, thick and fast, Zeus's snowflakes come floating down, ice cold, and driven by the skyborne north wind's blast, so now, Thick and fast, the brightly gleaming helmets emerged from the ships, and with them the bossed shields, the well-plated corslets and the ashwood spears. 
their radiance shone up to heaven, all the earth around was stirred to laughter by the bright bronze. And a din rose from under men's tramping feet, in their midst was noble Achilles, arming himself, teeth grinding, eyes all ablaze like flames of fire, while into his heart there now entered unbearable grief. Enraged at the Trojans, he now put on the gods' gifts, that Hephaistos had labored hard to make him. The greaves first he fastened on about his shins, finely worked, and fitted with silver ankle pieces. Next, to cover his chest, he put on the corslet. About his shoulders he slung the silver-studded sword, of bronze, then came the shield, both huge and sturdy, from which gleamed afar a brightness like the moon's. As out at sea the gleam is visible to sailors of a burning fire, one alight high up in the mountains, in some lonely farmhouse, but they cannot stop the gale from driving them over the teeming deep, far distant from their friends, so a gleam went skyward from Achilles' shield, so fine, so intricate. Then he lifted the mighty helmet and set it upon his head, it shone like a star. This helmet with horsehair crest, and around it there waved the lovely gold plumes that Hephaistos had set thick about its crown. Then noble Achilles tested himself in his armour to see if it fitted well, if his lithe limbs had free movement, and it buoyed him like wings, delighting the people's shepherd. Lastly he drew from its stand his father's spear, weighty and huge and massive. No other Achaean could wield it, only Achilles could manage its handling, that spear of Pelion ashwood that Chaian gave his dear father, felled on Pelion's summit, to embody death for heroes. Alchemos and Automedon were about the business of yoking the horses, fitting fine girth straps, thrusting the bits between their jaws. Now they drew back the reins to the dovetailed chariot, then grasping the bright whip that fitted his hand Automedon sprang aboard, to the driver's place, and behind him, armed and ready, came Achilles, a gleam in his battle gear like Hyperion the bright sun. And called out in a terrible voice to his father's horses, Xanthos and Balios. Famed offspring of Podarge. Think of some other way to bring your charioteer back safe to the Danan camp when we're through with fighting, don't leave him dead there, as you did Patroclos. Then from under the yoke the fleet-footed horse addressed him, Xanthos, he bent his head sharply, and all his manes streamed to the ground from the yoke pad, on both sides of the yoke, and the goddess, white-armed here, made him articulate, yes, this time we'll bring you back safely, mighty Achilles. But the day of your death is near, though we shall not be its cause, but rather a great god and all-mastering fate. It was through no slowness or sloth of ours that the Trojans succeeded in stripping the armour from Patroclos's shoulders. It was the best of the gods, whom fair-hired Leto bore, that slew him among the frontliners, gave Hector the glory. We too could run with the speed of the west wind's blast, which, they say, is the swiftest of all. But you yourself are destined to be laid low by a god's might. And a man's. When he'd said this, the Furies cut off his power of speech. Then, deeply moved, swift-footed Achilles addressed him, Xanthos, why foretell my death? You need not do so. I know well myself that it's my fate to perish here, far from my father and mother. But nevertheless I shan't stop till I've driven the Trojans to their fill of war. With a shout, out among the foremost he urged on his whole hoof team. Book 20 so by the curved ships, and around you, Pelias's son, never glutted with fighting, the Achaeans were arming themselves, and across from them likewise the Trojans, on the rise of the plain. Zeus meanwhile ordered the mist to call the gods to assembly from high, many clefted Olympos. She went around everywhere, with the message that they should come into Zeus's own abode. Not a single river was absent, save only ocean, nor any of all the nymphs that frequent the lovely groves, the sources of rivers, the grassy meadows. So when they arrived at the abode of Zeus the cloud-gatherer, they sat down in the polished stone porticos that Hephaistos with cunning expertise had built there for Zeus, the father. Thus they gathered in Zeus's house, nor did the earthshaker ignore the goddess's summons, but came from the sea to join them, sat in their midst, asked Zeus what his purpose was, why, lord of the bright bolt. Have you once more summoned the gods to assembly? Are you concerned about the Trojans and Achaeans? Since battle and warfare are close to flaring up between them? In answer to him then Zeus the cloud-gatherer said, You know, Earthshaker, what's on my mind, the reason I summoned you all, they're dying, yes. I'm concerned for them. Even so, I myself will stay here, in a glen of Olympos, seated, enjoying the spectacle. As for the rest of you, take yourselves off now, among the Trojans or the Achaeans, give aid to either side, whichever one you prefer. Should Achilles, even alone, now fight against the Trojans, they won't for one moment stop Peleus's swift-footed son, why, even before, 
they shook just at the sight of him, and now, when his heart so enraged by his comrade's death I fear he may override fate, and storm their ramparts too. So saying, the son of Cronos stirred up unending warfare. Battle wards now went the gods, but with purposes divided, here to where the ships were beached, and with her palace Athene, Poseidon the earth encircler. Hermes the helper, who for smart thinking excels all others, accompanied by Hephaistos, exultant in his strength, limping, but under him his stunted legs moved lightly. To the Trojans went bright-helmeted Ars, and with him Phoibos, whose hair is unshorn, and Artemis the archer, and Leto and Xanthos and smiling Aphrot. For so long as the gods stayed apart from mortal men the Achaeans kept winning great glory, now that Achilles had appeared. After lengthy absence from the grievous struggle, while dread trembling came on the limbs of every Trojan when, terrified, they caught sight of Pelis's swift-footed son agleam in his battle gear, a match for ours the killer. But when the Olympians entered this throng of warriors, and strife sprang up, that strong rouser of nations, then Athene cried out aloud, now standing by the ditch dug outside the wall, and now on the thunderous shore, she gave her long battle cry. Ars bellowed as well, on the other side, black as a storm cloud. Now from the topmost ramparts he urged the Trojans on. And now as he hastened by Simoes toward Calicolon. So both sides now did the blessed gods encourage to clash head on, and broke out oppressive strife between them. Fearsomely thundered the father of men and of gods from on high, while down below Poseidon caused the boundless earth to quake, and the lofty mountain peaks, all the foothills of spring-rich Ida were shaken, and all her heights, and the Trojan city, and the Achaeans ships. In the underworld fear now gripped Hades, lord of the dead, he leapt from his throne in panic and cried out, lest above him the ground be split open by Poseidon the earth shaker, and his own realm be laid bare to both gods and mortals, dreadful and dank, abhorred even by the gods themselves. Huge now was the crash when God faced God in strife, for lined up against the lord Poseidon there stood Phoebos Apollo, winged arrows clutched in his hand, and against Inyalios the grey-eyed goddess Athene. While here was faced by her of the loud chase. The golden arrows, Artemis. Archer herself, the deadly archer's sister. Arrayed against Leto was the mighty helper Hermes, and against Hephaistos the great deep eddying river known to the gods as Xanthos, but as Scamandros by mortals. Thus gods went forth to stand against gods, but Achilles was hungry to confront, above all, in the general mass. Priam's son Hector, his heart was dead set on glutting ours, that war god with oxide shield, on Hector's blood. However, it was Aeneas whom Apollo, rouser of troops, sent straight against Pelias's son, and filled with mighty power. Making his voice resemble that of Priam's son Lycaon, in his likeness Apollo, son of Zeus, now spoke to Aeneas, Aeneas, the Trojan's counsellor, where now are those threats you once made to the Trojan lords while you were drinking, that you'd fight, man to man, against Pelias's son Achilles? Then Aeneas in answer spoke to him in these words, son of Priam, why urge me on, when I'm not so minded? To match myself against Pelias's all too arrogant son? This would not be the first time I've faced swift footed Achilles, once before this he drove me headlong with his spear from Ida. That time when he'd come out against our cattle and sacked both Lanesos and Pedasos, but Zeus saved me, stirred up my strength, put swiftness into my knees. Else I'd have surely been slain at the hands of Achilles and Athene, who went before him as his protector, urged him to kill with his bronze spear both Lelages and Trojans. Look, no mere man can meet Achilles in battle, since there's always some god beside him, warding off trouble. Besides this, his spear flies straight, and never rests till it's gone through some human flesh. But supposing a god were to stretch warfare's outcome evenly, then he'd not beat me with ease, though he claimed to be made all of bronze. To him then replied Zeus's son, the lord Apollo, well, hero, you too can boast to the gods who are forever for they say that it was Zeus's daughter Aphrod who bore you, while Achilles is the son of a lesser goddess, your mother being Zeus's daughter. While his has as her father the old man of the sea. So, at him, with your unyielding bronze. Don't let him scare you off with words of scorn or contempt. So saying he breathed great strength into the people's shepherd, who now joined the foremost fighters, armoured in gleaming bronze. Nor did Anchises' son go unnoticed by white-armed here as he went through the mass of troops to confront the son of Peleus. She called the gods together, and addressed them, saying, It's you too, Poseidon, Athene, who now have need to figure out in your minds how these matters are to be. Aeneas here has marched out, armoured in gleaming bronze, to confront Peleus's son, spurred on by Phoebos Apollo. So come, let's either turn him back here and now, or else one of us should likewise stand by Achilles, and endow him with mighty strength, 
Let his heart lack nothing, let him know that those who love him are the finest of the immortals. While it's mere windbags who till now have fended off warfare and fighting from the Trojans. We've all come down from Olympos to play our part in this battle. So that Achilles may suffer no hurt from the Trojans today, though later he'll suffer whatever fate spun for him at his birth, when his mother bore him. But if Achilles isn't told this, by some god in person, he'll take fright later on, if a god comes up against him in battle. Gods are terrifying when visible as themselves. Then Poseidon the Earthshaker answered her, saying, Here, don't be enraged beyond reason, you've no need to. Myself, I wouldn't choose to have the gods clash in strife, us versus the rest, since we're by far the stronger. So I think we should leave the beaten track for a spot to watch from, sit down there, let humans get on with the war. Yet if ours starts up a fight, or Phoebos Apollo, or they hold Achilles back, won't allow him to fight, then from us too they'll be hit by the burgeoning strife of battle, quite soon, I think, they'll pull out from the fighting and scuttle back to Olympos, to the other gods gathering. Overwhelmed by the irresistible force of our hands. With that the dark-maned deity led the way to where there stood those heaped-up ramparts named for Heracles the godlike, the high wall built for him by the Trojans and Pallas Athene, to provide him a refuge in his flight from the sea beast when it chased him from the seashore onto the plain. There the other gods and Poseidon sat themselves down, wrapping their shoulders about with a dense unbroken cloud, while the opposing group settled on the brow of Calicolone, round you. Phoebos the archer, and ours, sacker of cities. So they sat there on opposite sides, still busily planning their strategies, yet to plunge into grievous warfare both sides were reluctant, though Zeus on high urged them on. By now the whole plain was filled with the glinting bronze of men and horses, the earth resounded beneath their feet as both sides charged as one. The two best of all these fighters faced each other, eager to fight, out there in the middle, Aeneas son of Anchises and noble Achilles. Aeneas was first to emerge, with threatening mien, his weighty helmet's plumes nodding, his warlike shield held in front of his body, he was wielding a spear of bronze. Opposing him, Peleus's son came at him like a lion, a ravening beast, that men are determined to kill, the whole neighbourhood in a body. At first he goes on his way, uncaring, but when some youth, a brisk fighter, throws his spear and hits him, then he crouches, jaws open. Foam gathering round his teeth, the mighty spirit groans within his heart. With his tail he lashes his ribs and flanks on either side, works himself up for the coming fight, and then, eyes glaring, charges straight ahead in his raging power, to kill some man, or himself to die among the foremost. Just so Achilles' own strength and proud heart impelled him to come out and confront great-hearted Aeneas. When they were close, as the two of them moved one against the other, the first to speak was swift-footed Achilles, Aeneas, why have you come so far out, away from the main body, to make a stand here? Does your spirit urge you to fight me in the hope of becoming lord, among the Trojan horsebreakers, of Priam's power? But supposing you were to kill me, not even for that would Priam place his realm in your hands. He has sons, he's of sound mind, he isn't crazy. Or have the Trojans marked you out an estate that outstrips all others, fine both for orchard and plowland, for you to possess if you slay me? That, I think. You'd find a tough task. Once in the past, I'd remind you, I put you to flight with my spear, don't you remember? When you were alone and I sent you scampering headlong down Ida's slopes as you ran from me. Then you fled to Lernesos, but I, with Athene and Zeus the father, assaulted and sacked it, led its women captive, took their day of freedom from them, while you were rescued by Zeus and the other gods. But now, I think, they won't rescue you, as in your heart you fondly imagine, so go off back, I urge you, into the common crowd. Don't confront me here, before you suffer some hurt, what's done even fools can recognize. Then Aeneas in his turn now answered him, declaring, Son of Peleus, don't try to frighten me like a child with mere words, since I too know very well myself how to frame the language of taunts and unseemly abuse. We each know the other's lineage, we know his parents, through hearing the tale of old from mortal tellers, yet you've never set eyes on my parents. Nor I on yours. They say that you're the offspring of peerless Peleus, and your mother is fair Trestetes, the sea goddess, while I claim I am the son of the great-hearted Anchises, and that my mother is Aphrot. Of these one pair will be weeping for a beloved son this very day, for it won't be with mere childish insults that we two settle our business and return from battle. Still, if you insist, hear this too, and gain full knowledge of our ancestry, something many men know already. Dardano's first was begotten by Zeus the cloud-gatherer and founded Dardania, since not yet was sacred Ilion built in the plain, a city of mortal humankind, but people then still dwelt on the slopes of spring-rich Ida. 
Dardano sired a son, Erichthonios the king, who lived to become the richest of mortal men. Three thousand mares he had grazing in the water meadows, breeders, rejoicing in their newborn foals. Of these mares out at pasture the north wind became enamoured. And taking the shape of a black-maned stallion. Covered them, twelve foals were conceived and born of this coupling, and these, when bounding over the grain-rich ploughland skimmed the topmost ears of ripe corn, never crushed them, and when bounding across the broad back of the sea skimmed the crests of the grey brine's breakers. Then came Tros, whom Erichthonio sired to be king among the Trojans, and Tros in his turn fathered three peerless sons, Elos, Asarakos, and godlike Ganymedes who was born the best-looking mortal man of them all, and because of his beauty the gods wafted him aloft to be Zeus's cupbearer and dwell among the immortals. Elos too sired a son, the peerless Laomedon, and Laomedon in turn sired Tithonos and Priam, Lampos and Clitios, and Hyktaeon, scion of Ars, while Asarakos begot Capes, and Capes Anchises, and Anchises begot me, and Priam noble Hector. From this blood and lineage, then, I claim descent. But Valor is something that Zeus increases or lessens in mortals as he is minded, being the mightiest of all. So come on then, let's stop arguing like children, standing here in the midst of the grind of battle. Insults are to hand for us both to cast, the one at the other, so many, not even a hundred benched ship could hold them. The human tongue's voluble. The words on it are many and of every sort. The range of man's speech is broad on all sides, any word you speak, you can also hear. But what need for us to exchange abuse and accusations, yelling one at the other like a pair of housewives who work themselves up over some gut-wrenching quarrel? and end in a lengthy slanging match on the public highway with some true charges, some false, rage makes for lies. It's not with words that you'll kill my urge to Valor, not until we've fought face to face with the bronze, so come, let's make trial of each other, now, with our bronze-tipped spears. With that he cast his great spear at Achilles' fearsomely daunting shield, and loudly the shield clanged round the spear point. With one strong hand Pelias's son was holding the shield out from him, alarmed since he thought the far-shadowing spear of great-hearted Aeneas would easily pierce through it, fool that he was, not knowing, by reason and by instinct, that it's far from easy for the splendid gifts of the gods to be vanquished, or made to yield, by mortal warriors. So now the massive spear of warlike Aeneas failed to break through the shield, the gold, the god's gift, stopped it. Through two layers only he forced it, there still were three, since five in all the lame cripple had welded together, two of bronze two inner layers of tin, and one of gold, where the spear of ash was halted. Then Achilles in turn let fly his far-shadowing spear, and hit the nicely balanced shield of Aeneas, below its outermost rim, where the bronze ran at its thinnest, and thinnest, too, was the oxide, clean through now past the Pelian spear, and the struck shield rang with the blow. Aeneas, crouching down, held his shield out away from him in terror, the flung spear passed over his shoulder, stuck in the ground, after breaking through both layers of the sheltering shield. Then he, having dodged the long spear, stood up, his eyes now showing measureless alarm. Scared on account of the spear's near miss. But Achilles drew his sharp sword and sprang upon him in fury, with a terrible shout. Now Aeneas hefted a rock in his hands, a mighty feat, that would take two men and more such as men are today, but, alone, he easily wielded it, and would have thrown it to meet Achilles' onslaught, aiming at his helmet or else at the shield that kept him from grim death, and Pelias's son with his sword, closing in, would have slain Aeneas, had not Poseidon the earthshaker quickly taken notice, and straightway spoken up among the immortal gods, alas, I feel grief for Aeneas. The great-hearted, who too soon vanquished by Pelias's son will go down to the realm of Hades after believing the tales of Apollo, the deadly archer, the fool. And Apollo won't even save him from wretched death. Why should this guiltless man now suffer calamity in vain, because of the troubles of others? He who always gives welcome gifts to the gods who hold the broad heavens. Come then. Let's snatch him away from death ourselves. For the son of Kronos may well be wrathful, should Achilles slaughter Aeneas here, who's destined to survive that his race may not perish unseen for lack of seed, the line of Dardanos, whom Kronos's son loved above all children who have ever been born to him of mortal women. So now he's come to look with hatred upon Priam's line, now surely mighty Aeneas will reign as king among the Trojans, he and his sons, and his sons' sons born in time to come. To him the oxide lady here replied, Earthshaker, you must decide yourself concerning Aeneas, whether to rescue him, or let him be vanquished, brave though he is, by Achilles, Pelias' son. The two of us have sworn a number of oaths in the presence of all the immortals, Pallas Athene, and I. That will never ward off from the Trojans their day of evil, not even when all Troy is ablaze with devouring fire, 
and the Achaeans' warlike sons are those who lit the flames. On hearing her words, Poseidon the Earthshaker set off through the fighting and the tumult of spears, and came to where Aeneas and far-famed Achilles were. Swiftly he shed a mist over the eyes of Achilles, Pelias' son, then pulled his well-bronzed ashwood spear out from the shield of great-hearted Aeneas, and set it at the feet of Achilles, but Aeneas himself he picked up, lifted high off the ground, and flung him, over many ranks of fighters Aeneas' sword, and many of horses, thrown in a great arc by the god's hand. Till he landed at the outermost edge of the violent conflict, where the Corconians were armed and ready for battle. Then Poseidon the Earthshaker came up close beside him, and addressed him with winged words, saying, Aeneas, what god is it who's been urging you, in your rash folly, to measure yourself, face to face, in battle against the arrogant son of Peleus, who's stronger than you, and better loved by the immortals? Withdraw, any time you encounter him, lest you enter the realm of Hades before your fated time. But after Achilles meets his death and destined end then take heart and fight among the foremost, no other warrior of the Achaeans will be able to take your life. So saying, he left him there, when he'd revealed all this, and at once from Achilles' eyes the marvellous mist dispersed, and then he at once, staring hard at what he saw, in amazement addressed his own proud spirit, see now. What's this strange thing I behold with my own eyes? My spear lies here on the ground. Yet he at whom I threw it, determined to kill him, is nowhere to be seen. Aeneas, too, must be dear to the immortal gods, although I assumed that his boasting was the merest idle bombast. Ah, let him go, he'll not have the courage to confront me ever again, he's too happy to have dodged death now. So, after passing the word to the war-loving Danans, I'll go face the rest of the Trojans, and make trial of them. With that he raced down the ranks, exhorting each warrior as he went, no longer now hang back from the Trojans, noble Achaeans, rather let man go face man, be raging for the battle. It's hard for me, strong though I am, to battle against such a mass of men, to fight them all single-handed, not even ours, immortal god, nor Athene, could toil and engage with the jaws of such a huge grinding conflict. Nevertheless, as far as I'm able, with hands and feet and human strength, I promise you, in no way will I yield the slightest. But press right through their ranks. And no Trojan, I think, who comes near my spear will be happy. So he spoke, urging them on, while illustrious Hector cried out to the Trojans, swore he'd go and confront Achilles. You great-hearted Trojans, don't be scared of Peleus's son. I too with words would battle even the immortals, though not with the spear, since they are mightier by far. Nor will Achilles accomplish everything he's promised, a part he'll fulfill, but a part he'll leave half-finished. Yet I shall go forth against him, though his hands be like fire, though his hands be like fire, and his passion like red-hot iron. So he spoke, urging them on, and the Trojans faced the foe, spears raised, the two sides rage mingled, the war cry went up. Then to Hector came Phoebus Apollo, and spoke to him, saying, Hector, no longer challenge Achilles out front, instead wait for him with the main body, in the tumult of battle, lest he spear you, or wound you at close quarters with his sword. So he spoke. And Hector went back into the throng of troops alarmed, after hearing the speaking voice of the god. But Achilles went for the Trojans, heart clad in prowess, yelling his terrible war cry. Iphition first he killed. Atrinteus's fine son, a commander of many men, born of a nymph, a naiad, to Atrinteus, sacker of cities, under snow capped Molos, in Hyde's rich countryside. As he charged, noble Achilles took him out with a spear cast square in the face, his head was split in two, he fell with a thud, and over him noble Achilles exulted, lie there, son of Atrinteus, most fearsome of warriors. Here you met your death, though it was by the Gygaean lake you were born, on your ancestral estate, beside fish-rich hillows and eddying hermos. So he spoke, vauntingly, but darkness now covered his victim's eyes, and the wheels of Achaean chariots tore him asunder in the first grinding onset, over him Demoleon, a fine battler, the son of Antinor, Achilles now speared in the temple, through the bronze cheekpiece of his helmet, the bronze helmet was no protection, the flighted spear point tore into it, split the bone open and all his brains were mashed up inside, he died while still attacking. Hippodama's next, who'd just jumped down from his chariot and was trying to escape him, Achilles speared in the back. As he breathed his last he bellowed, the way that a bull will bellow when it's dragged out by young men at the lord of he likes shrine, the earthshaker loves such things. So did Hippodama's bellow as the proud spirit fled his bones. Achilles now with his spear made for godlike Polydoros, a son of Priam. His father refused to allow him to fight, since among his children he was the latest born, and his favourite as well, and beat everyone at running, 
but then, in his childishness, to show how fast he could sprint, he went tearing down the front line, and lost his life there, speared square in the back by swift-footed noble Achilles as he dashed by, where the baldric's golden clasps were fastened, and the two ends of the corslet overlapped. Clean through beside the navel went the spear point. And he sank on his knees with a groan, a dark cloud enshrouded him. And, collapsing, he grasped his innards in his hands. But when Hector perceived his brother Polydoros, with his innards clutched in his hands, collapsing on the ground, a mist was shed over his eyes, no longer could he bear to range over the battlefield, but made straight for Achilles, like a flame, brandishing his keen-edged spear. When Achilles saw him, up he sprang, and vauntingly declared, here comes the man who has most deeply vexed my spirit, since he slew my much-beloved comrade, not for much longer shall we two avoid each other along the battle lines. That said, with an angry glance he called to noble Hector, come close, that you may the sooner enter destruction's bounds. To this, untouched by fear, bright-helmeted Hector replied, son of Peleus, don't try to frighten me like a child with mere words, since I know perfectly well myself how to frame the language of taunts and rancorous abuse. I know, too, you're a great fighter. And that I rank well below you. Yet it's true that such matters rest on the knees of the gods, whether I, though the lesser man, may still rob you of life when I cast my spear, it's been sharp enough in the past. With that he swung and let fly his spear, but Athene blew it back, well away from glorious Achilles, with a light breath only, it returned to noble Hector, fell right at his feet. Then Achilles sprang upon him, hot for action, determined to cut him down, with a terrifying shout. But Apollo snatched Hector away, very easily, as a god can, and hid him in dense mist. Three times did swift-footed noble Achilles rush him with his bronze spear, three times he only struck thick mist. But when for the fourth time he charged at him like a god, after his fearsome war cry he spoke winged words to him, now once more, dog, you've dodged death, though close indeed that bad thing came to you. But once more Phoebus Apollo saved you. To whom it must be that you pray before entering the clash of spears. And for sure, when I meet you later, if there's any god who's my helper, I'll finish you off. But for now I'll go after the others, see whom I can catch. So saying. He struck Dryops full in the neck with his spear, and Dryops slumped at his feet. He left him there, and Phileta's son Demuchos, a big strong fellow, he hit with his spear on one knee, cut short his advance, then savaged with his great sword, deprived him of life. Next Dardanos and Laogonos, two sons of Bias, he attacked, forcing both from their chariot to the ground, one speared, the other cut down by his sword, hand to hand. Then Alastor's son Tros, who'd come up to clasp his knees in the hope that he'd take him prisoner, let him live, out of pity for one of his age group, rather than kill him, the fool, unaware that there wasn't a chance of ever persuading him, since this was a man without kindness of mind or heart, but raging to kill, flung his arms now around Achilles' knees, tried to beseech him. A sword stroke found his liver, the liver protruded, and black blood poured down from it, filling his tunic's fold. Darkness shrouded his eyes as he lost hold of life. Achilles then closed in on Mulios, hit one ear with his spear, and the bronze point drove clean through to the other ear. Agenor's son Echiclos he slashed square on the head with his hilt sword, its whole blade was warmed with his blood, and both his eyes were invaded by scarlet death and all-mastering fate. Deucalion next, at the point where the elbow's tendons are joined, Achilles pierced through one arm with his bronze spear point. Deucalion faced him, arm weighed down, seeing his death before him. Achilles' sword severed his neck, sent both head and helmet flying, while marrow spurted out from his spine, and the trunk lay spread-eagled on the ground. Then Achilles went in pursuit of Pear's blameless son, Rigmos, who'd come from rich-soiled Thrace. Him now Achilles speared in mid-torso, the bronze stuck in his belly, and he fell from his chariot. While his driver Arethus was wheeling his horses around, he too was hit, in the back. By Achilles' sharp spear. And thrown out, the horses panicked. As devouring fire rages onward through the deep glens of a dried-out mountainside, and the thick marky flares up, and on all sides the blaze is fanned by a roiling wind, so Achilles, like some demon, raged everywhere with his spear, hard on the heels of his victims, the earth ran black with blood. As a man yokes broad-browed bulls for the treading out of white barley strewn on a strong base threshing floor, and quickly the grains unhusked by the feet of the bellowing bulls, so, urged by great-hearted Achilles, his whole-hoofed horses galloped over the dead and their shields, with blood all the axle below was splashed, and the rails round his chariot, with the drops flung up by the wheels and the horse's hooves as Pelias's son charged on, his invincible hands bespattered with flying gore, in his pursuit of glory.
Book 21. But when they came to the ford of the swift-flowing river, eddying Xanthos, whom immortal Zeus engendered, Achilles now split the route. Some he pursued across the plain towards the city, where the Achaeans were fleeing in panic the day before, when faced with illustrious Hector's fury, they'd broken, fled in disorder, and here had spread a dense mist in front to confuse them, but half the Trojans were herded into the river, deep-flowing, and silver-edded. In they splashed in with great outcry, the deep streambed resounded, both riverbanks echoed the tumult as they went swimming this way and that, still shouting, spun round by the eddies. As when, with an onrushing fire, clouds of locusts will take wing in flight towards a river, and the never-wearying blaze in its sudden onset will scorch them, and they cringe in the water, so at Achilles' onset the stream of deep-eddying Xanthos was loud with a mingled confusion of men and horses. Achilles, scion of Zeus, now left his spear on the bank. Leaning against a tamarisk, and charged in like a demon, armed only with his sword, horrific deeds in mind. He turned and struck at random, and ghastly cries went up from those caught by his sword, the water ran red with blood, and as, fleeing a huge moored dolphin, the other fishes scurry to fill the bolt holes of some sheltering harbour, terrified. Since the dolphin devours all it catches, so these Trojans, caught in the current of the terrible river, cowered under its banks. When his hands grew weary with killing, Achilles pulled twelve youths up alive from the water, to be blood price for the death of Menoetios's son Patroclos. He led them ashore, all dazed, like so many fawns, and bound their hands behind them with the well-cut belts that they wore to cinch in their soft tunics, and then turned them over to his companions to take back to the hollow ships. This done, he sprang back again, his mind hard set on slaughter. There it was he encountered a son of Dardanian Priam fleeing from the river, Lycaon whom once before he'd caught and snatched, struggling, out of his father's orchard during a night raid, he was busy cutting young branches from a fig tree with the sharp bronze, to make rails for a chariot, when on him, an unlooked-for disaster, came noble Achilles, who took him by ship to well-built Lemnos and sold him off as a slave, Jason's son had paid the price demanded, but a guest friend then ransomed him, for a very large sum, Eshan of Imbros, who sent him to noble Arisbe. From where, slipping off in secret, he reached his ancestral home. For eleven days he took pleasure among his friends on arrival from Lemnos, but on the twelfth some god threw him back into the hands of Achilles, who this second time would dispatch him to Hades' realm, loath though he was to go. When noble swift-footed Achilles noticed this man, unarmed, minus helmet or shield, no spear in his hand, he'd thrown them all away, being tired and sweaty as he clambered out of the river. Knees weak from exhaustion. In amazement he then addressed his own proud spirit, Ah, me, what's this strange thing I see with my own eyes? Surely those great-hearted Trojans whom I've slaughtered will rise once more from the murk of the underworld, seeing that this fellow is back, after dodging his day of doom, though sold into sacred Lemnos, nor has the deep of the grey sea held him back, that stops many against their will. Well, now indeed he'll also get a taste of my spear, so that I'll be able to see, and be sure in my mind. Whether he'll come back likewise from that too, or rather be stopped by the life-giving earth, that holds down even the strong. So he reflected, waiting, Lycaon now approached him, dazed, eager to clasp his knees, and desperate at heart to escape an unpleasant end and the black death spirit. Then noble Achilles lifted and poised his long spear, ready to kill, but Lycaon ducked under it, embraced Achilles' knees. The spear passed over his back and stuck in the ground. Still longing to glut itself with men's flesh. Then Lycaon besought Achilles, one hand clasping his knees, while the other kept a firm grip on his sharpened spear, not letting go. And addressed him with winged words, By your knees, Achilles, I beg you. Respect me, take pity on me. Zeus is nursling, I'm your suppliant, I deserve your respect. Since you were the first with whom I tasted Demeter's grain on the day you captured me in our well-planned orchard, and shipped me far away from father and friends, to sacred Lemnos, for the price of a hundred oxen. To free me by ransom cost three times as much, and this morning's the twelfth since I returned to Ilion, after much hardship, and now my fatal destinies put me back in your hands, I must be hateful to Zeus the father since he's given me to you again. Too short the life my mother bore me to, Laotho, old Alt's daughter, Alt's, who rules as lord over the war-loving Leliges, from steep Pedasos, he city on the Satnios river. His daughter Priam married, among many other women, and of her we two sons were born, now you'll slaughter us both. One you've already done for among the frontline fighters, Polydoros the godlike. Laid low by your sharp spear, and now a bad end awaits me too. For I don't imagine I'll escape your hands, some god it was brought me to you. 
And another thing I'll tell you, and you bear it in mind, I'm not born from the same womb as Hector, so don't kill me, he it was that slew your comrade, so kindly and so strong. Thus Priam's illustrious son addressed him, with words of entreaty, but there was no honey in the reply he heard, fool, don't talk ransom to me, don't make speeches. Before Patroclus encountered the day of his destiny, till then I was more inclined to spare the lives of Trojans, and many I captured alive and sold, but of them now not one shall escape death. Whomsoever before Troy's ramparts a god puts into my hands of all Trojans, and least of all one of Priam's sons. So, friend, you too must die, why then lament thus? Patroclus too is dead, a far better man than you are. Can't you see what I'm like, how handsome and tall I am? A fine father sired me, the mother who bore me was a goddess. Yet over me too hang death and all mastering destiny, a day will come when. At dawn or noon, or evening, my life too will be forfeit to someone in battle, by a flighted spear or an arrow shot from the bowstring. So he spoke, and like Aeon's knees and heart were unstrung, he let go the spear, and sat there, both hands outstretched in supplication. But Achilles drew his sharp sword, and plunged it in by the neck at the collarbone, the two-edged blade sank in its full length, and like Aeon fell prone, lay stretched out there on the ground. His dark blood gushed, soaked the earth. Achilles now seized one foot, flung him into the river as flotsam, and, vaunting, spoke winged words over him, lie there now with the fishes, that'll lick the blood from your wound, quite indifferent to you, nor will your mother lay you out on a beer and wail over you, rather will Scamandros roll you away in its eddies to the wide gulf of the sea, and fish darting through the waves will surface amid their black ripples to nibble like Aeon's white lustrous fat. So die all. Till we reach sacred Ilion's citadel. With you in full flight, and I in murderous pursuit. Not even the swift-flowing and silver-edded river will protect you, long though you've offered him bull after bull, and thrown whole-hoofed horses alive still into his eddies, you'll all suffer the same evil fate, till every one of you has paid for Patroclus' death, and the loss of those Achaeans whom you slaughtered by the swift ships while I was absent. So he spoke, and the river grew yet more enraged at heart, pondering in his mind how to make noble Achilles stop his war work, how to fend off calamity from the Trojans. Meanwhile, the son of Peleus, with his far-shadowing spear, went for Asteropios, hungry to kill him, the son of Pelagon, who was begotten by wide-flowing Axios on Periboia, the eldest of Achesimenos' daughters, with her the deep-eddying river mingled in love. Him now Achilles charged, as he came up from the water, holding two spears, making for him. Fierce strength put in his heart by Xanthos. Irate on account of the young men slaughtered by Achilles along the river on his pitiless killing spree. When they came close, advancing the one against the other, swift-footed noble Achilles was the first to speak, who are you, from where, though you dare to come out and face me? Unhappy are those whose sons confront my strength. To him then replied Pelagon's illustrious son, great-hearted son of Peleus, why query my lineage? I come from rich-soiled Paeonia, a distant land, in command of Paeonian lancers, and this is now the eleventh day since I arrived here in Ilion. As for my ancestry, I'm descended from wide-flowing Axios, Axios. Who sends forth the sweetest water on earth, who begot Pelagon, famed for his spear, and he, they say, was my father. So now, renowned Achilles, let's fight. Menacingly he spoke, and noble Achilles raised his spear of Pelian ash, but the hero Asteropios let fly both spears at once, being double-handed, and with one spear he struck his opponent's shield, but failed to break through, the gold layer, a god's gift held it off, but the other spear struck Achilles' forearm a grazing blow, his right one, dark blood gushed, but the spear point passed on, and stuck in the ground, still hungry to glut itself on flesh. Then Achilles flung his true flying ashwood spear at Asteropios, in fierce determination to kill him, but missed the man and struck the high riverbank, sank the spear half its length, fixing it in the earth. Peleus's son drew the sharp sword from beside his thigh, and sprang at him, hot to kill. Asteropios failed to pull Achilles' spear from the bank in his massive fist, three times. Trying to free it, he made it quiver, three times he gave up. The fourth time his heart was set on bending and breaking the ash spear of Iacos's grandson, but, before he could do it, Achilles' sword at close quarters took his life, struck into his belly, beside the navel, his guts gushed out on the ground, and darkness shrouded his eyes as he lay there, gasping still, and Achilles jumped on his chest and stripped off his armor and shouted exultantly, lie there. It's hard to strive with the sons of mighty Kronos, even for someone sired by a river. You claim a wide-flowing river for ancestor, whereas I declare myself of the lineage of mighty Zeus. 
The man who begot me is lord over the numerous Myrmidons, Peleus, Iacos's son, it was Zeus who sired Iacos. So, as Zeus is mightier than all seaward flowing rivers, Zeus's line likewise outranks a river's ancestry. You may have a great river beside you. Always supposing it can protect you, but still there's no fighting Kronos' son Zeus. With him not even the lord Achaloios contends. Nor the vast might of deep flowing ocean, from whom all rivers derive, and the whole mass of the sea, and every spring and deep well has its beginning, no, even he goes in fear of the bolt of mighty Zeus, and his awesome thunder, whenever it crashes out of the sky. With that he pulled his bronze spear out from the riverbank, and left Astropios there, when he'd taken his dear life, sprawled out among the sand shoals, lapped by dark water, with the eels and fishes all busy about him, nibbling and tearing the fat surrounding his kidneys. Achilles moved on to harass the Paeonians, chariot marshals, who still lay in scattered confusion alongside the eddying river, after seeing their best warrior in the grind of battle laid low by the might of Achilles and his sword. There he took down Thersolochos, Astipolos, and Maidon, Nessos and Thrasios, Aenios, Arphalestes, and yet more Paeonians would swift Achilles have slain, had the deep eddying river, enraged. Not now addressed him in the semblance of a man. Voicing speech from a deep eddy, ah, Achilles, beyond all in strength, beyond all men in evil acts, since the gods themselves are forever your protectors. If the son of Kronos is letting you kill every Trojan, at least drive these well away from me, do your vile work on dry land. My lovely streams are currently all awash with corpses, I can't get to discharge my waters into the bright sea, I'm so choked with the dead, while you ruthlessly keep on killing. Come, now, let me be, I'm dumbfounded, O oh high commander. Then swift-footed Achilles answered him in these words, All this, Zeus's nursling Scamandros, shall be done as you request. But I'll not cease from the slaughter of these arrogant Trojans till I've cooped them up in their city, and made trial of Hector, man against man, and either he slays me, or I him. So saying, he charged at the Trojans like a demon, and then the deep eddying river said to Apollo, Look here, child of Zeus, lord of the silver bow. You've not honoured the wishes of Kronos as son who strongly required you to stand firm by the side of the Trojans, and help them until the late-setting sun goes down, and darkens the rich earth. So he spoke. Achilles, feigned spearman, leapt to midstream from the high bank. But the river, now rushing onward in turbulent spate, stirred all his streams, swept up the countless corpses that cluttered his channel, whom Achilles had killed, these he, bellowing bull-like, tossed up onto dry land. While the one still alive he protected with his sweet streams, concealing them in his eddies, which were both large and deep. Fearsomely round Achilles surged his turbulent wave, its crest crashing onto his shield forced him back, he could no longer stand firm on his feet, so reached out and grasped an elm, one full-grown and lofty, but it came away roots and all, tearing up the whole bank, and with its clustering branches dropped right across the fine stream bed, damming the river himself by falling its whole length within him. Achilles sprang clear of his whirling waters, ran swift foot across the plain in some alarm. But the great god did not give up, pursued him, surging black crested. To stop the actions of noble Achilles. Fend off destruction from the Trojans. But Peleus's son leapt back the whole length of a spear cast with the swoop of a black eagle, the hunting falcon, that is the strongest and swiftest of all winged creatures, such was his speed, and the bronze strips on his torso rattled fearfully. He dodged aside from under the river and kept running, the river's huge bore roared on behind him. As a man who digs a channel from a dark water spring to the plants in his garden will guide the water's flow, mattock in hand to clear obstructions from the channel, and, as the rill flows on, all the pebbles that litter its bed are swept along with it while it chuckles quickly down a slope in the channel, even getting ahead of its guide, just so did the river's bore keep overtaking Achilles, swift runner though he was, gods are mightier than mortals. Every time swift-footed noble Achilles attempted to stand firm and confront the river. To find out if all the immortals who hold the wide heavens were his pursuers. The sky-fed river's huge crest would come crashing down on his shoulders, he'd jump away from it, much wearied in spirit, while the river's rough spate kept sapping the strength of his knees beneath him, sucked the earth from under his feet. Then Peleus's son cried out, looking up to the wide heavens, Zeus, father, not one god has undertaken to save me, pitiable as I am from the river, after this, I could endure any trouble. Yet none of the heavenly ones is as much to blame as my mother, who beguiled me with lies, saying that under the walls of the coarse-leated Trojans I'd perish, slain by the swift shafts of Apollo. 
If only Hector had killed me, the best bred warrior here, then Noble had been the slayer, Noble the man he slew, whereas now it's my wretched fate to perish miserably, trapped in a great river, like some swineherd's boy who's swept away by the torrent he tries to cross in winter. So he spoke, and very quickly Poseidon and Athene came and stood by him. In the likeness of mortal men, took him by the hand, and spoke reassuringly to him. Of them Poseidon the earthshaker now addressed him, saying, Son of Peleus, don't be too scared, no need for alarm when you have two such helpers as we are, from the gods, and with Zeus's approval, Pallas Athene, and I. Since it's not your destiny to be overcome by the river he'll very soon ease off, as you'll see for yourself. Now, if you will listen, we have good advice for you, don't let your hand cease from the work of common warfare until you've cooped up inside Troy's famous ramparts the whole routed Trojan army, when you've taken Hector's life return to the ships. This much glory we grant you. So saying, they both went back to the immortals, but Achilles, greatly encouraged by the gods' behest, went on over the plain, now swamped with a flood of water. And much fine armor and weapons of young slain warriors lay floating there with their corpses, his knees rose high as he charged. Straight against the current. Now the wide flowing river could not stop him, such strength he had from Athene. Yet Scamandros did not abate his force, but rather swelled his wrath against Pelias's son, brought his waters up to a crest, raising himself aloft, and shouted to Simoes, Dear brother, to face this man's strength will need both of us if we're to stop him from sacking King Priam's great city any time now. The Trojans won't withstand him in battle, so help me at once, go flood your streams with the flow from your springs, put all your torrents in spate, raise a huge wave, stir up a thunderous racket of driftwood and pebbles. We must halt this wild warrior, who now has the upper hand, wants to match the gods in action. For I tell you, neither his violence nor his good looks will save him, nor his fine armour, which in some flooded pool of mine will lie, all coated with mud, while the man himself I'll wrap in sand. Pour over him an abundance of shingle. That way the Achaeans will have no idea where to gather his bones, under such a mass of silt I shall entomb him. Here will his grave be prepared, and he'll have no need of a burial mound, when Achaeans perform his funeral rites. With that he rushed at Achilles, turbulent, surging high, seething with foam and blood and slaughtered corpses. The dark and heaving wave of the sky-fed river towered above him, began to take down the son of Peleus, then here cried out in a loud voice. Being scared for Achilles, lest the huge deep eddying river should sweep him away, and at once called upon Hephaestos, her own dear son, up with you, my lame child. You are the one, we thought, best matched in battle with Xanthos, the eddying river, so bring help at once to Achilles, create widespread fire, while I quickly stir from the sea a violent gale, its force fed by the west and the white cloud southern winds, that will burn up the Trojans, themselves and their battle gear, by spreading destructive flames. Along Xanthos's banks now go set his trees alight, ring him with fire, don't allow him in any way to dissuade you, with honeyed words or threats, and don't relax your pressure until the moment when I call to you, only then should you curb your tireless fire. So she spoke. Hephaisto set up a marvellous conflagration, first on the plain the blaze was kindled, burning the dead, all the corpses thickly strewn there, slain by Achilles, and the whole plain was dried up now, the bright water halted. As when at harvest time the north wind quickly parches a fresh-watered threshing floor, and he who raked it rejoices, so now the whole plain was scorched, and the corpses completely consumed. Then against the river he turned his blazing flames, the elms caught fire, and the willows and tamarisks, the celandine burned, the rushes, the galangale, everything that grew in abundance along the sweet course of the river. And the eels and fish in the eddies were sorely distressed. Somersaulting this way and that along the sweet streams, tormented by the fire blast that wily Hephaistos discharged. Burn too was the mighty river, who now addressed the god, Hephaistos, no other god can match himself against you, nor am I minded to fight you, ablaze with fire as you are. So, stop your assault. The Trojans? Let noble Achilles drive them out of their city. Why should I help or hinder here? Ablaze with flames he spoke, his sweet streams bubbling up, as a cauldron will boil over when forced by a hot fire, that's rendering down the lard of a fattened porker, bubbling up all round, dry firewood stacked beneath it, so the river's sweet streams blazed, and their water bubbled, and he stopped, with no will to flow further, the fiery blast of inventive Hephaistos had stalled him, and now to hear he addressed an urgent prayer, speaking in winged words, here. Why is your son giving me and my water's trouble above all others? I surely am not so much at fault as all those who have acted as supporters of the Trojans. Even so. I'll desist, if that's what you want of me, 
but let this fellow desist as well. What's more, I'll swear an oath that I'll never ward off from the Trojans their day of evil, not even when all Troy is ablaze with devouring fire, and the Achaeans' warlike sons are those who lit the flames. When the goddess, white-armed here, heard these words, she at once addressed Hephaestos, her dear son, Hephaestos, desist, famed child. It is not seemly to assail an immortal god thus on behalf of mortals. So she spoke, and Hephaestos quenched his astounding blaze, and the current went rolling back down the river's sweet streams. When the might of Xanthos was vanquished, both he and Hephaestos desisted, held back by here, furious though she was. But upon the rest of the gods' strife descended, both momentous and agonizing, their spirits were blown in opposite directions. They engaged with a huge clatter, the wide earth rechoed, the great firmament trumpeted. Zeus heard it all from where he sat on Olympos. Broke out in delighted laughter to see the gods all fighting with one another, standing aloof no longer. First into combat was Ars, pisser of shields, who began by assailing Athene, bronze spear in hand, with a stream of insulting words. Why once more now, you dog fly, are you setting gods against gods, as your proud heart bids you, so fierce, so daring? Don't you recall setting up Diams, Tydeus' s son, to wound me? You yourself. In full view, grabbed his spear and thrust it straight at me, tore open my handsome flesh. So now I think you'll pay me the price for all you did. So saying, he hit her full on her tasseled aegis, that fearsome thing, not subduable even by Zeus's bolts, there it was bloodstained as struck home with his long spear. Athene started back, and hefted in one strong hand a rock that lay on the plain, black, jagged, enormous, set up by men in the past as the boundary mark of a field. With this she hit furious Ars on the neck, unstrung his limbs. Seven furlongs he stretched in his fall, fouled his hair in the dust, and his armour rattled about him. Pallas Athene laughed, and vauntingly addressed him, speaking in winged words, Fool! Have you still not learned how much more warlike than you I can claim to be, when you pit your strength against mine? This is how you'll pay the price to the furies of your mother. Who's planning trouble for you in her anger because you've left the Achaeans? Are supporting the arrogant Trojans. This said, Athene turned her keen gaze from Ars, whom then Aphrod, Zeus's daughter, caught by the hand and led away, groaning deeply, still barely catching his breath. But when white armed here, the goddess noticed Aphrod, straight away she addressed Athene with winged words, Well, now, unwearying child of Zeus of the Aegis, there's that dog fly again, leading Ars, ruin of mortals, out through the fighting, away from grim warfare. After her, Thus she spoke, and Athene was glad to set off in pursuit, caught up, and struck Aphrod to blow on the breast with her strong fist, unstrung both her knees and her spirit. So there Aphrod and Ars lay on the nurturing earth, and Athene exulted over them, speaking winged words, let all suffer thus who lend support to the Trojans when they dare to confront the male coarse-leated Achaeans. May they prove as daring and resolute as Aphrod, who came out to rescue Ars. And then faced my might. This way we'd have long since put an end to the war, by sacking Ilion, that well-founded citadel. So she spoke, and the goddess, white-armed here, smiled. But Poseidon, the lordly earth-shaker, now called out to Apollo, why, Phoebos, are we two standing aloof? That's not seemly when others have joined in. Too shameful, if without fighting we went back to Olympos, to Zeus's bronze-floored abode. You begin, you're the younger, it's not proper for me to, since I was born before you, and have more wisdom. You fool, what a witless heart you have. Don't you recall all the ills that we too, alone of the gods, endured in Ilion, when we came to serve haughty Laomedon, by Zeus's command, for a year, as hired workers, at a fixed wage, and he was our taskmaster, gave us orders. I built for the Trojans a wall encircling their city, both wide and splendid, to make the city unbreachable, while you, Phoebos, herded their sleek and shambling cattle among the foothills and woodlands of many ridged Ida. But when the year's happy seasons brought round the due time for payment, then we were defrauded of all our hire by that monster Laomedon, who dismissed us with threats, saying he'd put us in fetters, bound hand and foot, and sell us both abroad, dispatch us to some far island, threatened, too, to cut off our ears with the bronze. So home we both went, infuriated at heart because of the wages he'd promised, but not delivered. And now it's his people you're helping, you won't work with us to make sure these arrogant Trojans perish, and miserably, in utter ruin, they, their children, their honoured wives. Lord Apollo, the deadly archer, made him this answer, Earth Shaker, you would not speak of me as one that sound of mind, were I to fight you on behalf of those wretches, mortals, who, like the leaves, in one season are ablaze with life, and consuming the harvested fruits of the earth.
in another waste into lifelessness. So let us speedily desist from our combat, leave them to fight it out on their own. So saying, he turned back, since he felt embarrassed at the prospect of coming to blows with his father's brother. But he got a strong rebuke from his sister, the Lady of Beasts, Artemis, Wild Huntress, who addressed him in scathing words. Running away, deadly archer? Conceding a total triumph to Poseidon? Letting him boast of his effortless victory? You fool. Then why carry that bow? It's useless as wind. From now on don't let me hear you, in our father's halls, boast, as you did a while back before the immortal gods, that you'd fight in single combat against Poseidon. So she spoke, and Apollo, deadly archer, made no reply. But Zeus's revered bedmate, losing her temper, now upbraided the bow huntress in abusive language, you shameless bitch. How come you're so hot to make a stand against me now? I'm a tough one for you to take on, though you carry that bow, Zeus made you a lion, but against women, let you kill any one of them that you chose to. Better, I'd think, in the mountains to be hunting beasts of prey and wild deer, than to battle those stronger than yourself. Still, if you're bent on war, you'll find out, the hard way, how much stronger I am, when you match your strength against mine. This said, with her left hand here gripped Artemis by both wrists, while her right hand snatched from her shoulders the bow and quiver, and beat her about the ears with them, a smile on her face, as Artemis struggled, and her swift shafts were spilled. Then, weeping, the goddess broke from here's grasp, fled like a dove that flies, pursued by a hawk, into some hollow rock's cleft, and escapes, since it's not her destiny to be caught, so Artemis fled in tears, bow and arrows left where they fell. To Leto then spoke Hermes the guide. The slayer of Argos, Leto, I'll not fight you, it's a disastrous business, this exchanging of blows with the wives of Zeus the cloud gatherer. You can boast all you want among the immortal gods that you vanquished me forcefully, by dint of your mighty strength. So he spoke. Leto picked up her daughter's backbent bow, and the arrows that had been scattered amid the swirling dust, and retreated, taking them with her. But Artemis the maiden made her way to Zeus's brazen floored home on Olympos, where she sat down, weeping, on the knees of her father, and the ambrosial robe she wore quivered. Then her father, Cronos' son, hugged her to him, and, laughing quietly, asked, which of the gods in heaven, dear child, has done this to you, without reason, as though you were openly misbehaving? Fine garlanded Artemis of the loud chase answered him, your wife it was beat me up, father, white-armed here because of whom strife and fighting are the lot of the immortals. Such was their conversation. The one to the other. Phoebos Apollo now went down into sacred Ilion, concerned in his mind for the wall of the well-built citadel, lest the Danaan sack it that day, before its destined time. But the other immortal gods made their way to Olympos, some enraged, some greatly exultant, and took their seats in the house of the lord of the dark clouds. Now Achilles was still slaughtering Trojans and their whole-hoofed horses, and a smoke goes up and reaches the broad heavens from a burning town, fanned on by the wrath of the gods, causing hard work for all and suffering for many, so Achilles brought hard work and suffering to the Trojans. Old Priam was standing out on the god-built rampart, and watching huge Achilles, and the way that before him the Trojans scattered in headlong flight, without resistance. He groaned, and went down from the ramparts to ground level. Instructing his trusty gatekeepers along the wall, hold the gates wide open until our routed troops can make their way into the city. Achilles is right behind them, driving them on. I think disaster's upon us. So the moment they're inside the wall, still breathing hard, then slam shut the close-fitting gates, for I greatly fear that calamitous warrior may rush in beyond the ramparts. So he spoke, they undid the fastenings, shot back the bars, and the gates were flung wide, brought deliverance while Apollo sprang out to meet the rush, fend off ruin from the Trojans, who were fleeing straight for the city and its lofty ramparts, parched with thirst and covered with dust from the plain, in rout, while Achilles herded them savagely with his spear, heart ever ruled by madness, ardent to harvest glory. Then would the Achaean sons have taken high-gated Troy, had Phoebos Apollo not stirred up noble Agenor, Antinor's son, a warrior of unmatchable power, in his heart he put boldness, and himself stood by him, ready to fend off from him the heavy hands of death, against the oak tree he leaned, enshrouded in thick mist. When Agenor caught sight of Achilles, the sacker of cities, he stood still, and much his heart brooded on while waiting, and deeply stirred he addressed his own proud spirit, ah, me. If faced with mighty Achilles I should now retreat to where all the others are being driven in rout, even so he'd still catch me and slit my throat as a coward. 
but suppose I leave these men to be chased and herded by Pelis's son Achilles, and run from the wall in a different direction, towards the Ilian plain, until I reach the foothills of Ida, and take refuge in their thickets. Then, when evening came, I'd wash myself in the river, clean off the sweat, and make my way back to Ilion. But why is my heart debating such matters with me? He might spot me taking off from the city towards the plain, and, being swift-footed, pursue and overtake me. No chance then of my avoiding death and the death spirits, so strong he is, far stronger than all other mortal men. But suppose that I go to confront him before the city? His flesh. Two, can be pierced by the keen-edged bronze, and there's only one life in him, men say he's mortal, however much Zeus son of Kronos endows him with glory. That said, he crouched awaiting Achilles, and in him his courageous heart was eager for warfare and battle. As a leopard will sally forth from the deepest thicket to confront a hunter, nor does her courage fail her, nor does she panic on hearing the baying of hounds, for though the hunter may spear her or shoot her first, yet she'll still not abandon her prowess, even when spitted on the spear, till she either grapples with him or is slain, so the son of lordly Antinor, noble age nor, would not retreat till he had made trial of Achilles, but holding before him his trimly balanced shield and pointing his spear at Achilles, now shouted aloud, I'm sure you hoped in your heart, illustrious Achilles, that on this day you'd sack the proud Trojan citadel. You fool! Much sorrows to come still in the matter of Troy. Since within her we, her warriors, are many and strong, who, protecting our beloved parents and wives and sons, stand guard over Ilion. It is you who will meet your end here, however fearsome and daring a warrior you may be. With that he let fly the sharp spear from his massive hand, and did not miss, but hit Achilles' shin under his knee, and the grieve of fresh-wrought tin that was fastened round it rang fearsomely when struck, but the bronze rebounded and did not pierce through, for the god's gift held it back. Then Pelias's son in his turn went at godlike Agenor, but Apollo did not allow him to gain fresh glory, he snatched Agenor away, enshrouding him in thick mist, and sent him off quietly to take himself out of the fighting but Pelis's son by a trick was kept well clear of the troops by the deadly archer, assuming Agenor's exact likeness he stood close in front of Achilles. Achilles rushed after him. And during the chase across the wheat-rich plain Apollo nudged him towards the river. Deep eddying Scamandros, while keeping a little ahead, tricked Achilles into thinking he was always just on the point of catching up with his quarry. Meanwhile the rest of the Trojans, a routed mass, were happy to get to Troy, and the city was overflowing with them. They no longer dared to wait outside the city ramparts for one another, to learn which warriors had escaped and who had died fighting. Instead they hurriedly crowded back into the city, each one whose feet and knees could save him. Book 22. So these throughout the city, after fleeing like fawns, were cooling their sweat and drinking and slaking their thirst, leaning against the fine battlements, while the Achaeans advanced right up to the ramparts, shields resting on their shoulders. But Hector's fatal destiny constrained him to remain where he was, outside Ilion and the Scurrian gates. Now to the son of Peleus Phoebos Apollo spoke, Why, son of Peleus, are you scampering after me when you're a mortal, while I'm an immortal god? You've still not recognized me for a god, so ceaselessly do you rage. Aren't you concerned to deal with the Trojans you've routed, who crowded into the city while you wandered off out here? You'll never kill me, it's not in my destiny to die. Deeply incensed, swift-footed Achilles responded, You fooled me, deadly archer, of all gods the most lethal. By diverting me here from the wall, else many more men would have bitten the dust before they ever reached Ilion. Of great glory now you've robbed me. While these you've saved, an easy task, with no fear of retribution to come, though had I the power, I'd certainly be revenged on you. So saying he took off towards the city with high resolve, dashing along like some prize-winning chariot horse one that easily gallops at full stretch across the plain, so speedily now did he exert his feet and knees. The aged Priam was first to set eyes upon Achilles as he swept on across the plain, a gleam like the star that rises at harvest time, and brightly its rays shine out among the myriad stars in the darkness of night, and men call it the dog of Oran, the brightest star of all, yet nevertheless it's a warning of trouble to come, and brings with it much fever to wretched mankind, so gleamed the bronze on Achilles' breast as he ran. Priam now groaned aloud, beat his head with his hands, lifting them high, and cried out in his distress, entreating his own son, who was standing outside the gates. Dead set on battling it out with Achilles, to him the old man spoke pitiably. Stretching out his arms, Hector, dear child, for my sake don't stay there and face that man, alone, without backup, too soon you'd meet your fate, laid low by Pelias's son, since he's by far the stronger, 
and pitiless, how I wish he were as dear to the gods as he is to me. Soon, then, would dogs and vultures devour him as he lay there, and sore grief would vacate my spirit over one who's deprived me of many valiant sons by killing or shipping them off to far distant islands. Even now two sons of mine, Lycaon and Polydoros, I can't see among those Trojans penned up in the city, sons that Laotho bore me, that queen among women. If they're alive, in the enemy camp, then for certain we'll pay ransom with gold and bronze, there's plenty stored here, all the gifts that far-famed old Alts bestowed with his daughter. But if they're already dead, and down in Hades' realm, then there's grief for myself and for the mother who bore them. For others the pain will be briefer. So long as you two don't die now, slain by Achilles. So, my dear child, come back here, inside the walls. Do that, and you'll save the Trojans and Trojan women, while denying great glory to Pelis' son, and not lose your own dear life. Besides, pity me, the unhappy one, while I'm still alive, an ill-fated wretch, whom the father, Cronos's son, will slay. In a hard death, when I'm old, after seeing many horrors, my sons destroyed, my daughters forcibly taken, their chambers ransacked, and their infant children dashed to the ground, in warfare's savage conflict, my sons' wives dragged off as booty by cruel Achaean hands. Myself last of all my dogs, by my own front doorway, will tear and eat raw, when some man with the sharp bronze, stabbing or shooting, has parted the spirit from my limbs, dogs that I reared at my table, trained to guard my home, and now, turned wild by the drinking of my blood, will lie out there in the forecourt. For a young man killed in battle it's seemly to lie dead. Cut about by the sharp bronze, nothing, even in death, that's visible is repugnant. But when it's a slaughtered greybeard's grey head and private parts that dogs are shamefully worrying, that has to be the most piteous thing that can happen to wretched mortals. So spoke the old man, and with his hands tore and plucked the grey hairs from his head, yet could not shift Hector's will, and his mother in turn lamented, shedding tears, opened her dress with one hand, in the other held out her breast, as, weeping, she addressed him, speaking with winged words, Hector, child, show this respect, have pity for me, if ever I gave you the breast to make you forget your pain. Think on these things, dear child, fend off this deadly man from inside our ramparts, don't face him alone out there, an obstinate champion, if he kills you, I shall never mourn you laid on a bier, dear sprig that I, myself, bore, nor will your cherished wife, no, far, far from both of us beside the ships of the Argives brisk dogs will devour you. So the two of them, weeping, called upon their dear son, with heartfelt entreaties, yet could not shift Hector's will, who stood firm while huge Achilles advanced towards him. As a mountain snake awaits a man beside its hole, well fed on poisonous herbs, flush with bitter distemper, glaring terribly as it uncoils itself from its lair, so Hector, his might unquenchable, would not give ground but stood, bright shield propped against a jutting bastion, and deeply stirred he addressed his own proud spirit, ah me. If I now retreat within the gates and the ramparts, Puladamas will be first to heap reproaches on me having urged me to lead the Trojans into the city during this last cursed night, when noble Achilles took action. I would not obey him then, much better had I done so. Now, through my reckless folly I've ruined my own people, and feel shame before the Trojans and their long-robed women. Less maybe some other fellow, baser than me, may say, Hector destroyed his people through trust in his own might. So they will say, for me far better to meet Achilles face to face and return home only should I kill him, or else myself to die gloriously out in front of the city. But supposing I lay aside my embossed shield, and my weighty helmet, prop my spear up against the wall, and go out alone to meet with peerless Achilles, guarantee him that Helen, and with her all the possessions, every last item Alexandros in his hollow ships carried off Troy wards, which was how this quarrel started, will return to the sons of Atreus to take home, and moreover will share out with the Achaeans all the goods this city contains and I then have the Trojan elders swear me. An oath that they'll hide nothing, will divide up all the treasure that this elegant citadel contains within its walls, but why is my dear heart debating these matters? Heaven forbid I approach him as suppliant, he'll not pity or show me respect, but slaughter me when I'm unweaponed and out of my armour, as though I were some defenceless woman. There's no way now. From oak tree or from rock. To sweet talk him, oh, like a girl and her young man, a girl and her young man, flirting with one another. Better to meet and fight him as soon as I can, let's learn to whom the Olympian will grant glory. Thus he pondered, waiting, while Achilles approached him, the equal of Inyalios, that bright helmed warrior. Above his right shoulder wielding his spear of Pelian ash, so fearsome, while all about him the bronze now glinted like blazing fire or the rays of the rising sun. 
As Hector looked, trembling seized him, he no longer dared to stand firm, the gates left behind him, he fled in terror, and Pelis's son went after him, trusting his fleetness of foot. As up in the mountains a hawk, the fastest of winged creatures, swoops effortlessly in pursuit of a timorous dove, she seeks to escape him, but he, screaming shrilly, and close, keeps swooping at her, heart driving him on to kill, so Achilles raged straight after Hector, who ran for his life beneath the wall of the Trojans. Knees pumping, going flat out. Past the lookout post and the windswept fig tree they sped, away from under the wall, and along the wagon track. To the two full-flowing springs, where gush up both the sources that feed the waters of eddying scamandros. The one flows with warm water, and from its smoke goes up as though from a blazing fire, while the other, even in summer, still flows as chilly as hail, or freezing snow, or the ice that crystallizes from water. There, close to these springs, are spacious washing tanks, fine and stone-built, where the wives and lovely daughters of the Trojans would formerly wash their glistening garments in the days of peace, before the Achaean sons arrived. Past these they ran, one in flight, the other hot on his heels, ahead, a fine warrior fleeing, a far better one in speedy pursuit, and neither for bull's hide nor for sacrificial beast were these now competing, a footrace's usual prizes, the two of them were now running for horse-taming Hector's life. As prize-winning whole-hoofed horses gallop lightly around the turning points of a racetrack, where some great prize is displayed. A tripod or woman, to honor a warrior slain, so these two, quick-footed, thrice-circled Priam's city, with all the gods watching them, amongst whom the first to express his thoughts was the father of men and gods, alas, it's indeed a well-loved man that I see now being chased round the city's walls, my heart is sore grieved for Hector, who's burnt in my honor many thighs of oxen on the heights of many ridged Ida, and at other times on the lofty citadel, but now here's noble Achilles, pursuing him on swift feet round and round Priam's city. So, gods, consider this matter, give me your opinion, shall we save him from death, or let him be laid low, fine man though he is, at the hands of Achilles, Peleus's son. Then the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, answered him thus, Father, lord of bright bolt and black cloud, what's this you're saying? Here's a man, a mortal, his fate long since determined, do you mean to reverse that, release him from woeful death? Well. Do it, but know this, we other gods don't all approve. Replying to her then, Zeus the cloud gatherer said, Cheer up Tritogenia, dear child, the things I just said were not meant seriously, and to you I'm kindly disposed. Act as your mind dictates, hold back no longer. So saying he urged on Athene, already eager to go, and down she darted from the heights of Olympos. But swift Achilles kept on in relentless pursuit of Hector. As up in the mountains a dog will go after a hind's fawn, starting it from its covert, chase it through glens and dells and though it may hide for a time, crouching low in a thicket, that dog will still track it down, running steadily, till it's found, so Hector could not shake off swift-footed Achilles, whenever he made a rush for the Dardanian gates, and tried to slip in past the strongly built bastions, hoping that those on the walls would cover him with their missiles, each time. In anticipation Achilles would head him off, nudge him back to the plain, while himself pressing on by the city wall. As in a dream one can't overtake the quarry one's chasing, the fugitive can't escape, nor his pursuer catch him, so Achilles could not catch up, nor Hector get clear away. How could Hector then have eluded the death spirits, had Apollo not come to his aid, for the last, the final time, standing close, to arouse his strength, put speed in his knees? To his troops, too, noble Achilles, with a shake of the head, signalled they shouldn't let fly their bitter shafts at Hector, a good shot might win the glory, leave himself as an also ran. But when for the fourth time they came round to the springs, then Zeus, the father, held up his golden balance and on it set two dooms of grief-laden death, one for Achilles, the other for horse-taming Hector. By the middle he grasped and raised it, Hector's fated day sank, pointing down to Hades, and Phoebus Apollo left him. To Pelis' son now came the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, stood at his side. And addressed him in winged words, now indeed I'm sure. Achilles, illustrious favourite of Zeus. We too will bring back to the ship's great glory for the Achaeans by killing Hector, great glutton for combat though he is. No longer can he escape us, not even were it to be that Apollo the deadly archer should suffer humiliation by groveling on his behalf before Zeus of the Aegis. So stay here, and get your breath back, while I myself go to Hector, and talk him into fighting you man to man. So spoke Athene, he obeyed, and was glad at heart, and stood there, leaning upon his bronze-barbed ashwood spear. Athene now left him, and went over to noble Hector, in appearance and speaking voice resembling Daphobos. 
she came up close, and addressed him with winged words, saying, Honored brother, Swift Achilles is pressing you really hard with this pursuit on foot all round Priam city, so come, let's make a stand, hold fast here and defend ourselves. Then great bright helmeted Hector made her this answer, Daphobos. In the past you've been far the dearest to me of all my brothers. Those born to Hecabe and Priam, and now I'm minded to do you yet greater honour, since you dared, for my sake, when you saw me, to come out beyond the ramparts, while all the others are staying inside. To him then replied the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, honoured brother, indeed my father and lady mother begged and implored me in turn, as did my comrades, to stay back, so greatly do all of them fear Achilles, but the heart within me was worn down by bitter grief. Now let's both attack him head on, let us fight it out with no sparing of spears, and discover whether Achilles will kill us both, and carry our blood-stained armour back to the hollow ships, or rather fall victim to your spear. Speaking thus, with her cunning Athene led him on. When the warriors came within close range of one another, the first to speak was great bright-helmeted Hector, no longer, son of Peleus, will I run from you, as before, when thrice around Priam's great city I fled, and never dared to await your attack. No. This time my heart tells me I must stand and confront you, whether to slay or be slain. So come, let's swear oaths by the gods, for they are the best witnesses and protectors of our agreements, I'll not mistreat you vilely, should it be that Zeus grant me the endurance to win, and I deprive you of life, but when I've stripped off your famous armour, Achilles, I'll return your corpse to the Achaeans, or you likewise mine. To him, with an angry glance, swift-footed Achilles replied, Hector, don't, damn you, make me speeches about agreements. Between lions and men binding oaths do not exist, nor are wolves and lambs ever like-minded at heart, but ceaselessly plotting trouble, each against the other. So there's no way for us to be friends, we can't exchange sworn oaths, no, before that one or the other must fall, and glut ours, the oxide shield combatant, with his blood. So summon up all your valour, you're going to need to be both spearman and doughty combatant. There's no longer any escape left for you. Very soon will Pallas Athene lay you low through my spear. Now you'll pay the full price for the loss of my comrades, speared in your wild attack. With that he poised and let fly his far-shadowing spear, but illustrious Hector, watching carefully, dodged it, crouching down, and the bronze spear flew over him, fixed itself in the ground, but Athene snatched it up, gave it back to Achilles, unseen by Hector, the people's shepherd, and Hector now exclaimed to the peerless son of Peleus, you missed. And you haven't, it seems, O oh godlike Achilles, yet found out my fate from Zeus, despite what you supposed. Turns out you're just a glib talker, a tricky wordsmith, aiming to scare me, make me forget all my strength and valour. Now it won't be my fugitive back that you plant your spear in, you'll have to aim for my breast as I charge you, if indeed some god grants you that much. Your turn now to avoid my bronze spear. May you catch the whole of it in your flesh. The war would certainly be much easier for the Trojans once you were dead. For you are their greatest trouble. With that he poised and let fly his far-shadowing spear, struck Peleus's son's shield in the middle, didn't miss it. Yet the spear bounced back off the shield, left Hector enraged because the swift missile had flown in vain from his hand. He stood there downcast, and, having no second ashwood spear, called out, in a carrying voice, to white-shielded Daphobos, demanding a lance, but he was nowhere near at hand. Then Hector knew the truth in his heart, and exclaimed, Alas! The gods have indeed now summoned me to my death. I thought the hero Daphobos was here by my side, but he's inside the wall, it's Athene who's been here deceiving me. A vile death now awaits me, no longer distant, but close, and no escape, this must always have been what Zeus was after. He and his son, the deadly archer, at one time they were glad to protect me, but now my fate has caught up with me. So let me die, not ingloriously, or without a struggle, but having done some great deed for those unborn to learn of. So saying, he drew from its scabbard the keen-edged sword that hung at his side, a huge and solid weapon, collected himself, and charged, like a high-flying eagle that swoops down plainward, plummeting through dark clouds to snatch up in its claws a young lamb or a cowering hare, so Hector charged. His sharp sword flashing high, and Achilles rushed at him, heart full of wildly raging strength, with his shield, fine, intricately wrought, out in front to protect his body, while the bright helmet, four-plated, nodded above, and, waving all round it, the lovely gold plumes that Hephaestos had set thick about its crown. Like that star that goes among other stars at nightfall, the star of evening, the loveliest star in the heavens, was the gleam that shone from the sharp spear that Achilles brandished in his right hand, planning trouble for noble Hector.
studying his sweet flesh to see where it might best yield. Now all the rest of his body had its bronze battle gear, the fine armor he'd stripped from Patroclos after his killing, but one spot showed, where the collarbones held apart shoulders from neck, the gullet, where life's most quickly ended. Here, as Hector charged, was where noble Achilles speared him, clean through his tender neck drove the spear point. And yet the bronze-laden ashwood spear never severed the windpipe, so he could still frame words, could make a response when down in the dust, with Achilles exulting above him, Hector, you doubtless thought, while stripping Patroclos, you'd be safe, I was elsewhere, to me you gave not a thought. You fall. His distant avenger, stronger by far, was left behind by the hollow ships, that was I, who have now unstrung your limbs. You the dogs and birds of prey will tear apart vilely, while he will get burial from the Achaeans. To him bright-helmeted Hector faintly replied, By your life I implore you, by your knees, by your parents. Do not let the dogs make a meal of me beside the Achaeans' ships. Rather take the bronze and gold, unstinted, that my father and lady mother will give you, and return my body to be conveyed to my home, in order that the Trojans and Trojan wives may give me my share of fire in death. Then with an angry glance swift-footed Achilles said, Don't entreat me. You dog, by my knees or by my parents. I just wish there was a way for my raging heart to let me carve your flesh raw and eat it, in return for what you've done, as surely as there's no man who'll keep the dogs from your head, not though they bring here and weigh out ten or twenty times a fair ransom, and promise even more, not even if they were ordered to pay me your weight in gold by Priam, Dardano's son. Not even so will your lady mother lay you, the son she bore, on a beer and mourn you, no, dogs and birds will eat. Every last scrap of you. Then, dying, bright-helmeted Hector said to him, I know you too well, I foresee my fate, I could never persuade you. Truly the heart in your breast is of iron. Think on this, then, it may be I who provoke the gods' wrath against you, that day when Paris and Phoebus Apollo kill you, for all your valour, before the Scurrian gates. When he'd spoken thus, death's end enshrouded him, and the soul fled from his limbs. Fluttered down to Hades. Bewailing its fate, youth and manhood all abandoned. Yet noble Achilles still harangued him, even when dead, lie there, corpse. My own fate I'll accept whenever Zeus may determine it, he, and the other immortal gods. With that he tore out his bronze spear from the body, and laid it aside, and began to strip from Hector's shoulders his blood-stained armour. The other sons of the Achaeans ran up round him, gazed at the build and amazing beauty of Hector, yet not one failed to stab him as he stood there, and turning, would say to his neighbour as he did so, well, it's a great deal easier to deal with Hector now than when he burned up our vessels with blazing fire. Thus a man would speak, then step up and stab the corpse. But swift-footed noble Achilles, after stripping him, stood up among the Achaeans, and then addressed them in winged words, my friends, you rulers and leaders of the Argives. Since the gods have granted that we bring this man down who's done us more harm than all others put together, come, let's now make trial in arms around the city, and so more clearly learn what the Trojans have in mind, will they leave their high citadel now this man is fallen? Or hold out regardless? Even though Hector is no more? But why is my heart debating such matters with me? There lies by the ships a corpse unwept, unburied, Patroclos. Him I'll never forget, while I'm still among the living, my limbs still quick and active. And though men forget the dead in the realm of Hades, yet even there I'll remember my dear comrade. Come then, you young Achaeans, chanting our victory pee and let's go back to the hollow ships, take this fellow with us. We've achieved great glory, we've slain noble Hector, to whom the Trojans throughout their city prayed as to a god. With that he devised vile treatment for noble Hector, in both feet behind he pierced holes along the tendons from heel to ankle, and through them then strung oxide straps that he tied to his chariot, leaving the head to be dragged. Then he mounted, taking the famous battle gear with him, and whipped up his horses. They, nothing loath, took flight. And from the dragged body the dust rose up, on either side its dark hair was spread out. And all in the dust there lay the head that was once so handsome, now to his foes Zeus gave Hector for outrage on his own native soil. So all his head was befouled with dust, and his mother tore at her hair, flung her glimmering veil far from her, and screamed out loud when she set eyes on her son, while his father groaned piteously and the folk around them set up a great wailing and weeping throughout the city. This was what it was most like, as though all towering Ilion, top to bottom, were left smouldering with fire, and the people could barely restrain the old man, in his frenzy to break free and rush out through the Dardanian gates. He kept begging them all as he rolled about in the filth, calling out names, appealing to each man in turn, hold off, friends. If you care for me, leave me alone, 
to make my way out of the city, to the ships of the Achaeans, where I'll plead with that man, so violent, so ungoverned in act, if is any respect for my years, any pity for my old age. He too has a father. A man, surely, much as I am, Peleus, who sired him and brought him up to work disaster upon the Trojans, me above all his saddened, so many the flourishing sons of mine his slaughtered. Yet for all these I mourn not so much, despite my sorrow, as for one, grief over whom will consign me to Hades' realm, Hector. Ah, how I wish he'd died in my arms, for then we'd at least have had our fill of wailing and shedding of tears, the ill-fated mother who bore him, and I, myself. So he spoke, weeping, the citizens added their lamentation to his, and among the Trojan women it was Hecabe led the keening, ah, child, wretched me. How I've suffered. Why live on now you're dead? For me, by day, by night, you were my pride and boast through the city, a comfort to all, both the men and the women of Troy, who would salute you like a god, for indeed to them you embodied great glory while you lived, but now death and your destiny have caught you. So she spoke, weeping. But Hector's wife as yet knew nothing. For no honest messenger had so far arrived with the news that her husband had stayed on outside the gates. She was at her loom in a back room of their high house, weaving a red double cloak, with figured patterns on it. Now she called out through the house to her neat-dressed handmaids to set on the fire a great cauldron, make sure that there was a hot bath for Hector when he came home from the fighting, unaware, in her folly, that far from all baths he'd been slain, through Achilles' hands, by grey-eyed Pallas Athene, but then she heard screams and wailing from the wall. And her limbs trembled, the shuttle dropped from her hand, and once more she spoke among her neat-dressed handmaids, two of you come and attend me. While I see what's happened, it was my husband's revered mother whose voice I heard, and in my own breast the heart leaps into my mouth. My knees are paralyzed, some disasters at hand for Priam's children. May my ears never hear such tidings. Yet I'm sore afraid that noble Achilles may have cut off daring Hector alone, and have driven him from the city out to the plain, and by now may have put an end to the dangerous courage that always possessed him, he'd never stay back in the ranks, but always would charge out ahead, yield to none in his might. So saying, she rushed through the hall like a crazy woman, heart beating wildly, accompanied by her handmaids. But when she reached the crowd of men at the ramparts she stood on the wall and looked round. And then perceived him being dragged in front of the city, the galloping horses were ruthlessly hauling him off to the Achaean's hollow ships. Then down came black night on her eyes, enshrouding them, and she sank backward, gasping out her vital breath and far from her head she flung the shining headbands, the diadem, the hairnet, the plaited clasp, and lastly the veil that had been a present from golden Aphrod, on the day that bright-helmeted Hector led her out as his bride from Eshan's house, after bringing bride gifts past counting, and round her thronged Hector's sisters and his brother's wives, who held her. Between them, in shock to the verge of death. But when she recovered, and the spirit returned to her breast, then, between heaving sobs, she cried out before Troy's women, Hector, how wretched I am. To one fate, then, we were born, both of us, you here in Troy, in the house of Priam, and I in Thabe, down there under wooded Plakos, in the house of Eshan, who brought me up from a baby, luckless father, doomed child. Better he'd never had me. Now you're going to the realm of Hades. Deep under the earth. But me you're abandoning to my hateful grief, a widow left in your halls. Our son's still an infant, the child you and I, so unlucky, created, you'll never, now you're dead, be a help to him, Hector, nor he to you, since even should he survive the Achaean's baleful war forever thereafter toil and sorrow will be his lot, since others will set their boundary stones on his land. The day an orphan is made cuts him off from his age group, he goes with head downcast, tears moisten his cheeks. A needy child, he approaches his father's comrades, tugs at the cloak of one, the tunic of another. Some will pity him, briefly. One holds out his cup, long enough to wet his lips, yet not his palate. Then one with both parents alive will kick him out of the feast, punching him up, and reviling him in harsh terms, out of here, quick. You've no father feasting with us. Then the child runs back weeping to his widowed mother, he, Astyanax, who before, on his father's knee, would eat nothing but marrow and the rich fat of sheep, and when sleep came on him, and he stopped his childish play would sleep in a bed in the arms of his own nurse, in his own soft cot, his heart replete with good cheer. But now he may suffer much, being bereft of his dear father, my Astyanax, lord of the city, whom the Trojans speak of thus since you alone, Hector, preserved their gates and their lofty walls. But now beside the curved ships, and far from your parents, coiling worms will devour you when the dogs have had their fill of your nakedness, 
while your bedclothes lie unused in your halls, fine, closely woven, well fashioned by women's hands. But all these things now I'll burn to ashes in blazing fire, they're no longer of use to you, you'll never lie on them, in honour of you, from the Trojans and from the women of Troy. So she spoke, weeping. And the women lamented with her. Book 23. So these were mourning throughout the city, but the Achaeans, when they all had made their way back to the ships and the Hellespont, now scattered, the rest of them, each man to his own vessel, but Achilles would not permit the Myrmidons to disperse, and among his war-minded comrades thus he spoke up, Myrmidons. Lords of swift horses, most loyal of comrades, let's not yet unyoke our whole-hoofed steeds from their chariots, but with horses and chariots let us now drive close to Patroclos, and mourn him, this is a dead man's privilege. Then, when we've had our fill of painful lamentation, we'll unyoke our horses and all take our evening meal together. So he spoke, they all cried out as one, and Achilles led them, three times round the corpse they drove their fine-maned steeds, weeping, while the tea stirred in them an urge for lamentation. Damp with tears was the sand, and damp the men's battle gear, such a maker of rout was he whose loss they mourned. The son of Peleus now led them in their heartfelt lamentation. Laying his murderous hands upon his comrade's breast, greetings, Patroclos, even in Hades' realm. For now all I promised you earlier I'm bringing to fulfilment, that I'd drag Hector here, give him raw to the dogs to rend, and in front of your pyre would cut the throats of a dozen noble Trojan youths, so enraged I was at your killing. With that he devised vile treatment for noble Hector, stretching him out face down by Menoetios's son's beer, there in the dust, each man took off his arms and armour of gleaming bronze, unyoked his neighing horses. Then they sat down beside the ship of Iacos as swift-footed grandson in their thousands, he gave them a heartwarming funeral feast. Many sleek oxen now struggled around the iron knife while being slaughtered, many sheep and bleating goats, and many a white-tusked hog, bulked up with lard, was stretched out there to be singed in Hephaestos's flame, and around the corpse blood ran thick, by the cupful. The swift-footed lord, son of Peleus, was now escorted to noble Agamemnon by the Achaeans' princes, although they barely convinced him, so incensed he was for his comrade. But when their procession arrived at Agamemnon's hut, they issued instructions at once to the clear-voiced heralds to set on the fire a great cauldron, hoping they'd persuade Peleus's son to wash himself clean of the clotted gore. But he adamantly refused them, and swore an oath besides, no, by Zeus, who's the highest and best of all the gods. It isn't right that water should come anywhere near my head till I've burned Patroclos's body, and raised him a burial mound, and have cut my hair, since never again will such grief possess my heart, while I'm numbered among the living. For now, then, feast if we must, though the thought revolts me, but tomorrow at dawn, Agamemnon, you lord of men, have the troops forage for firewood. Make ready all that's proper for the dead man to have when he goes down into darkness, so the unwearying fire may burn him away. May quickly remove him from our sight and the troops returned to their work. So he spoke, and they listened attentively, did as he asked. Each man quickly made ready his evening meal, and then they feasted, and no one's heart lacked a fair share in the feasting. But when they had satisfied their desire for food and drink, they went, each to his own hut, to get their rest. But Peleus's son lay on the shoreline of the thunderous sea, heavily sighing, with all his myrmidons around him, in a clear space, where the comas came crashing on the beach. But when sleep laid hold of him, soothing the cares of his heart, sweetly descending, since his bright limbs were exhausted from harrying Hector as far as windy Ilion, then there came to him the spirit of unhappy Patroclos, like his live self in all aspects, his stature, his fine eyes, his voice, and even the clothes he had on were the same. He stood over Achilles' head and addressed these words to him, You sleep. And you've proved forgetful of me. Achilles. While I lived you didn't neglect me, now I'm dead you do. Bury me with all speed, let me pass through Hades' gates, the spirits, the shades of the dead, are keeping me out, won't let me cross the river to mingle with them, so here I uselessly wander outside Hades' wide-gated realm. And give me your hand, I beseech you, for never again will I come back from Hades, once you give me my share of fire. Never more, as in life, will we sit apart from our comrades making plans together. The dread death spirit assigned me from birth has now opened her jaws to swallow me down. And for you too your lot is destined, godlike Achilles, to perish beneath the ramparts of the noble Trojans. One more thing I'll say, and ask of you, if you'll agree, don't have my bones interred apart from yours, Achilles, but together, the way we were both brought up in your house after Menoetios brought me, a child still, from Opoes to your home, 
because of that wretched manslaughter business, the day that I lost my temper and killed Amphidamas' son, through childish folly, not meaning to, over a game of dice, and then Pelias the horseman took me into his own house, and brought me up caringly, and named me to be your squire. So have the same vessel enclose our bones together, golden, two-handled, the one your lady mother gave you. In answer to him swift-footed Achilles then said, Why? Dearest comrade. Have you come here to me thus? Why all these detailed instructions? Of course I shall make sure that everything's done, and exactly as you want it. Come closer, I beg you, if only for a brief moment let's embrace, and get our full measure of painful lamentation. So saying, he reached out to him with his hands, but failed to clasp him, Patroclos's spirit disappeared like smoke beneath the earth, crying thinly. Achilles, stunned, sprang up, clapped both hands together, and said, sadly wondering, well, so there really is something, even in Hades' realm, a spirit, a phantom, though with nothing substantial to it. For all night long the spirit of poor Patroclos stood over me, weeping and wailing, making requests for all he wanted done, looking marvelously like his living self. So he spoke, and stirred in them all the urge for lamentation, and dawn, the rosa-fingered, revealed them weeping still around the piteous corpse. Now the lord Agamemnon sent out mules and men from all the huts in camp to bring back firewood, they had a fine warrior in charge. Mary owns, who was squire to kindly Idomeneus. Off they went, hands clutching axes for felling timber and well-braided ropes, with the mules going ahead of them, back and forth, uphill and down they went, across and aslant, and when they reached the spurs of spring-rich Ida, at once they briskly set to, began felling tall leafy oaks with the keen-edged bronze, and a mighty crash they made on falling, after which the Achaeans split them apart and hitched them behind the mules. These churned up the earth with their feet, straining plainwards through the thick undergrowth. The woodcutters all carried logs, having been so ordered by Meriones, the squire of kindly Idomeneus. On the shore in a row they stacked them, at the point where Achilles was planning a great burial mound for Patroclos and himself. When they'd amassed great piles of timber all around they sat down in a group and waited. Then Achilles promptly issued his orders to the war-loving Myrmidons to gird on their bronze gear. And for each man to yoke his horses to their chariot. Up they all got, and donned their equipment, then mounted their chariots, both warriors and drivers. The chariot teams went ahead, a cloud of infantry followed, thousands strong, in their midst his comrades bore Patroclos, his body clothed with the hair they'd cut off and laid upon it. Behind them noble Achilles in sorrow cradled the head of the peerless comrade he now was sending to Hades' realm. When they came to the place that Achilles had indicated they laid down the body, and quickly stacked wood in plenty for it. Then swift-footed noble Achilles thought of something else. Standing away from the pyre he cut a lock of his fair hair that he'd let grow long to offer to the river Spacheos, and said, deeply troubled, looking out at the wine-faced deep, Spacheos, all in vain did my father Pelis assure you that when I came back home to my native land, for you I'd cut off my hair and make a fine sacred offering. Fifty ungelded rams I'd sacrifice on the spot into your waters. Beside your precinct and fragrant altar. Such the old man's vow, but you failed to fulfil his purpose. Now, since I'll not be returning, ever, to my own country, let me give this lock to the hero Patroclos, to take with him. So saying, in the hands of his dear comrade he placed the lock, and thus stirred in them all the urge for mourning, and indeed the sun's light would have set on their sorrow, had not Achilles at once approached Agamemnon. Saying, son of Atreus, since it's your word that the Achaean troops will most readily obey, one can have one's fill of wailing. Dismiss them now from the pyre, bid them ready their meal. We, to whom the dead man was closest, will take care of all matters here, but let the commanders stay with us. On hearing this, the lord of men, Agamemnon, at once dispersed the troops among their trim ships, but the close mourners remained, and stacked the timber, making a pyre with each side one hundred feet in length, and upon it, silently grieving, set the dead body. Then many fattened sheep and sleek shambling oxen they flayed and dressed by the pyre and from all these great-hearted Achilles took fat, and covered the corpse from head to foot, piled the flayed carcasses round it, and two-handled jars of honey and oil he set down, resting against the bier. Then four horses with arching necks he hastily, sobbing aloud, flung onto the pyre. Nine dogs there had been that were fed from their master's table, two of these he tossed on the pyre after cutting their throats, and twelve noble sons of the high-spirited Trojans he slew with the bronze, vile actions were in his mind. Then to the pyre he set fire's iron might, to consume it, and groaned aloud, and called on his dear comrade by name, greetings, Patroclos, even in the realm of Hades. See, now I'm fulfilling all that I promised you earlier, 
twelve noble sons of the high-spirited Trojans, all these, with you, the flames will devour, but Priam's son Hector I'll not give to fire, but to dogs to feed on. So he spoke, threatening, yet no dogs were getting at Hector, for the daughter of Zeus, Aphrod, kept him safe from them by day and by night, anointed his body with rose-scented ambrosial oil, so the dragging would not lacerate his flesh, and Phoebus Apollo upon him projected a dark cloud, from the heavens down to the plain, enshrouding the whole site that the dead man occupied, to stop the strength of the sun from shriveling the flesh that embodied his sinews and his limbs. But the pyre of the dead Patroclos would not catch fire. So now swift-footed Achilles had another idea, standing away from the pyre. He prayed to two of the winds, the north and west, Boreas, Zephyros, promised fine offerings, implored them, while pouring libations from a golden goblet, to come, help set the body quickly ablaze with fire, by speeding the wood to its kindling. Iris, hearing his prayers, lost no time, but carried his message on to the winds. They were all met at the home of blustery Zephyros, in the midst of a banquet. Iris came running, stopped on the stone threshold. When they caught sight of her they all jumped up, and each one wanted her by him. But she wouldn't sit and join them, explained herself thus, I can't stay, I have to go back to the streams of ocean, to the land of the Ethiopians, they're making fine sacrifices to the immortals, and I am to share in their sacred feast. But Achilles is praying that Boreas and blustery Zephyros will come, and promising them fine offerings if they do, to fan the flames of the pyre on which there lies Patroclos for whom the Achaeans are all making loud lament. So she, having thus spoken, went on her way, they rose with a marvellous clamour, stampeding the clouds before them, and quickly reached the deep sea, blowing on it, the waves surged up before that shrill blast. They came to rich soil Troy, and swooped on the pyre, loud roared a wondrous conflagration. So the whole night through they fanned the flames of the pyre, blowing shrilly, the whole night through swift Achilles, clutching a two-handled cup, took wine from a golden bowl and poured it out on the ground, till the earth was drenched, calling upon the spirit of the unlucky Patroclos. As a father mourns for a son while he's burning his bones, a son just wed, whose death has shocked his unlucky parents, so Achilles wept for his comrade as he burned his bones, dragging himself round the pyre, and ceaselessly sobbing. At the hour that the morning star goes heralding light on earth, followed by dawn, saffron-clad, spreading over the deep. Then the funeral pyre died down and ceased to flame. Now the winds set out back on their homeward journey, over the Thracian sea, at their coming it surged and thundered. And the son of Peleus withdrew from the smouldering pyre and lay down, exhausted, and sweet sleep swept over him. But when Atreus' son and his people all assembled together, the clamour and noisy tread of their coming awoke him, he sat up and called out to them, saying, Son of Atreus, and you other lords and chieftains of all the Achaeans. First quench the still smouldering pyre with fire-bright wine, in each part that the fire's force reached. When that's accomplished, let us collect the bones of Patroclos, Menoitios's son, sorting them carefully. They're easy enough to distinguish, he lay at the heart of the pyre, while the rest had to burn at its edges. Horses and men all mingled together, then lay them up in a golden bowl, with a double layer of fat as cover, until I too am vanished to Hades. But you're not to toil at raising a huge grave mound now, just one that's befitting though afterwards you Achaeans can make it broader and higher, those of you, that is. Still left among the bench vessels when I myself am gone. So he spoke, and they heeded Peleus's swift-footed son. They quenched the still smouldering pyre with fire-bright wine in each part that the fire's force reached, where the ash had settled. Weeping, they gathered their kindly comrades' white bones into a golden bowl, with a double layer of fat, this they laid up in his hut, put a soft cloth to cover it. They marked out the grave mound circle, laid a base of stones upon it around the pyre, then piled on loose earth, and, the mound once raised, began leaving, Achilles however kept them all where they were, made them sit in broad assembly, fetched out prizes then from his ships, cauldrons and tripods, horses and mules and sturdy heads of oxen, and women with elegant sashes, and ingots of grey iron. First, for swift charioteers he set out splendid prizes, a woman to take away, one skilled in fine handiwork an eared tripod of twenty-two measures, these for the winner, for the runner-up. He provided a six-year-old mare, unbroken, and pregnant with a mule foal, for third place he set out a cauldron as yet untouched by fire, a fine one, for measures capacity, new, bright, polished, for the fourth, two talents of gold was the prize allotted, for the fifth, a two-handled bowl, as yet untouched by fire. Then he stood up and spoke as follows among the Argives, son of Atreus, and all you other well-grieved Achaeans. Here are the prizes awaiting the horsemen in this contest. 
If we Achaeans were now competing in honour of someone else, then I'd surely win first prize, and bear it away to my hut, for you know by how much my horses surpass all others, being immortal, Poseidon bestowed them as a present on Peleus, my father, and he bequeathed them to me. But I shall remain here, I, and my whole-hoofed horses. So great the renown of the charioteer that they've lost, a kindly man too, who'd frequently work soft oil into their manes. When he'd wash them with shining water. Now both of them stand and mourn him, low on the ground their manes are trailing, they stand still. Grieving at heart. But you others in camp here, get ready, any Achaean with confidence in his horses and his dovetailed chariot. So spoke Pelis's son, and the horsemen quickly gathered. The first of all to come forward was Eumelos, lord of men, Admetos's dear son, a man highly skilled in horsemanship. Next there stood up Tydeus's son, the mighty Diams, leading beneath the yoke Troza's horses, that he'd earlier taken by force from Aeneas, himself rescued by Apollo. Next up was Atreus's son, the fair-haired Menelos, scion of Zeus, who yoked a speedy team of horses, Agamemnon's mare Ave, and his own Padagos. Echepolos, son of Anchises, gave Agamemnon the mare as a bribe, to avoid going with him to Windy Ilion, so he'd get to stay home and enjoy life, since he'd been granted vast riches by Zeus, in broad Sicyon, where his home was. This mare Menelos now yoked, she was straining to race. Antilochos was the fourth to ready his fine-maned horses. The splendid son of Nestor. That high-spirited king, and grandson of Nellius, Pylos bred were the swift-foot steeds that drew his chariot. His father stood there beside him, with well-meant advice for a son who knew plenty himself, Antilochos, young though you are, you've been befriended by Zeus and Poseidon, who've taught you every aspect of horsemanship, no great need, then, for me to instruct you, you know just how to wheel your horses round the turn mark. But since yours are the slowest, I think you'll have some trouble. Still, their horses may be swifter, but your competitors can't match you in clever planning, so it's up to you, dear boy. Get your mind round every kind of cunning contrivance, don't let those prizes slip away out of your grasp. Shrewdness serves woodcutters better than mere brute force, it's through shrewdness a steersman, out on the wine face deep, can control a swift ship when it's battered by gale force winds, shrewdness is what lets one driver edge out another. Some are content to rely on their horses and chariot, will carelessly take turns wide on this side and that. Let their team swerve over the track. Not keep them in hand, but the man who knows every trick, though driving worse horses, will keep his eye on the turn, hug it close, he never forgets, from the start, to maintain taut control of his oxide reins, but steadily holds them in hand, one eye on the team ahead. Now I'll tell you about a clear marker, you cannot miss it. There's the dried wooden stump of a tree, about six feet high, of oak or pine, it doesn't rot in the rain, with two white stones set against it, on either side, at the track's turning point, with smooth driving all round it. A memorial, maybe, of some mortal long since dead, or perhaps set up as a race mark by men in olden times, and now swift-footed Achilles has made it his turning post. Steer tight round this, driving horses and chariot close, and yourself, at the taut leather rail, lean a touch to the left of your team, while you also cheer on your offside horse, give it the goad. Let the rein run loose in your hand but have the nearside horse run close to the turning post. So close, that the crafted wheel's hub seems to graze its surface yet doesn't in fact touch the stone, do that, and you risk having your horses maimed and your chariot wrecked. A delight for your competitors that would be, but for you a disaster. So, my dear boy, use your wits, be on your guard, for if at the turning post you get ahead of the others, there's no one who'll catch or pass you in a final spurt, not even were he to chase you driving noble Aaron, addressed as a swift horse. Divinely sired, or the team of Laomedon, fine thoroughbreds brought up in these parts. With that, Nestor, Nellius's son, sat down again in his place, having instructed his son how to master every last detail. Mary Owens was the fifth to ready his fine-maned horses. Then they mounted their chariots, threw in their lots. Achilles shook them, out flew the lot of Nestor's son Antilochos. Lord Eumelos drew the place next to him, followed by Atreus's son, famed spearman Menelos. The next starting place fell by lot to Marion's, last place went to Tydeus's son. Far the best of them all. So they lined up, and Achilles showed them the turning post far off on the level plain, he set an observer by it, the godlike Phoenix, his father's old deputy, to umpire the race, give a true report of its outcome. Then they all at once raised their whips above their horses, started them with the reins, drove them on with urgent commands and they swiftly advanced across the plain, at full gallop, moving away from the ships, and from under their breasts the dust, kicked up, 
rose high, like a cloud or a whirlwind, and with the blast of the wind their manes streamed out. At times the wheels would run smoothly over the nurturing earth, but at times were bumped into the air, while their drivers, standing, held on, and each man's heart beat fast with excitement as they all strove to win, and kept urging their horses on, and the horses flew forward, raising the dust on the plain. But when the swift teams were completing the final stretch, back towards the grey sea, then each one's true quality became clear, as the horses were stretched to the limit. The racing mares of Fear's grandson, Eumelos, moved into the lead, and, next, Diamond stallions, the horses of Troes, were not far behind, indeed, so close upon their heels that they seemed on the point of mounting Eumelos's chariot, and with their breath his back and his broad shoulders grew warm, so close they bent their heads as they sped, and now Tydeus's son would have passed or dead-heated him, had he not stirred up resentment in Phoebo's Apollo, who struck the shining whip. Clean out of his hand. Then from his eyes there started tears of fury as he saw Eumelos's mares going still faster than before, while his own pair were handicapped, running without a goad. But the trick played on Tydeus's son by Apollo had not escaped Athene, quickly she chased after the shepherd of men, returned his whip to him. Put power into his horses, then in her fury she went for the son of Admetos, his team's yoke was smashed by the goddess, the mares both bolted off track. And the yoke pole slipped to the ground. Eumelos was flung headlong out of the chariot, by the wheel, stripping skin from his elbows and mouth and nose, and leaving his forehead above the eyebrows all bruised, while both his eyes were brimming with tears, and his strong young voice was stilled. Tydeus's son then swerved his whole-hoofed horses round him, and led the field, far ahead of the rest, for Athene had put strength in his horses, bestowed on him great glory, with Atreus's son, fair-haired Menelos, the next behind him. Antilochos now called out to his father's horses, you too, get moving as well. Put your full strength into it. I'm not asking you to compete with those up front there, Tydeus's warlike son's horses, those to which Athene has just given strength, and on him bestowed great glory, no, overtake Atreus's son's team, don't be left behind. So, move it. Unless you both want to be put to shame by Aeth, and her a mare? You champions. Why so slow? For I'll tell you this and it will certainly be fulfilled, no care will you get from Nestor, the people's shepherd, rather he'll kill you at once with the keen-edged bronze, if through your lack of spirit all we win is a lesser prize. So get in pursuit, gallop after them at full stretch, and what I'll contrive and work to achieve is this, we'll pass them where the track narrows, I'll not miss it. So he spoke, and they, terrified by their master's reproof, quickened their pace for a little. Then, almost at once, steadfast Antilocho sighted the narrow point where the road ran hollow, a gully had formed, where winter floods, collecting, had torn away part of the track, deepened the whole stretch, and here steered Menelos, to avoid teams jostling abreast. But Antilochos now took his own whole-hoofed pair off track, and began to overtake him, driving close in, side by side, and Atreus's son, in alarm, shouted out to Antilochos, this is crazy driving. Antilochos! Rain in your horses. Here the track's narrow, it'll soon be wider for passing. This way you'll run into my chariot, wreck us both. So he spoke, but Antilochos pressed on still more fiercely, urging his team with the goad, as though not hearing. About as far as the range of a discus swung from the shoulder, that a young man throws when making trial of his strength, so far they ran thus. But then the mares of Atreus' son dropped back, as he decided he'd race them hard no longer to avoid their whole-hoofed horses colliding on the track and upsetting the well-strapped chariots, and themselves being thrown out in the dust, through their great lust to win. Then fair-haired Menelos cried out in stern reproof, Antiochos, no other mortals more malignant than you. Keep on, then, we Achaeans were mistaken to think you wise. Even so, you won't get the prize without a challenge on oath. So he spoke, and then called out to his horses, saying, Don't hold back, don't stop now through grief at heart. Their feet and laboring knees will tire out long before yours do. Old nags, age deprives them of their youthful vigour. So he spoke, and they, terrified by their master's reproof, quickened their pace, and soon came up close behind the others. Now the Argives were sitting assembled, watching out for the horses as they flew onward, raising the dust on the plain, and Idomeneus. Cretan chieftain, perched away from the crowd, high up on a lookout point, was the first to glimpse them. When he heard a man's distant voice urging his horses on he recognized that, and spotted a horse way out ahead, all chestnut in color, except for its forehead, and there it had a round white blaze resembling the full moon. 
Up he stood, and addressed the Argives in these words, my friends, rulers, and leaders of the Argives, am I the only one who can actually see these horses, or can you see them too? Other horses now seem to leading, and are different drivers in sight. The mares that were in front on the first stretch, must have tripped up at some point, I certainly saw them reach the turning post in the lead, but now I can nowhere discern them, although my eyes have searched for them everywhere, all over the Trojan plain. Did the driver perhaps drop his reins, was he unable to hold his course well round the post? Did he fail on the turn? He must, I fear, have been thrown there. His chariot wrecked, and his mares, in a wild frenzy, must have bolted from the track. But stand up and look for yourselves, I myself cannot recognize anything clearly, to me, the man looks as though he is an Aetolian by birth, a ruler among the Argives, Tydeus the horsebreaker's son, the mighty Diams. Oileus's son, Swift Aeus, now shamefully rebuked him, Idomeneus, always the big mouth. Those high-stepping mares are still a long way off, racing over the broad plain. You're nowhere near the youngest among the Argives, nor are the eyes in your head by far the sharpest, yet your big mouth's forever yapping. You've no right to be such a blabbermouth, others here are better than you. The same mares are in the lead now as were before, those of Eumelos, and his the driver, holding the reins. Growing angry at him, the Cretan leader retorted, Aias, peerless at insults, dim-witted. In all other ways you lag far behind the Argives, your mind is so rigid. Come on then. Let's wager a tripod or a cauldron, and both accept Atreus's son Agamemnon as the judge of which horses are in the lead, you'll learn that when you pay. So he spoke, and swift Aias, Oileus's son, at once jumped up, in a fury, to answer him with hard words and their quarrel would certainly have gone still further, had not Achilles himself stood up and made this speech, no more of these angry insults to and fro between you, Aias, Idomeneus. This is bad talk, most improper, you'd reprimand anyone else who behaved that way. Sit down now in the assembly, both of you, keep a watch for the horses, they're going flat out to win, they'll be here any moment now. Then you'll know, each one of you, which Argive's horses are lagging, and which are in the lead. While he was speaking, Tydeus's son drove up at speed, plying his whip from the shoulder, and his horses, high-stepping, came lightly skimming down the track. While the rays dust kept blowing against their charioteer, and the chariot itself, decorated with gold and with tin, ran behind the swift-footed team, and barely a trace of the wheel rim's passage was left behind in the powdery dust as the pair sped onward. Then at last he pulled up in the midst of the place of assembly, the sweat still coursing down from his horse's necks and chests to the ground. To the ground he too sprang from his gleaming chariot and propped his whipstock against the yoke. Nor did sturdy Stenelos waste any time, but briskly claimed the prize, the woman, the eared tripod, which he gave to his high-hearted comrades to carry off, and himself unyoked the horses. Next to bring in his team was Antilochos, Nellius's grandson, having outstripped Menelos not by speed, but by cunning guile. Yet even so Menelos had his own pair right behind him, as near as a horse to the wheel, a horse that draws its master over the plain, straining hard at his chariot, with the outermost hairs of its tail just brushing the wheel's rim. Since it runs very close in front, and there's only the narrowest space between horse and wheel as it gallops over the wide plain, by so little was Menelos behind peerless Antilochos now, though at first it had been as far as a discus throw, having quickly caught up with him, since Agamemnon's mare, fine-maned Aeth, kept finding and using yet greater power, and if the course for the two of them had been much longer, then he'd have passed him and not left the outcome in dispute. Meriones, Idomeneus's excellent henchman, came in a spear's flight behind illustrious Menelos, for his fine-maned horses were the tardiest of them all, and he himself the least skillful at racing a chariot. The son of Admetos arrived long after the rest, dragging his splendid chariot, driving his team before him. At the sight of him swift-footed noble Achilles felt pity, and stood up among the Argives, and spoke winged words to them, driving his whole-hoofed horses now comes in, last of all, by far the best man, so let's give him a prize, as is proper, for second place, the first let Tydeus's son carry off. So he spoke, and they all approved his proposal, and now, with the Achaeans backing, he'd have given Eumelos the mare. Had Nestor's high-spirited son, Antilochos, in response not risen to lodge an appeal with Pelias's son Achilles, Achilles. You'll anger me deeply if you persist with this proposal, you'll be robbing me of my prize through dwelling on his misfortune. Horses and chariot wrecked, and him too, for all his skill. But if he had made a prayer to the immortals, he wouldn't have ended last in the race. Look, if you feel sorry for him, if he's so dear to you, back in your hut there's gold in abundance, there's bronze, and sheep too. 
and handmaids, as well as whole-hoofed horses. Choose from among these later, and give him a better prize, or right now, if you want some applause from the Achaeans, but the mare I will not give up, let any man who wants her make trial of me now in a hand-to-hand -hand engagement. So he spoke, and swift-footed noble Achilles smiled, enjoying Antilochos, since he was his dear companion, and in response addressed him with winged words, Antilochos, if you want me to find from my own possession some extra gift for Eumelos, I'll be glad to do so. I'll give him the corslet I stripped off Asteropios, it's of bronze. With an inlay of shining tin all round it in circles, this will be a most valuable gift for him. With that he commanded his dear comrade Automedon to fetch it out of the hut, he went off and came back with it, and presented it to Eumelos, who received it with pleasure. Now there also stood up among the Menelos, sore at heart, with implacable rage at Antilochos. A herald placed the scepter in his hand, and called out for silence among the Argives. Then Menelos, that man of godlike mien, addressed them, Antilochos, once so sensible, consider what you've done. You insulted my manhood, and you thwarted my horses by driving your own ahead, though they're far inferior. Come now, you leaders and rulers of the Argives, make a fair judgment between us, not favouring either man, lest one day some bronze-clad Achaean may declare, Menelos defeated Antilochos with his lies, went off taking the mare, because, while his own horses were nags, he himself carried all the weight in prestige and power. I myself will offer a ruling. And I don't think any other Danan will find fault with it, it will be rightful. As is the proper custom, Antilochos, Zeus's nursling, come here, and, standing before your horses and chariot, take the lithe whip with which you were lately driving, and, touching your horses, by the earth-encircling earthshaker swear that you never meant to block my chariot by deceit. To him then astute Antilochos offered this response, wait a moment. Remember that I'm a good deal younger than you, my lord Menelos, you're my elder and better? You know what a young man's transgressions are likely to be, his mind's over hasty, his judgment lacks real substance. So bear with me in your heart, the mare that I won I'll willingly give you, and if you want something better from my house, I'd be only too glad to provide that as well, here and now, Zeus's nursling, rather than spend my life out of favour with you, and at fault in the eyes of the gods. With that, great-hearted Nestor's son now led up the mare, and gave her to Menelos whose heart grew warm and melted like morning dew that coats the ears of grain where the plowland bristles with its ripe crop of tall wheat, just so. Menelos, did the heart melt in your breast? Then he addressed him, speaking in winged words, Antilochos, now I myself will yield. And freely abandon the anger I felt, since you were neither deranged nor foolish before, though this time your youth outweighed your sense. From now on take care to avoid outwitting your betters. Indeed, no other Achaean would so soon have won me over, but you've suffered much and done a great deal of work, you, your excellent father, your brother, on my behalf, so I'll yield to your entreaties, and, though the mare is mine, I'll give her to you, so those present may recognize that my spirit is never arrogant or unbending. With that he gave the mare to Numon, Antilochos's companion, to lead away, and then himself took the gleaming cauldron, while Mary owns, for fourth place, picked up the two gold talents, just as he'd driven. But the fifth prize went unclaimed, the two handled bowl, this Achilles gave to Nestor, took it over to him through the Argive assembly, and said, Something, old sir, for you too, let this bowl be your keepsake. A memento of the funeral of Patroclos. Whom nevermore will you look on among the Argives? I give you this prize without contest, for never again will you box or wrestle in competition, or hurl the javelin, run a footrace, since oppressive old age now weighs heavily upon you. So saying, he gave it to Nestor, who received it with pleasure, and addressed him, speaking with winged words, yes, indeed, all you just said, my child, was right and proper, my limbs are no longer strong, friend, nor can my arms still thrust out lightly and fast from either shoulder. Would I were as young again, my strength still undiminished, as on that day when the Epeans were burying Lord Amarynchius at Buprasian, and his sons gave prizes in the king's honour. Then no man was my equal, neither of the Apeans, nor of the great-hearted Aetolians, nor of the Pilians themselves. In boxing I beat Clytomedes, the son of Enops, and at wrestling Ancaios of Pluran, who stood against me, in the footrace I outran Iphiclos. Fine athlete though he was. And at spear-throwing I defeated both Phileus and Polydoros. In the chariot race alone did Actor's two sons defeat me, overtaking by force of numbers, begrudging me victory because the best prizes were kept for this last contest. Twin brothers they were, the one held the reins full time, held the reins full time, while the other drove with his whip. 
That's how I once was, now it's time for younger men to take on such tasks, while I must resign myself to wretched old age, though then I stood out among the heroes. So now honor your comrade too with funeral rites and contests. This gift I accept with pleasure, my heart rejoices that you think of me still as a friend, and do not forget the honor that's proper for me to receive among the Achaeans. May the gods in return for this grant you bountiful favors. So he spoke. Back through the great crush of the Achaeans Pelias his son now went, after hearing out this discourse by the son of Nellius. To set out prizes for painful boxing. He brought to the place of assembly a working mule, tethered it there, an unbroken six-year-old hinny, the toughest kind to break, and for the loser set out a two-handled cup. This done he stood up and spoke as follows among the Argives, son of Atreus, and all you other well-grieved Achaeans. We call on two men, the best, to compete for these prizes, putting up their fists, the one whom Apollo endows with strength to endure, something all the Achaeans recognize, can then return to his hut leading off the hardy mule, while the loser will carry away the two-handled cup. So he spoke, and at once there stood up a tall and powerful man, well skilled in boxing, Panopeus's son Epeos, who, one hand on the working mule, now addressed them, saying, come on then, the man who'll collect that two-handled cup. But the mule, I declare, no other Achaean will carry off by defeating me with his fists, since I tell you. I'm the greatest. Does it not suffice that I fall short in battle? There's no way a man can make himself expert in every activity. For this I declare. And it will certainly be fulfilled, utterly will I both mangle his flesh and shatter his bones. So it would really be best if his kinsmen all remain here, to carry him out after he's been broken up at my hands. So he spoke, and they all fell silent, in the hush only Euryalos rose, a godlike man. To confront him, the grandson of Talaus, the son of King Machistius, who long ago came to Thade when Oedipus had fallen, for his funeral, and there defeated all the sons of Cadmos. As his second Euryalos had Tydeus' a son, the famous spearman, to cheer him on, very keen that he should win. First he laid out a loincloth for him, and then produced some well-cut leather thongs from the hide of a field ox. So the two of them girded themselves, stepped out in the centre of the place of assembly, put up their mighty fists, and went at each other, their strong hands intermingled, and fearsome the grinding of jaws, while the sweat streamed down everywhere from their limbs. As Euryalos looked for an opening, noble Epeos moved in, uppercut him. No time did he stay on his feet, there and then his bright limbs gave beneath him. As, caught by the ruffling north wind, a fish will leap up from the rack-strewn shallows, and then a dark wave hides it, so, when struck. He jerked skyward, but great-hearted Epeos grabbed him. Set him upright. His comrades crowded round him, led him off through the place of assembly dragging his feet, spitting out blood clots, head lolling on one side. They brought him, still dazed, sat him down there in their midst, and themselves then went off to collect the two-handled cup. Peleus's son now displayed other prizes to the Danans, for a third contest, that of painful wrestling. The winner would get a great tripod, made to stand on the fire, twelve oxen's worth, the Achaeans figured amongst themselves, while for the loser Achilles set in their midst a woman, well skilled in much handiwork. For oxen they priced her at. Then he stood up among the Argives, and addressed them, saying, Up now, those who'd compete in this contest too. So he spoke, and thereupon there arose huge Aias, Telamon's son, and resourceful Odysseus also, that expert in crafty skills. So these two girded up, strode out into mid-assembly, and gripped each other's arms with their brawny fists, like crossbeams that some skilled carpenter dovetails together in a high house, with a view to resisting the gale-force winds. Their backbones cracked under the violent to-and-fro tugging of their powerful hands, their sweat poured down in streams. Clustering welts sprang up along their ribs and shoulders, reddened with blood. They never let up the pressure as they battled for victory and the well-wrought tripod, Odysseus could not trip Aias and pin him to the ground, nor Aias him, for Odysseus's great strength held firm. But when this began to weary the well-grieved Achaeans, then to Odysseus huge Aias, the son of Telamon, said, Zeus sprung son of Laetz, resourceful Odysseus, you lift me, or I you, for the rest, let Zeus decide. With that, he tried to lift him, but Odysseus had not forgotten his cunning, and struck him sharply behind the knee joint, loosened his limbs, threw him backward, and dropped on his chest. So that those watching were struck with amazement, and then much enduring noble Odysseus attempted to lift him. Raised him just off the ground, yet couldn't heft him up. He hooked his knee inside Aias's, and the two dropped back, close entwined, on the ground, and all begrimed with dust. 
then for the third time they'd have sprung to their feet and wrestled, had Achilles himself not got up and restrained them, break it up now. Don't strain till you hurt yourselves. You're both the victors. You'll both get the same prizes. Off with you now, so that other Achaeans can compete. So he spoke, and they listened, and were glad to obey, they wiped off the dust, and got back into their tunics. Peleus's son now set out other prizes, for speed of foot, a finely worked silver mixing bowl, of six measures only, yet for beauty it far exceeded every last one on earth, having been cunningly fashioned by Sidonian craftsmen. Phoenician merchants ferried it over the misty deep, and brought it to harbour, and made a present of it to Thoas, and as ransom for Priam's son Lycaon it was surrendered by Unios, the son of Jason, to the hero Patroclos. This bowl Achilles set out, in honour of his comrade, for whoever might prove the speediest in the foot race. For the runner-up he provided a big ox, rich with fat, and for the contestant in last place a half-talent of gold. Then he stood up and spoke among the Argives, saying, Up now, those who are ready to compete in this contest too. So he spoke, there then arose swift Aias, the son of Oileus, and resourceful Odysseus, and after them Nestor's son Antilochos, who as a runner beat all the youngsters. They all lined up, and Achilles showed them the turning point. Right from the start they ran at full stretch, but quickly Oileus's son moved ahead, with noble Odysseus behind him, very close, as close as a weaving rod comes to the breast of a fine-sashed woman, who deftly draws it tight with her hands, pulling the spool past the warp, and holding the rod right by her breast. So close ran Odysseus, his own feet trod in Aias's footsteps before the dust had settled on them. While down on Aias's head came Odysseus's panting breath as he kept up the fast pace, all the Achaeans were cheering his struggle to win, urged him on to yet greater efforts. But when they were running the final stretch, then Odysseus made a quick prayer in his heart to grey-eyed Athene, Hear me, goddess. Come as a good helper to my feet. So he spoke in prayer, and Pallas Athene heard him, and lightened his limbs, both his knees and his arms above them. But as they went into their final sprint for the prize, then Aya slipped as he ran, for Athene tripped him, where the dung was spread from the slaughter of the bellowing oxen killed for Patroclos by swift-footed Achilles, and his mouth and nostrils were filled with this cattle dung. So the bowl was won by noble and much-enduring Odysseus, who came in first, and the field ox went to illustrious Aias. He stood there, with one hand clutching his beast by its horn, and spat out the dung, and addressed the Argives, saying, Oh! My, that goddess for sure tripped my feet, she always stands by Odysseus and helps him, just like a mother. So he spoke, and they all had a hearty laugh at him. Antilochos then collected the prize for the last contestant, smiling, and spoke among the Argives, saying, Something, my friends, you all know, but I'll say it now just once more, even today the gods honor older men. Aias may be only a little older than I am, but Odysseus here belongs to an earlier generation, men call his a green old age, yet it's hard for any Achaean to match him at running, save only Achilles. So he spoke, with a flattering word for Pelis's swift-footed son. To this Achilles responded, addressing him as follows, Antilochos, not in vain shall your praise have been expressed. I shall add to your prize another half-talent of gold. So saying, he handed it to him, and he took it with pleasure. Then Pelis's son brought out a far-shadowing spear, set it down in the place of assembly. With a shield and helmet. The battle gear of Sarpedon, that Patroclos took from him, then stood up among the Argives, and addressed them, saying, We call on two men, the best, to compete for these prizes, to put on their armour, to take the flesh-cutting bronze, and make trial of each other in front of the troops assembled. Whichever one's first to touch the other's handsome flesh, gets through armour and black blood, pricks the body within. To him shall I give as prize this silver-studded sword, a fine Thracian weapon I took from Asteropios. As for the armour, let the two men share it between them, and we'll give them a splendid banquet here in the huts. So he spoke. There then arose huge Aias, Telamon's son, and the son of Tydeus stood up, the mighty Diams, and after arming themselves, on either side of the throng, they converged at the midpoint, eager to start their fight, exchanging fearsome glances, the Achaeans were astonished. So when, advancing, they closed in. The one on the other. Three times they attacked, three times fought hand to hand. Then Aias, faced with that balanced buckler, thrust hard, yet missed the flesh, for the corslet protected it, while Tydeus's son kept aiming over Aias's great tower shield with his gleaming spear point, going for his opponent's neck. At this point the Achaeans, in great alarm for Aias, commanded them to break off, accept equal prizes. 
but to Tydeus's son the hero presented the great sword, complete with its matching scabbard and its well-cut baldric. Next Pelis's son set out a great mass of pig iron, that Aetian, with his great strength, once used as a throwing weight, but him swift-footed noble Achilles had killed, and carried this lump off aboard his ships with his other possessions. Now he stood up and spoke as follows among the Argives, up now, those who'd compete in this contest too. Even if the winner's rich fields are far distant. He'll still enjoy five full revolving seasons to satisfy his requirements. It won't be for lack of iron that his shepherd or plowman will need to go to the city, this will provide for them. So he spoke, up jumped Polypoites, that staunch fighter, and godlike Leontius, a man of mighty strength, and Ius, Telamon's son, and noble Epeos. They stood in line, noble Epeos first took up the weight, swung it round, and let fly. The Achaeans all laughed at him. Leontius, scion of Ars, was the next to take his shot, and third to throw was huge Ius, Telamon's son, with his brawny fist, he got beyond both their marks. But when Polypoites, staunch fighter, got the mass in his hands, then, as far as an ox herd can fling his throwing stick, and away it flies, whirling, over the heads of his cattle, so far, beyond the assembly, he cast it, to great cheering, and the comrades of strong Polypoites rose to their feet and bore off the prize of their king to the hollow ships. Then for the archers Achilles offered dark iron, ten double axes he brought and set out. And ten single, and some way off set up the mast of a dark proud vessel in the sand, and tethered a fluttering pigeon to it by a thin cord attached to its foot, then told them that this was their target. Whoever hits the fluttering pigeon will get all the double axes to take back home as prizes, while the man who misses the bird, but hits the cord, will win the single axes, since his shot's the less accurate. So he spoke, up sprang Lord Tucros, great in his strength, up, two, Marion's, Idomeneus's worthy henchmen. They took the lots, shook them up in a bronze helmet, and Tucros drew first place. He promptly let fly a powerful shot, but had not promised to offer a fine sacrifice of firstling lambs to the Lord Apollo, so missed the bird, Apollo begrudging him that, but struck the thing cord by the bird's foot, where it was tethered, and the bitter shaft cut it clean through. The pigeon fluttered high up into the sky with the cord still hanging loosely earthward. And all the Achaeans gave a loud cheer. Marion's then quickly snatched the bow from Tucros's hand, he'd been holding an arrow ready while Tucros aimed, and vowed on the spot to Apollo the deadly archer that he'd make him a fine sacrifice of firstling lambs. High up under the clouds he spotted the fluttering pigeon, and as she circled he hit her in midbreast under the wing. The shaft passed clean through, dropped earthward, fixed itself in the ground in front of his feet while the bird alit on the mast of the dark proud vessel, and huddled there, her head hanging down. Her beating wings now drooped as the life left her limbs, and then, far from the mast she fell, as the crowd, in rapt amazement, watched. So Mary Owens collected all ten of the double axes, while two crows took the single ones back to the hollow ships. Then Pelis's son brought out a far-shadowing spear, and a flower-embossed cauldron, and fired still, worth an ox, and set them by the arena. As javelin throwers stood up, the son of Atreus among them, wide ruling Agamemnon, along with Marion's, Idomeneus's worthy henchmen. Then swift footed noble Achilles spoke up among them, son of Atreus, since we know how far you excel us all, how much stronger you are. As a spear thrower without rival, take this prize now, bear it off to the hollow ships, and the spear let us give to the hero Marion's. That is, if you wish it, this is my suggestion only. So he spoke, no descent from the lord of men, Agamemnon. To Mary owns the hero then gave the bronze spear, but his own splendid prize he handed to the herald Tolthibios. Book 24. Then the assembly broke up. The troops now scattered, each man off to his own swift ship, their minds on the evening meal and the joy of a full night's sleep. But Achilles wept and wept, thinking of his dear comrade, so that sleep the all-subduing got no hold on him. He kept tossing this way and that, missing Patroclos, his manhood, his splendid strength, all he'd been through with him all the hardships he'd suffered, facing men in battle and the waves of the cruel sea. Recalling these things he shed large tears, lying now stretched out on his side, but, restless, sometimes again on his back. Or prone. Then again he'd rise to his feet and wander, distraught, by the seashore, the rising dawn never brought light to sea and to beaches, but he was there. Then he would yoke his swift horses to the chariot, and tie on Hector behind it, to be dragged. And when he trailed him three times about Menoishios's dead son's mound, he'd go back and rest in his hut, leaving Hector's body stretched out prone in the dust. But Apollo, pitying Hector, preserved his flesh, though mortal, from all unseemly decay even in death, 
wrapped the golden aegis round his whole body to save the dragged corpse from disfigurement by Achilles. So Achilles in his fury aimed to mutilate noble Hector, but the sight of him stirred compassion among the blessed gods, and they urged Argos's sharp-sighted slayer, Hermes, to steal the corpse. This plan pleased the rest of them, but neither here nor Poseidon liked it, nor the grey-eyed virgin goddess, who still nursed the hatred they'd conceived for sacred Ilion. And Priam, and Priam's people, through Alexandros's blind delusion, for when these goddesses came to his courtyard he despised them, but had praise for the one who furthered his fatal lust. So now, on the twelfth morning after Hector's death, Phoebos Apollo spoke his mind among the immortals, a hard-hearted lot, you gods, and destructive. Did Hector never burn for you thighs of oxen, then, or of unblemished goats? Yet you couldn't be bothered to save him, dead though he is, for his wife to look on, his mother and his child, his father Priam, the Trojans, who would all promptly burn his corpse in the fire, give him proper funeral rites. No, gods, it's the ruthless Achilles you're bent on supporting, though his mind's out of proper order and the will in his breast inflexible, his nature's turned savage, like a lion that enthralled to its huge might and its daring spirit makes for the flocks of men to capture itself a feast, so Achilles has lost all pity and has no respect in him. A great source to a man of both harm and benefit. Any man may well have lost someone even dearer than he has, a full brother. Say, or even a son, yet when he's wept and lamented the loss, he lets him go. For it's an enduring heart the fates have given to mortals. But this man, after robbing noble Hector of his life, ties him behind his chariot and then drags him about his dear comrade's mound, nothing fine or decent there. Great though he is, he should watch out for our anger, through this fury of his his outraging the silent earth. Then angrily white-armed here addressed him, saying, What you say might even be true, Lord of the Silver Bow, if indeed you all grant equal honour to Achilles and Hector. Hector is mortal, was suckled at a woman's breast, but Achilles is the offspring of a goddess, one whom I myself nurtured and reared, and gave to a mortal as his wife, to Peleus, a man who was dear to the hearts of the immortals, and all of you gods were guests at their wedding. Yes, you two sat at that feast, liar in hand, ever faithless, friend of the wicked. Then Zeus the cloud gatherer responded to her, saying, Here. No need to rage so vehemently at the gods. The honour of these two will not be the same, yet Hector was more dear to the gods than all other mortals in Ilion. To me at least. For he never failed me with gifts I enjoyed, not once did my altar lack its fair share of the feasting, the libations, the burnt fat, our accepted privileges. We'll forget about stealing bold Hector, no way to do it with Achilles not finding out. His mother is constantly around him both day and night. In fact I wish that one of you gods would tell that he's I want her here, to give a wise message to her, to make Achilles accept ransom from Priam and give Hector's body back. So he spoke, storm-footed Iris hastened to take his message. Midway between Samothrake and rocky Imbros she plunged into the dark sea with a loud splash of water and plummeted down to the depths like a lead weight attached to the horn of a field ox on a fisherman's line, that brings death in its descent to the ravenous fishes. That is she found in her hollow cave, and round her other sea goddesses gathered, while she in the midst of them wept for the fate of her peerless son, who was destined to perish in rich soil Troy, far off from his own country. Standing beside her, swift-footed Iris now said, Move yourself, that is, Zeus, the eternal planner, wants you. Then the goddess, that he's the silver-footed, answered her, what does that great god want with me? I'm embarrassed, going among the immortals, with this endless grief at heart. Still, I'll go. Whatever he says, it won't be pointless. So saying, she, brightest of goddesses, put on her blue-black veil, than which no garment she had was darker, and set out to go, wind-footed swift iris ahead of her leading the way, the sea's waves parted before them. They stepped out onto the beach, then darted up skywards and found Kronos as far-seeing sun, with all the other blessed gods who exist forever around him. That he sat down by Zeus the father, Athene yielded her seat, and here put in her hand a splendid golden cup, with a friendly greeting. That he's drank, and returned it. The father of men and gods now began their discussion, that he's. Goddess. You've come to Olympos, despite your distress, and the ceaseless grief in your heart, this I know myself. Even so, I shall tell you the reason I brought you here. For nine days there's been a quarrel among the immortals about Hector's corpse and Achilles, sacker of cities. They're urging Argos's sharp-eyed slayer to steal the body, but this is an honour that I'm reserving for Achilles, to preserve your respect and friendship in the days ahead. Go quickly, then, to the camp, and give your son this message, say that he's angered the gods, 
that I, above all other immortals, am filled with rage because in his maddened heart his kept Hector by the curved ships won't give him up. It may be, through fear of me, he'll return Hector's body, but I'll send down Iris to great-hearted Priam, who must offer ransom for his dear son, go to the Achaean ships in person, with gifts for Achilles that will soften his heart. So he spoke, and that he's the silver-footed. The goddess. Did not ignore him, but went on her way, darting down from the peaks of Olympos, and arrived at her son's hut. It was there that she found him, making ceaseless lament, while round him his dear comrades were busy about their tasks, preparing their morning meal, a big shaggy ram had been killed for them, there in the hut. So now his lady mother sat down close by Achilles' side, caressed him with her hand, then spoke to him, saying, My child, how long will you go on eating your heart out with weeping and lamentation, thinking neither of food nor of bed? A good thing it is to lie with a woman, to make love, for you've not long to live, even now, already, death and all-mastering destiny are there beside you. But now listen well, I bring word to you from Zeus. He says that you've angered the gods, that he, above all other immortals, is filled with rage, because in your maddened heart you've kept Hector by the curved ships, won't give him up. So come now. Let him go. Accept ransom for his corpse. In answer to her swift-footed Achilles declared, so be it, he who brings ransom can take the corpse, if indeed the Olympian himself, of his own free will, so orders. Thus they, where the ships were drawn up now, mother and son, conversed together, exchanging many a winged word, and Cronos' son meanwhile dispatched Iris to sacred Ilion, on your way now, swift Iris, leave the seat of Olympos for Ilion, take this message to great-hearted Priam. He must offer ransom for his dear son, go to the Achaean ships, in person, with gifts for Achilles that will soften his heart. Alone, no Trojan warrior should accompany him, just a herald, well on in years, to drive the mules and a smooth running wagon, to carry back to the city the corpse of the man whom noble Achilles killed. Let death not be on his mind, nor any such fear, such a guide will provide him with, the slayer of Argos, who'll be his leader convey him safely to Achilles, and when he's brought him into Achilles' hut, Achilles himself will not kill him, and will restrain all others, being neither senseless nor careless nor malicious, with compassion, rather, he'll spare a man who's a suppliant. So he spoke, storm-footed Iris sped off with his message. She reached Priam's house, and found their wailing and sorrow, sons sitting around their father in the courtyard, tears marring their garments, the old man in their midst wrapped tight in his cloak and round him an abundance of dung all smeared on his aged head and neck that he'd scraped up in his hands as he rolled on the ground. In the house were his daughters and his son's wives, keening, their thoughts on the warriors, so many and so warlike, lying dead now, those who'd lost their lives to the Argives. Zeus's messenger stood close to Priam now, and addressed him, speaking softly, yet shivering still invaded his limbs, take heart. Priam, scion of Dardanos, no need to be scared, I've not come here to foretell some disaster for you, but rather with good intent. I'm a messenger from Zeus, who, remote though he is, both pities and cares for you greatly. The Olympian commands you to ransom noble Hector, taking gifts to Achilles that will soften his heart, alone. No other Trojan warrior should accompany you, just a herald, well on in years, to drive the mules and a smooth running wagon, on which to take back to the city the corpse of the man whom noble Achilles killed. Let death not be on your mind, nor any such fear, such a guide will provide you with, the slayer of Argos. Who'll be your leader? Convey you safely to Achilles, and when he's brought you into Achilles' hut, Achilles himself won't kill you, and will restrain all others, being neither senseless nor careless nor malicious, with compassion, rather, he'll spare a man who's a suppliant. So speaking, swift-footed Iris went on her way, and Priam ordered his sons to make ready the smooth-running mule wagon, and strap the wickerwork basket on it. He himself went down to his storeroom, fragrant it was with cedar wood, and high ceilinged, where many treasures lay, and sent for his wife Hecabe, and spoke to her, saying, Dear wife, an Olympian messengers reached me from Zeus, I'm to go to the ships, offer ransom for my dear son, in person. With gifts for Achilles that will soften his heart. So tell me, what's your reaction to this, how does it strike you, since my own whole passionate instinct is terribly set on going to the ships, to the broad camp of the Achaeans. So he spoke, but his wife cried out aloud, and responded, O oh my lord, what's become of that good sense for which you were famous once, both abroad and with those you rule? How can you want to go to the Achaean ships, alone, into the sight of the man who slaughtered so many of your noble sons? You must have a heart of iron. For once you are in his power, once he sets eyes on you, 
that treacherous raw flesh eater will show you no pity, nor any respect. Let us rather lament far from him, sitting here in our own home. All mastering destiny surely spun a thread at his birth, when I myself bore him, that far from his parents he'd gluck quick scavenging dogs after meeting a stronger man. Whose whole liver I wish I could get in my jaws and devour. A fair requital. That, for my son, who was not playing the coward when he killed him, but in defence of Troy's men and deep-bosomed women, standing firm, with no thought of panic, or of fleeing the foe. In answer to her the old man, Priam the godlike, said, Don't try to stop me when I want to go, do not yourself prove a bird of ill omen here in our home, you won't persuade me. If anyone else on earth had been urging me thus, whether seers divining from sacrifices, or priests, we'd call it a lie and have nothing to do with it. But now, since I heard the goddess and saw her face myself, I'm going, her word won't be wasted. And if it's my fate to end up dead beside the bronze-clad Achaean ships, I'm ready. Achilles is welcome to slaughter me there and then once I've held my son in my arms, and had my fill of mourning. With that he opened up the fine lids of the clothes chests, and from them took out a dozen most elegant robes, a dozen plain cloaks. The same number of rugs and blankets and of white linen mantles, as well as tunics to match them, and of gold he weighed out and took ten talents in all, with four cauldrons, and two brightly gleaming tripods, and an exquisite cup, that was given him by some Thracians when he went there on a mission, a great treasure, not even this did the old man keep in his home, so strong was his passion to ransom his dear son. Then he drove all the Trojans away from his colonnade, upbraiding them with abusive insults, get out, you worthless no-goods. Do you not have your own mourning to do at home, that you've come here to double mine? Or is the grief nothing to you that Zeus the son of Kronos has laid on me, the loss of my best son? You too will learn, you'll be that much easier for the Achaeans to slaughter now that he's dead. As for me, before I'm forced to see the downfall and sacking of this city with my own eyes, may I go down into Hades' realm. That said, he went after the men with his staff. And they ran off from the old man's assault. Then he yelled at his own sons, abusing them, Helenus, noble Agathon, Paris, Pammon and Antiphon, polites of the great war cry, Daphobos and Hippothus and illustrious Dios, to these nine the old man now shouted his harsh orders, Get moving, you wretched children. You downcasts, how I wish all of you, rather than Hector, had been killed at the swift ships. Alas, I'm wholly ill-fated, I sired sons who were the best in the broad land of Troy, yet of them not one, I tell you, is left. Neither godlike Mester, nor Troilos, charioteer, nor Hector, a god among men, who never did seem a mortal man's son, but the offspring of a god. These are's destroyed, what's left are all the no goods, the liars, the dancers only expert at matching the beat, the lifters of lambs and kids from those in your own country. So at least make me ready a wagon, and do it quickly, and load all this stuff aboard it, so we can be on our way. So he spoke, and they, alarmed by their father's reproof, went and brought out for him the smooth-running mule wagon, a fine one, newly made, strapped the wickerwork basket to it, and down from its peg took the yoke for the mules, of boxwood, with a boss on it, well equipped with guide rings for the reins. Then they fetched the nine-cubit yoke strap, and the yoke itself, which they settled down firmly upon the well-polished pole at its front end, set the ring on the peg then fastened the strap three times each side of the boss, made it tight in a series of turns, and twisted it under the hook. They brought from the storeroom and stacked up aboard the polished wagon the boundless ransom to offer for the head of Hector, they yoked the strong-hoofed mules, broken to work in harness, that the Mysians had given to Priam, a splendid gift, while for him they harnessed up the horses that the old man kept on for his own use, and cared for, there in his polished stalls. So these two in the high palace, while their teams were harnessed, the herald and Priam, had much to meditate on, and Hecabe now approached them, heavy laden at heart, carrying in her right hand wine sweet to the mind in a golden cup, for libation before they departed. Standing in front of the horses, she spoke to Priam, saying, Here, pour a libation to Zeus, the father, and pray that you get back home safe from these hateful men, since your heart impels you to go to the ships, even though I'm set against it. Then pray to Cronos' son, lord of the dark clouds, who from Ida looks down on all the country of Troy. Ask him for a bird of omen, the swift messenger that's the dearest of birds to him, and its power is the greatest, on your right hand, so that, after seeing it for yourself, and trusting it, you can go to the swift horse Danan's ships. But if far-seeing Zeus does not grant you his messenger, then I at least would not encourage you to go out to the ships of the Argives, however much you may want to. 
In answer to her, godlike Priam then declared, My wife, in this I shall not disregard your wishes, it's good to raise hands to Zeus, he always might show pity. So saying, the old man asked a servant, the housekeeper, to pour pure water over his hands, the servant stood beside him, within her hands both urine wine jug. When he'd washed his hands he took the cup from his wife, and stood in the forecourt and prayed, poured out the wine eyes upturned to heaven, and spoke aloud, in these words, Zeus, father, ruling from Ida, most glorious, greatest, grant that Achilles receive me with both friendship and pity, and send me a bird of omen, the swift messenger that's the dearest of birds to you, and its power is the greatest, on my right hand, so that, after seeing it for myself, and trusting it, I can go to the swift horse Danan's ships. So he spoke in prayer. And Zeus the counsellor heard him. He at once dispatched an eagle, of winged life the surest omen, dark hunter, sometimes known to men as the black falcon. Wide as the door is built to fit some wealthy man's high ceiling treasure chamber, a door well equipped with bars, so wide the spread of its wings on either side. It appeared on their right, swooping over the city, and seeing it they rejoiced, and the hearts in the breasts of all were cheered. Briskly now the old man stepped into his chariot, and drove out through the forecourt and the echoing colonnade. In front of him went the mules, that drew the four-wheeled wagon driven by skillful Idaios, and following after them the horses, that the old man smartly whipped on at speed through the city, his kinsfolk all following behind with great weeping and sorrow, as for one going to his death. When they'd come down out of the city, and reached the plain, these last turned and went back into Ilion, Priam's sons, and his daughter's husbands. Far-seeing Zeus did not fail to notice the two as they entered the plain, and, seeing Priam, felt pity, and spoke at once to Hermes, his own dear son, Hermes, it gives you much pleasure to act as a man's companion, you're glad to listen to those whom you enjoy. So, off with you now, escort Priam to the Achaean's hollow ships, but make sure he's not seen or recognized by the other Danans before you get to Pelis's son. So he spoke, the guide, Argos's slayer, did not ignore him, but at once strapped under his feet the beautiful sandals, golden, immortal, that carried him over water or boundless land, as swift as the wind's blast, and took the wand with which he bewitches the eyes of those he chooses, while others he rouses from their sleep. With this in his hand the mighty slayer of Argos took to the air, quickly reaching the Hellespont, and Troy, where he set off to walk in the likeness of a young prince with the first down on his chin, youth's most charming age. When the two had driven past the great burial mound of Elos, they halted their mules and horses to let them drink at the river, by this time darkness had fallen over the land. Looking around, the herald caught sight of someone nearby, Hermes, and turning to Priam said, Think quickly, scion of Dardanos, we need a smart decision. I see a man, I'm afraid we may soon be cut to pieces. Let's run for it in the chariot, or else perhaps clasp his knees and entreat him, he might take pity on us. So he spoke, the old man was terrified, his mind in turmoil, on his bowed limbs the hairs rose up, and he stood in a daze, but the helper himself approached, took the old man's hand in his, and questioned him. Saying, where are you off to? Father, driving horses and mules through the fragrant night, when other mortals are sleeping? Aren't you scared of the Achaeans, your implacable enemies, whose breath is fury, who are very near around you? Should one of them see you coming, through the swift dark night, conveying all that treasure, what answer would you have then? You're not young yourself, and your attendant here's old too, how stand off any man who decides to attack you? Myself, I shan't harm you in any way, in fact I defend you against anyone else, you're so like my own dear father. Then the old man, Priam the godlike, made him this answer, these things, dear child, are indeed correct as you state them, but one of the gods must still have had a protective hand over me, to have put a traveller like you in my path, so happily met, so handsome, of so fine a demeanour, and sensible too, your parents are truly blessed. Then the guide, the slayer of Argos, gave him this reply, all this indeed. Old sir. You have fittingly spoken. But tell me now, please, and make a true declaration, all these splendid treasures, are you shipping them out to foreign people abroad, to be kept in safety for you? Or is it that you're all abandoning sacred Ilion out of fear now, since your finest warriors perished, your son? He never shrank from battling the Achaeans. Then the old man, Priam the godlike, made this answer to him, Who are you, most noble sir, and who, pray, are your parents, that you speak so well of the fate of my unlucky son? Then the guide, the slayer of Argos, made him this reply, You're testing me, old sir, when you ask about noble Hector. Him I have often seen, in battle, where men win honour. 
with my own eyes, and when, after driving them to the ships, he would slay Argives, cut them down with the sharp bronze. We would stand there and marvel, because Achilles would not let us fight, being embittered at Atreus's son. His henchman am I, the same well-built ship brought us here. From the Myrmidons I am sprung, my father is Polycta, a wealthy man, and an old one, just as you are. Six other sons he has, and I myself am the seventh. We cast lots, and I was chosen to serve out here, and now I've come to the plain from the ships, for at first dawn the sharp-eyed Achaeans are going to attack around the city. Sitting idle has made them impatient, the Achaeans' princes can no longer restrain them, so eager they are for battle. Then the old man, Priam the godlike, made him this answer, If you indeed are a henchman of Pelias's son Achilles, then please recount to me the whole truth of the matter, does my son remain by the ships? Or has Achilles already hacked him to pieces? And thrown them out for his dogs? Then the guide, the slayer of Argos, made him this reply, Old sir, not yet have dogs or birds of prey devoured him. The man is still lying there beside Achilles' ship, among the huts, just as he was, though this is the twelfth day he's been there. His flesh has not rotted, nor have maggots devoured it, the kind that feed on mortals killed in battle. Achilles indeed now drags him around his dear comrade's tomb, ruthlessly, daily, as soon as the light of dawn appears yet does not disfigure him, go look, and you'd be amazed how dew fresh he lies there, washed quite clean of blood and nowhere befouled. All the wounds that he was given have closed, and many there were who thrust the bronze into him. This is how the blessed gods take good care of your son, corpse though he is, since he was dear to their hearts. So he spoke, the old man rejoiced, and answered in these words, my child. It's a good thing indeed to make proper offerings to the immortals, my son. If he ever truly existed, never forgot in his halls the gods who possess Olympos, so now they've remembered him, even in his destined death. But come, accept from me this beautiful drinking cup, and be my protector, and in company with the gods escort me, until I arrive at the hut of Pelias's son. Then the guide, the slayer of Argos, made this reply, you're testing my youth, old sir, but you'll not persuade me, when you ask me to take gifts from you behind Achilles' back. Him I fear and respect too much at heart to ever defraud him, I wouldn't want to get into trouble later. But as your guide I'd go with you as far as famous Argos, protecting you carefully, in a swift ship or on foot, nor would any man, scorning your escort, dare to attack you. So saying, the helper took charge of chariot and horses, quickly got his hands on the whip and the reins, and breathed potent strength into horses and mules alike, and when they reached the ditch and the battlements protecting the ships, where the guards were still busy preparing their evening meal, on all these the guide, the slayer of Argos, shed sleep, then opened the gates, drew back the bars, and brought Priam inside, along with the splendid gifts on the wagon. But when they arrived at the hut of Pelias's son, that high cabin built by the Myrmidons for their king, with rough-cut firwood beams, and a roof set up over it, made of bristling thatch that they'd harvested from the meadows, and around it enclosed a large courtyard for their king with a close-set palisade, the entrance to which was secured by one single fir beam. To close it took three Achaeans, and three to haul open this huge crossbar on the doors, except for Achilles, who'd ram. It home single-handed, then Hermes the helper opened the entrance for the old man, and fetched in the splendid gifts for Pelias's swift-footed son, and stepped down to the ground from the chariot, and declared, Old sir. I who have come to you am an immortal god. Hermes, sent here to escort you by my father. But now I must hasten back, and not come in where Achilles can see me, it would be most improper for an immortal god to be entertained by mortals, face to face. But you must go in there now, embrace the knees of Pelias's son, and in the name of his father, and of his fine-haired mother, and of his child, entreat him, attempt to touch his heart. Having so spoken, Hermes then departed to high Olympos, while Priam stepped from his chariot to the ground, leaving Idaios there, to stay behind and look after the horses and mules. He himself went straight to the dwelling where Achilles, dear to Zeus, was sitting, entered, and found the man himself, but his comrades were sitting elsewhere, two only, the hero Automedon, and Alchemos, scion of Ars, were in busy attendance on him. He was through with his meal, with eating and drinking, the table still stood by him. Unnoticed, great Priam came in, approached Achilles. Embraced his knees. And kissed his hands, those terrible murderous hands, that had killed so many of his sons. As when blind delusion possesses a man to murder someone in his own country, and he flees to an alien people, to some wealthy man's house, and wonder grips those who see him, so Achilles was amazed at the sight of godlike Priam, and the rest were likewise amazed, and looked at one another. 
Then Priam addressed Achilles, entreating him in these words, Remember your own father, godlike Achilles, whose years equal mine, on old age's deathly threshold, him too, it may well be, those dwelling on his frontiers are harassing, with no one to ward off ruin from him. But he at least, while he hears that you're still living, is happy at heart, and hopes from day to day that he'll see his dear son returning from the land of Troy, whereas I am wholly ill-fated. Of the best sons I sired, in the broad land of Troy, not one, I tell you, is left, fifty I had, when the Achaean sons first came. Nineteen were born to me from one single womb, the rest other women bore in my halls. But most of these, though many, had their limbs unstrung by impetuous hours. The one true son I had left me to guard the city and its people you slew untimely as he fought in defence of his country, Hector. It's for his sake I've come, now, to the Argive ships, to recover him from you. I bring with me ransom past counting. Revere the gods, Achilles, and to me show pity, remembering your own father, but I'm the more pitiable, for I've borne what no other mortal on earth has yet endured, I've brought to my lips the hand of the man who killed my son. So saying, he stirred in Achilles the urge to weep for his father, he took the old man by the hand. Gently pushed him away. Both had their memories, Priam of Hector, killer of men. As, bitterly weeping, he crouched at Achilles' feet, while Achilles wept, now for his own father, now again for Patroclos, their joint mourning resounded throughout the hut. But as soon as noble Achilles had had his fill of weeping, and the urge for it had departed from his heart and limbs, he rose from his chair, took the old man by the hand, and raised him up, pitying his grey hair, his grey beard, and then addressed him, speaking with winged words, Unhappy man, your hearts indeed endured many sorrows. How could you bear to come to the Achaean ships, alone, to look me straight in the face, the man who slaughtered so many of your noble sons? You must have a heart of iron. Come then, sit down on this chair, and let's allow our distress to lie at rest in our hearts, for all our grieving for there's no profit accrues from numbing lamentation, that's how the gods spun life's thread for unhappy mortals, to live amid sorrow, while they themselves are uncaring. There are two great jars. Sunk down in the floor of Zeus's abode, full of gifts he hands out, one of ills, the other of blessings, and the man who gets a mixed handout from thundering Zeus will sometimes encounter trouble, and sometimes good luck, whereas he who gets only ills Zeus renders an outcast, driven by evil hunger, to wander across the face of the sacred earth with respect from neither gods nor mortals. So the gods bestowed on Peleus the most splendid gifts from his birth onward, for he outstripped all mortal men in wealth and prosperity, ruled as lord of the Myrmidons, and though he was mortal they married him to a goddess. Yet even on him the god laid evil, no family of lordly sons was born to him in his halls, but only the one short-lived male child. Nor am I able to care for him as he ages, but sit here, far from my country, in Troy, bringing grief to you and to your offspring. Yet you too, old sir, were once, we here, fortunate. Everywhere southward as far as Lesbos, seat of Marca, or Phrygia inland, with the vast Hellespont, here, they say, through your wealth and sons, old sir, you were preeminent. But since the heavenly gods brought this trouble upon you, round your city the fighting, the killings have never stopped. Bear up then, don't nurse unending grief in your heart, you'll gain nothing by mourning your son, you won't bring him back to life, before that you'll have other troubles. Then the old man, Priam the godlike, answered him, saying, Zeus is nursling, you'll not make me sit, so long as Hector lies uncared for among the huts. So, waste no time, release him, let me see him myself, and accept the ransom, the very great ransom, we bring you. Enjoy it, and go back home to your own country, now that you've spared me, to live myself, and to gaze on the light of the sun. Eyeing him angrily. Swift-footed Achilles exclaimed, provoke me no further. Old man, I myself am minded to give you back Hector, since a messenger's reached me from Zeus, the mother who bore me, daughter to the old man of the sea. What's more, I am well aware, Priam, you do not deceive me, that it was some god brought you here to the Achaean ships, no mortal man would dare, however youthful and strong, to enter the camp, or could make his way past the guards, or easily thrust back the great bar on our gateway. Stop working on my emotions amid my sorrows, old sir, lest I might not spare even you, while you're here in my hut, suppliant though you are, and break Zeus's ordinances. So he spoke, the old man was frightened, and heeded his words. Now the son of Peleus strode out of the hut like a lion, not alone, but two of his henchmen accompanied him, the hero Automedon and Alchemos, those whom Achilles most honoured of all his comrades now Patroclos was dead. Together they unyoked both the mules and the horses, brought in the herald. 
the old man's public crier. Sat him down on a chair, and from the smooth running wagon took the boundless ransom for Hector's head, but left there two robes and a fine woven tunic, in which Achilles would wrap the corpse before yielding it to be carried home. Then he summoned the handmaids, told them to wash and anoint it, having first moved it away, to stop Priam seeing his son. Lest, heartbroken, he failed to restrain his wrath at the sight, and Achilles' own heart should be stirred to fury, so that he murdered Priam, thus breaking the ordinances of Zeus. So when the handmaids had washed it and anointed it with oil, and shrouded it in a fine robe and a tunic besides, Achilles himself raised the body and placed it upon a bier, which he and his comrades lifted onto the polished wagon. Then he heaved a sigh, and addressed his dear comrade by name, Don't be angry with me, Patroclos, if you chance to hear, even in Hades' realm, that I've given back noble Hector to his dear father, the ransom he offered was not unfitting, and of this I'll allot to you all that's your proper due. That said, noble Achilles went back inside his hut, sat down on the richly worked chair from which he'd arisen, against the opposite wall, and then addressed Priam, saying, Your son, old sir, has been released to you as you wanted. And is lying on a bier, at daybreak you shall yourself see him as you take him. But for now let's turn to supper, for even fair-haired Niobe was minded to eat, though all her twelve children had perished there in her halls, six daughters and six sons in the prime of their youth. The sons were slain by Apollo with shafts from his silver bow, out of anger against Niobe, the daughters by Artemis the huntress. Niobe had praised herself over fair-cheeked Leto, who, she said, bore two only, whereas she was mother to many. Her brood Leto's twins then slaughtered, every last one. Nine days they lay in their blood, nor was there anyone to bury them, Cronos's son turned their people to stones. But on the tenth day they were buried by the heavenly gods, and Niobe's mind turned to food, since she'd tired of weeping. Now somewhere among the rocks, in those lonely mountains, on Cipolos, where, they say, goddesses have their abodes, the nymphs who move nimbly, dancing round Achaloyos, there, though stone. She broods on the woes that the gods dealt her. So come, let the two of us likewise, noble old sir, take thought for food, after that you can mourn your dear son, when you've returned him to Ilion, much wept over he will be. With that swift Achilles sprang up, and cut the throat of a white sheep, his comrades skinned it, butchered it neatly cut up the meat with skill, threaded the bits on skewers, grilled them with care, then drew them all off. That done, Automedon brought bread and put it on the table in handsome baskets, while Achilles shared out the meat. So they reached out their hands to the good things ready for them, but when they'd satisfied their desire for food and drink, then Priam, scion of Dardanos, gazed in wonder at Achilles, his stature and beauty. How like the gods he appeared, while at Priam, scion of Dardanos, Achilles gazed in wonder, observing his noble features, listening as he spoke. But when they'd had their pleasure of looking at one another, then the first to speak was the old man, Priam the godlike. Let me bed down now, Zeus's nursling, so that at last we may take our rest and get our fill of sweet slumber, for never yet have my eyes closed under my eyelids since at your hands my son was bereft of life, I've been lamenting ceaselessly nursing my countless sorrows, rolling about in the dung in my courtyard's enclosure. But now I've tasted food, permitted firebright wine to pass down my throat, before that I'd taken nothing. Thereupon Achilles instructed his comrades and the handmaids to set bedsteads under the colonnade, and lay upon them fine purple wool throws, and over these to spread blankets, topped off with fleecy cloaks to serve as coverlets. Out from the hall went the handmaids, each holding a torch, and quickly made up two beds. In a teasing voice swift-footed Achilles then had this to say to Priam, best sleep outside, good old sir. Some Achaean counsellor might come over here, they're always having sessions with me, seeking advice in their planning, a common practice, but if one of them saw you, during the swift black night, he might go and tell Agamemnon, the people's shepherd, and then there'd be, ah, delay in the release of the body. Now, tell me this, and be honest, how many days do you have in mind for the funeral of noble Hector, so I hold off that long? and restrain the troops as well? Then the old man, Priam the godlike, answered him, saying, If you truly mean that I can complete noble Hector's burial, you'd be doing me a great kindness by acting thus, you know how we're shut up inside the city, and firewood has to be fetched a long way from the mountains, and the Trojans are really scared. Nine days we would mourn him in our halls. And then on the tenth we'd inter him. And there'd be public feasting, on the eleventh we'd raise the funeral mound over him, and on the twelfth, if we have to we'll join battle once again. Then noble swift-footed Achilles answered him, saying, all these things, aged Priam, shall be as you propose, I shall hold back the attack for the time that you've requested. 
So saying, he took hold of the aged man's right hand by the wrist, to allay any fear that might be in his heart. Then they lay down to sleep there, in the dwelling's forecourt, the herald and Priam, with a great deal to think about. But Achilles himself slept at the back of the well-built hut, with the fair-cheeked Briseis now lying there by his side. All others, both gods, and mortals, chariot marshals, slept the night through, overcome by gentle slumber. But on Hermes the helper sleep could get no hold. As he pondered on how he was going to escort King Priam away from the ships unseen by the watchful gate guards. So he stood close. Above his head. And addressed him. Saying, Ah, old sir, you are not bothered by danger, still fast asleep among enemies as you are, since Achilles has spared you. Now you've ransomed your son, and a great deal you gave for him, yet to get you back alive would cost your surviving sons three times that amount in ransom. Were Atreus's son Agamemnon or all the Achaeans to learn you were here? He spoke, and the old man, badly frightened, made the herald get up, while Hermes himself yoked the mules and the horses for them, and briskly drove them out of the camp. No one noticed them. But when they came to the ford of the swift-flowing river, eddying Xanthos, begotten by immortal Zeus, then Hermes went on his way to lofty Olympos, a saffron-robed dawn was spreading across the entire earth, and the others, weeping and wailing, drove the horses to the city, while the mules drew the dead body. Once more no man, nor any fine-sashed woman, recognized them now, save only Cassandre. As lovely as golden Aphrodite. Who'd gone up onto the citadel, and recognized her dear father, as he stood in the chariot, and the herald, the city's crier, and him she saw stretched on a bier in the mule-drawn wagon. Then she shrieked aloud, and went screaming throughout the city, Go look, men and women of Troy! Go now and see Hector, if ever while he yet lived you were happy to see him coming home from the battle great joy to our city and all its people. So she spoke, not one man was left behind in the city, nor any woman, upon them all came sorrow past bearing. It was near the city gates they encountered the dead man's escort. His dear wife and his lady mother were the first to fling themselves aboard the smooth-running wagon, tearing their hair, to cradle Hector's head, the thronged bystanders all wept, and from then all day long until sunset, there by the gates. They'd have gone on shedding tears and mourning for Hector had the old man not called out to the crowd from his chariot, make way for the mules to come through. You'll get your fill of lamenting later. As soon as I brought him home. So he spoke, they stood to one side, made way for the wagon. When Hector's body reached Priam's famed palace, they moved it to an inlaid bedstead, and by his side placed minstrels, leaders of dirges. These chanted the song of lamentation while the women in chorus added their lament to the dirge. Of these it was white-armed Andromache led the morning, cradling in her arms the head of Hector the killer, husband, perished too young, you're leaving me a widow here in our home, and the son still only an infant that we, both ill-fated, made, nor do I believe he will ever come to the years of manhood, before then this city will be levelled, since you, its guardian, have perished, who protected it, kept safe its devoted wives, its children. Soon enough these will be cargo aboard the hollow ships, and I among them, and you, my child will go with me to a place where you must labor at unseemly tasks, slaving for a rough master. Or else some Achaean will strong-arm you down from the battlements. A grim death, angered maybe because it was Hector killed his brother, or father, or son, since there are so many Achaeans have bitten the boundless dust at Hector's hands, for in grim warfare your father was far from gentle. So there's public mourning for him throughout the city, an unspeakable grief and sorrow you've brought on your parents, Hector, to me, above all. There's left this bitter loss, for you never, dying, reached out to me from your bed, you never uttered for me some enduring last word that I could have recalled, night and day, as I shed my tears. So she spoke, weeping, the women added their own lament, and among them now Hecabe led the passionate mourning, Hector, of all my children far the dearest to my heart, while you still were living you were beloved of the gods, they cared for you even in your destiny of death, those other sons of mine swift-footed Achilles, whenever he took one, would sail abroad beyond the unharvested sea. To Samos or Imbros or mist-enshrouded Lemnos, but you? Though he'd robbed you of life with the keen-edged bronze, and often dragged you around the tomb of his comrade, Patroclos, whom you slew, yet never could bring him back to life, you lie now in my halls as though new slain, due afresh, like one whom lately Apollo, he of the silver bow, has assailed with his gentle shafts, and put to death. So she spoke, weeping, and stirred up unending lamentation. Then, third in line, to lead the morning came Helen, Hector, most dear to my heart of all my husband's brothers. Yes, indeed, my husband is Alexandos the godlike, who brought me hither to Troy, ah, would that I died first. 
This is now the twentieth year that's passed since I ran off from home, abandoning my own country, yet from you I've never had one mean or degrading word, and if anyone else reviled me here in these halls, one of your brothers or sisters, or a brother's well-dressed wife, or your mother, your father could have been mine. He was always so gentle. Then you'd talk them round and restrain them with your personal gentleness and the gentle things you said. So I weep, sad at heart, for both you and my ill-starred self, for no more in all broad Troy is there anyone left who's gentle or loving to me, all regard me with horror. So she spoke, weeping, and the countless throng lamented. Then the aged Priam addressed his people, saying, Fetch in firewood now to the city, don't be scared at heart lest the Argives set up some smart ambush, for Achilles, when sending me back from the black ships, guaranteed that he'd do us no harm until the twelfth day's dawn from now. So he spoke, and at that they harnessed both oxen and mules to wagons, and quickly assembled outside the city. For nine days they carted back timber in abundance, but when the tenth dawn came, bringing light to mortals, then, shedding tears, they carried out bold Hector, laid his corpse on top of the pyre, and set it ablaze. But when dawn appeared, lately born, with her rosy fingers, then a crowd collected around illustrious Hector's pyre, and when they were all assembled and gathered together, first they quenched the still smouldering pyre with firebright wine in each part that the fire's force reached, and next his brothers and comrades gathered up the white bones, still mourning, with great tears streaming down their cheeks, took them and laid them away in a golden casket, wrapped in a soft purple cloth, and at once after that, put the box in a dugout grave, and covered it over with great close-set stones, and last, very quickly, heaped up the burial mound, with lookouts all round it. In case the well-grieved Achaeans attacked them before the stated time, and when they'd raised the mound. They all went back, then sat down together and shared a glorious feast in the palace of Priam, the king who was Zeus's nursling. Such were the funeral rites for Hector, breaker of horses.